This is section one of Mark Twain A Biography, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne, Volume Two. Part one, eighteen seventy five to eighteen eighty six, and Part two, eighteen eighty six to nineteen hundred. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 105. Mark Twain at Forty. In conversation with John Hay, Hay said to Clemens, A man reaches the zenith at forty, the top of the hill. From that time forward he begins to descend. If you have any great undertaking ahead, begin it now. You will never be so capable again. Of course this was only a theory of Hay's, a rule where rules do not apply, where, in the end, the problem resolves itself into a question of individualities. John Hay did as great work after forty as ever before, so did Mark Twain, and both of them gained in intellectual strength and public honor to the very end. Yet it must have seemed to many who knew him, and to himself like enough, that Mark Twain at forty had reached the pinnacle of his fame and achievement. His name was on every lip. In whatever environment, observation and argument were likely to be pointed with some saying or anecdote attributed, rightly or otherwise, to Mark Twain. As Mark Twain says, or, you know that story of Mark Twain's, were universal and daily commonplaces. It was dazzling, towering fame, not of the best or most enduring kind as yet, but holding somewhere within it the structure of immortality. He was in a constant state of siege, besought by all varieties and conditions of humanity for favors such as only human need and abnormal ingenuity can invent. His ever-increasing mail presented a marvelous exhibition of the human species on undress parade. True, there were hundreds of appreciative tributes from readers who spoke only out of a heart's gratitude but there were nearly as great a number who came with a compliment and added a petition or a demand or a suggestion usually unwarranted often impertinent politicians public speakers aspiring writers actors elocutionists singers inventors most of them he had never seen or heard of cheerfully asked him for a recommendation as to their abilities and projects. Young men wrote requesting verses or sentiments to be inscribed in young ladies' autograph albums. Young girls wrote asking him to write the story of his life, to be used as a school composition. Men, starting obscure papers, coolly invited him to lend them his name as editor, assuring him that he would be put to no trouble and that it would help advertise his books. A fruitful humorist wrote that he had invented some five thousand puns, and invited Mark Twain to father this terrific progeny in book form for a share of the returns. But the list is endless. He said once, The symbol of the race ought to be a human being carrying an axe for every human being has one concealed about him somewhere, and is always seeking the opportunity to grind it. Even P. T. Barnum had an axe, the large axe of advertising, and he was perpetually trying to grind it on Mark Twain's reputation. In other words, trying to get him to write something that would help to popularize the greatest show on earth. There were a good many curious letters, letters from humorists, would-be and genuine. A bright man in Duluth sent him an old Allen Pepperbox revolver, with the statement that it had been found among a pile of bones under a tree, from the limb of which was suspended a lasso and a buffalo skull, this as evidence that the weapon was the genuine Allen which Bemis had lost on that memorable overland buffalo hunt. Mark Twain enjoyed that, and kept the old pepper-box as long as he lived. There were letters from people with fads, letters from cranks of every description. 
curious letters even from friends reginald chumley that lovely eccentric of condover hall where mr and mrs clemens had spent some halcyon days in eighteen seventy three wrote him invitations to be at his castle on a certain day naming the hour and adding that he had asked friends to meet him chumley had a fancy for birds and spared nothing to improve his collection once he wrote clemens asking him to collect for him two hundred and five american specimens naming the varieties and the amount which he was to pay for each clemens was to catch these birds and bring them over to england arriving at condover on a certain day when there would be friends to meet him of course then there was a report which came now and then from another english castle the minutes of a certain mark twain club all neatly and elaborately written out with the speech of each member and the discussions which had followed the work he found out later of another eccentric for there was no mark twain club the reports being just the mental diversion of a rich young man with nothing else to do in following the equator clemens combined these two pleasant characters in one story with elaborations letters came queerly addressed there is one envelope still in existence which bears clemens name in elaborate design and a very good silhouette likeness the work of some talented artist mark twain united states was a common address mark twain the world was also used mark twain somewhere mailed in a foreign country reached him promptly and mark twain anywhere found its way to hartford in due season then there was a letter though this was later he was abroad at the time mailed by brander matthews and francis wilson addressed mark twain god knows where it found him after traveling half around the world on its errand and in his answer he said he did then someone sent a letter addressed the devil knows where which also reached him and he answered he did too surely this was the farthest horizon of fame countless mark twain anecdotes are told of this period of every period and will be told and personally vouched for so long as the last soul of his generation remains alive for seventy years longer perhaps there will be those who will relate personal recollections of mark twain many of them will be interesting some of them will be true most of them will become history at last it is too soon to make history of much of this drift now it is only safe to admit a few authenticated examples it happens that one of the oftenest told anecdotes has been the least elaborated it is the one about his call on mrs stowe twichell's journal entry set down at the time verifies it mrs stowe was leaving for florida one morning and clemens ran over early to say good-bye on his return mrs clemens regarded him disapprovingly why youth she said you haven't on any collar and tie he said nothing but went up to his room did up these items in a neat package and sent it over by a servant with a line herewith receive a call from the rest of me mrs stowe returned a witty note in which she said that he had discovered a new principle the principle of making calls by installments and asked whether in extreme cases a man might not send his hat coat and boots and be otherwise excused colonel henry watterson tells the story of an after-theatre supper at the brevoort house where murat halstead mark twain and himself were present a reporter sent in a card for colonel watterson who was about to deny himself when clemens said give it to me i'll fix it and left the table he came back in a moment and beckoned to watterson he is young and as innocent as a lamb he said i represented myself as your secretary i said that you were not here but if mr halstead would do as well i would fetch him out i'll introduce you as halstead and we'll have some fun 
Now, while Watterson and Halstead were always good friends, they were political enemies. It was a political season, and the reporter wanted that kind of an interview. Watterson gave it to him, repudiating every principle that Halstead stood for, reversing him in every expressed opinion. Halstead was for hard money and given to flying the bloody shirt of sectional prejudice. Watterson lowered the bloody shirt and declared for greenbacks in Halstead's name. Then he and Clemens returned to the table and told frankly what they had done. Of course, nobody believed it. The report passed the world night editor and appeared next morning. Halstead woke up then and wrote a note to the world, denying the interview throughout. The world printed his note with the added line, When Mr. Halstead saw our reporter he had dined. It required John Hay, then on the Tribune, to place the joke where it belonged. There is a Lotus Club anecdote of Mark Twain that carries the internal evidence of truth. Saturday evening at the Lotus always brought a gathering of the wits, and on certain evenings, hens and chickens nights, each man had to tell a story, make a speech, or sing a song. On one evening a young man, an invited guest, was called upon and recited a very long poem. One by one those who sat within easy reach of the various exits melted away, until no one remained but Mark Twain. Perhaps he saw the earnestness of the young man and sympathized with it. He may have remembered a time when he would have been grateful for one such attentive auditor. At all events he sat perfectly still, never taking his eyes from the reader, never showing the least inclination toward discomfort or impatience, but listening, as with rapt attention, to the very last line. Douglas Taylor, one of the faithful Saturday night members, said to him later, Mark, how did you manage to sit through that dreary, interminable poem? Well, he said, that young man thought he had a divine message to deliver, and I thought he was entitled to at least one auditor, so I stayed with him. We may believe that for that one auditor the young author was willing to sacrifice all the others. One might continue these anecdotes for as long as the young man's poem lasted, and perhaps hold as large an audience. But anecdotes are not all of history. These are set down because they reflect a phase of the man and an aspect of his life at this period. For at the most we can only present an angle here and there, and tell a little of the story, letting each reader, from his fancy, construct the rest. End of chapter 105, Mark Twain at 40, read by John Greenman. This is Section 2 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 106. His First Stage Appearance. Once that winter, the Monday Evening Club met at Mark Twain's home, and instead of the usual essay he read them a story, The Facts Concerning the Recent Carnival of Crime in Connecticut. It was the story of a man's warfare with a personified conscience, a sort of William Wilson idea, though less weird, less somber, and with more actuality, more verisimilitude. It was, in fact, autobiographical, a setting down of the author's daily self-chidings, the climax, where conscience is slain, is a startling picture which appeals to most of humanity. So vivid is it all that it is difficult in places not to believe in the reality of the tale, though the allegory is always present. The club was deeply impressed by the little fictional sermon. One of its ministerial members offered his pulpit for the next Sunday, if Mark Twain would deliver it to his congregation. Howells welcomed it for the Atlantic and published it in June. It was immensely successful at the time, though for some reason it seems to be little known or remembered today. Now and then a reader mentions it, always with enthusiasm. Howells referred to it repeatedly in his letters, 
and finally persuaded Clemens to let Osgood bring it out with a true story in dainty booklet form. If the reader does not already know the tale, it will pay him to look it up and read it, and then to read it again. Meantime, Tom Sawyer remained unpublished. Get Bliss to hurry it up, wrote Howells. That boy is going to make a prodigious hit. But Clemens delayed the book, to find some means to outwit the Canadian pirates, who thus far had laid hands on everything, and now were clamoring at the Atlantic because there was no more to steal. Moncure D. Conway was in America, and agreed to take the manuscript of Sawyer to London and arrange for its publication and copyright. In Conway's memoirs he speaks of Mark Twain's beautiful home, comparing it and its surroundings with the homes of Surrey, England. He tells of an entertainment given to Harriet Beecher Stowe, a sort of animated jarley waxworks. Clemens and Conway went over as if to pay a call, when presently the old lady was rather startled by an invasion of costumed figures. Clemens rose and began introducing them in his gay, fanciful fashion. He began with a knight in full armor, saying, as if in an aside, "'Bring along that tin shop!' and went on to tell the romance of the knight's achievements. Conway read Tom Sawyer on the ship and was greatly excited over it. Later in London he lectured on it, arranging meantime for its publication with Chatto and Windus, thus establishing a friendly business relation with that firm which Mark Twain continued during his lifetime. Clemens lent himself to a number of institutional amusements that year, and on the 26th of April, 1876, made his first public appearance on the dramatic stage. It was an amateur performance, but not of the usual kind. There was genuine dramatic talent in Hartford, and the old play of the Loan of the Lover, with Mark Twain as Peter Spike and Miss Helen Smith, now Mrs. William W. Ellsworth, as Gertrude, with a support sufficient for their needs, gave a performance that probably furnished as much entertainment as that pleasant old play is capable of providing. Mark Twain had in him the making of a great actor. Henry Irving once said to him, "'You made a mistake by not adopting the stage as a profession. You would have made even a greater actor than a writer.' Yet it is unlikely that he would ever have been satisfied with the stage. He had too many original literary ideas. He would never have been satisfied to repeat the same part over and over again, night after night, from week to month, and from month to year. He could not stick to the author's lines even for one night. In his performance of the easy-going, thick-headed Peter Spike, his impromptu additions to the lines made it hard on the company, who found their cues all at sixes and sevens, but it delighted the audience beyond measure. No such impersonation of that character was ever given before, or ever will be given again. It was repeated with new and astonishing variations on the part of Peter, and it could have been put on for a long run. Augustin Daly wrote immediately, offering the Fifth Avenue Theater for a benefit performance, and again, a few days later, urging acceptance, not for one night, but for many. Clemens was tempted, no doubt. Perhaps, if he had yielded, he would today have had one more claim on immortality. End of chapter 106, His First Stage Appearance Read by John Greenman This is section 3 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 107. Howells, Clemens, and George. Howells and Clemens were visiting back and forth rather oftener just then. Clemens was particularly fond of the Boston crowd, Aldrich, Fields, Osgood, and the rest, delighting in those luncheons or dinners which Osgood, that hospitable publisher, was always giving on one pretext or another. No man ever loved company more than Osgood, or to play the part of host and pay for the enjoyment of others. 
His dinners were elaborate affairs, where the sages and poets and wits of that day, and sometimes their wives, gathered. They were happy reunions, those four gatherings, though perhaps a more intimate enjoyment was found at the luncheons, where only two or three were invited, usually Aldridge, Howells, and Clemens, and the talk continued through the afternoon and into the deepening twilight, such company and such twilight as somehow one seems never to find any more. On one of the visits which Howells made to Hartford that year he took his son John, then a small boy, with him. John was about six years old at the time, with his head full of stories of Aladdin and of other Arabian fancies. On the way over his father said to him, "'Now, John, you will see a perfect palace.' They arrived, and John was awed into silence by the magnificence and splendors of his surroundings until they went to the bathroom to wash off the dust of travel. There he happened to notice a cake of pink soap. "'Why,' he said, "'they've even got their soap painted!' Next morning he woke early, they were occupying the mahogany room on the ground floor, and slipping out through the library and to the door of the dining room he saw the colored butler George, the immortal George setting the breakfast table. He hurriedly tiptoed back and whispered to his father, "'Come quick! The slave is setting the table!' This being the second mention of George, it seems proper here that he should be formally presented. Clemens used to say that George came one day to wash windows, and remained eighteen years. He was precisely the sort of character that Mark Twain loved. He had formerly been the body-servant of an army general, and was typically racially southern, with those delightful attributes of wit and policy and gentleness which go with the best type of negro character. The children loved him no less than did their father. Mrs. Clemens likewise had a weakness for George, though she did not approve of him. George's morals were defective. He was an inveterate gambler. He would bet on anything, though prudently and with knowledge. He would investigate before he invested. If he placed his money on a horse, he knew the horse's pedigree and the pedigree of the horses against it, also of their riders. If he invested in an election, he knew all about the candidates. He had agents among his own race, and among the whites as well, to supply him with information. He kept them faithful to him by lending them money, at ruinous interest. He buttonholed Mark Twain's callers while he was removing their coats concerning the political situation, much to the chagrin of Mrs. Clemens, who protested, though vainly, for the men liked George and his ways, and upheld him in his iniquities. Mrs. Clemens' disapproval of George reached the point now and then where she declared he could not remain. She even discharged him once, but next morning George was at the breakfast table in attendance as usual. Mrs. Clemens looked at him gravely. George, she said, didn't I discharge you yesterday? Yes, Miss Clemens, but I knew you couldn't get along without me, so I thought I'd better stay a while. In one of the letters to Howells, Clemens wrote, When George first came, he was one of the most religious of men. He had but one fault, young George Washington's. But I have trained him, and now it fairly breaks Mrs. Clemens' heart to hear him stand at that front door and lie to an unwelcome visitor. George was a fine diplomat. He would come up to the billiard room with a card or message from someone waiting below, and Clemens would fling his soul into a sultry denial which became a soothing and balmy subterfuge before it reached the front door. The slave must have been setting the table in good season, for the Clemens breakfasts were likely to be late. They usually came along about nine o'clock, by which time Howells and John were fairly clawing with hunger. Clemens did not have an early appetite, but when it came it was a good one. Breakfast and dinner were his important meals. He seldom ate at all during the middle of the day, though if guests were present he would join them at luncheon time and walk up and down while they were eating, talking, and gesticulating in his fervent, fascinating way. Sometimes Mrs. Clemens would say, 
oh youth do come and sit down with us we can listen so much better but he seldom did at dinner too it was his habit between the courses to rise from the table and walk up and down the room waving his napkin and talking talking in a strain and with a charm that he could never quite equal with his pen it's the opinion of most people who knew mark twain personally that his impromptu utterances delivered with that ineffable quality of speech manifested the culmination of his genius when clemens came to boston the howells household was regulated or rather unregulated without regard to former routine mark twain's personality was of a sort that unconsciously compelled the general attendance of any household the reader may recall josh billings remark on the subject howells tells how they kept their guests to themselves when he visited their home in cambridge permitting him to indulge in as many unconventions as he chose how clemens would take a room at the parker house leaving the gas burning day and night and perhaps arrive at cambridge after a dinner or a reading in evening dress and slippers and joyously remain with them for a day or more in that guise slipping on an overcoat and a pair of rubbers when they went for a walk also how he smoked continuously in every room of the house smoked during every waking moment and how howells mindful of his insurance sometimes slipped in and removed the still burning cigar after he was asleep clemens had difficulty in getting to sleep in that earlier day and for a time found it soothing to drink a little champagne on retiring once when he arrived in boston howells said clemens we've laid in a bottle of champagne for you but he answered oh uh, that's no good any more uh, beer's the thing so howells provided the beer and always afterward had a vision of his guest going upstairs that night with a pint bottle under each arm he invented other methods of inducing slumber as the years went by and at one time found that this precious boon came more easily when he stretched himself on the bathroom floor he was a perpetual joy to the howells family when he was there even though the household required a general reorganization when he was gone mildred howells remembers how as a very little girl her mother cautioned her not to ask for anything she wanted at the table when company was present but to speak privately of it to her miss howells declares that while mark twain was their guest she nearly starved because it was impossible to get her mother's attention and mrs howells after one of those visits of hilarity and disorder said well it most kills me but it pays a remark which clemens vastly enjoyed howells himself once wrote your visit was a perfect ovation for us we never enjoy anything so much as those visits of yours the smoke and the scotch and the late hours almost kill us but we look each other in the eyes when you are gone and say what a glorious time it was and air the library and begin sleeping and longing to have you back again end of chapter one hundred and seven howells clemens and george read by john greenman this is section four of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography chapter one hundred and eight summer labors at quarry farm they went to elmira that summer of seventy six to be hermits and eschew caves and live in the sun as clemens wrote in a letter to dr brown they returned to the place as to paradise clemens to his study and the books which he always called for mrs clemens to a blessed relief from social obligations the children to the shady play places the green sloping hill where they could race and tumble and to all their animal friends Susie was really growing up. She had had several birthdays, quite grand affairs, when she had been brought down in the morning, decked and with proper ceremonies, with subsequent celebration. She was a strange, thoughtful child, much given to reflecting on the power and presence of infinity, for she was religiously taught. 
Down in the city, one night, there was a grand display of fireworks, and the hilltop was a good place from which to enjoy it. But it grew late after a little, and Susie was ordered to bed. She said thoughtfully, "'I wish I could sit up all night, as God does.' The baby, whom they still called Bay, was a tiny brown creature who liked to romp in the sun and be rocked to sleep at night with a song. Clemens often took them for extended walks, pushing Bay in her carriage. Once, in a preoccupied moment, he let go of the little vehicle, and it started downhill, gaining speed rapidly. He awoke then, and set off in wild pursuit. Before he could overtake the runaway carriage, it had turned to the roadside and upset. Bay was lying among the stones, and her head was bleeding. Hastily binding the wound with a handkerchief, he started full speed with her up the hill toward the house, calling for restoratives as he came. It was no serious matter. The little girl was strong and did not readily give way to affliction. The children were unlike. Susie was all contemplation and nerves, Bay serene and practical. It was said, when a pet cat died, this was some years later, that Susie deeply reflected as to its life here and hereafter, while Bay was concerned only as to the style of its funeral. Susie showed early her father's quaintness of remark. Once they bought her a heavier pair of shoes than she approved of, she was not in the best of humors during the day, and that night, when at prayer time, her mother said, "'Now, Susie, put your thoughts on God.' She answered, "'Mama, I can't with those shoes.' Clemens worked steadily that summer and did a variety of things. He had given up a novel, begun with much enthusiasm, but he had undertaken another long manuscript. By the middle of August he had written several hundred pages of a story which was to be a continuation of Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Now, here is a curious phase of genius. The novel, which for a time had filled him with enthusiasm and faith, had no important literary value, whereas, concerning this new tale, he says, I like it only tolerably well, as far as I have gone, and may possibly pigeonhole or burn the manuscript when it is done. This of the story which, of his books of pure fiction, will perhaps longer survive. He did, in fact, give the story up, and without much regret, when it was about half completed, and let it lie unfinished for years. He wrote one short tale, The Canvasser's Story, a burlesque of no special distinction, and he projected for the Atlantic a scheme of blindfold novelettes, a series of stories to be written by well-known authors and others, each to be constructed on the same plot. One can easily imagine Clemens's enthusiasm over a banal project like that. His impulses were always rainbow-hued, whether valuable or not. But it is curious that Howells should welcome and even encourage an enterprise so far removed from all the traditions of art. It fell to pieces, at last, of inherent misconstruction. The title was to be A Murder and a Marriage. Clemens could not arrive at a logical climax that did not bring the marriage and the hanging on the same day. The Atlantic started its Contributors Club, and Howells wrote to Clemens for a paragraph or more of personal opinion on any subject, assuring him that he could spit his spite out at somebody or something as if it were a passage from a letter. That was a fairly large permission to give Mark Twain. The paragraph he sent was the sort of thing he would write with glee and hug himself over in the thought of Howell's necessity of rejecting it. In the accompanying note he said, "'Say, boss, do you want this to lighten up your old freight train with? I suppose you won't, but then it won't take long to say so.'" He was always sending impossible offerings to the magazines, innocently enough sometimes, but often out of pure mischievousness. Yet they were constantly after him, for they knew they were likely to get a first water gem. Mary Mopes Dodge of St. Nicholas wrote time and again, and finally said, I know a man who was 
persecuted by an editor till he went distracted in his reading that year at the farm he gave more than customary attention to one of his favorite books pepys diary that captivating old record which no one can follow continuously without catching the infection of its manner and the desire of imitation he had been reading diligently one day when he determined to try his hand on an imaginary record of conversation and court manners of a bygone day written in the phrase of the period the result was fireside conversation in the time of queen elizabeth or as he later called it sixteen o one the conversation recorded by a supposed pepys of that period was written with all the outspoken coarseness and nakedness of that rank day when fireside sociabilities were limited only by the range of loosened fancy vocabulary and physical performance and not by any bounds of convention howells has spoken of mark twain's elizabethan breadth of parlance and how he howells was always hiding away in discreet holes and corners the letters in which clemens had loosed his bold fancy to stoop on rank suggestion i could not bear to burn them he declares and i could not after the first reading quite bear to look at them in sixteen o one mark twain outdid himself in the elizabethan field it was written as a letter to that robust divine rev joseph twichell who had no special scruples concerning shakespearean parlance and customs before it was mailed it was shown to david gray who was spending a sunday at elmira gray said print it and put your name to it mark you have never done a greater piece of work than that john hay whom it also reached in due time pronounced it a classic a most exquisite bit of old english morality hay surreptitiously permitted some proofs to be made of it and it has been circulated privately though sparingly ever since at one time a special font of antique type was made for it and one hundred copies were taken on hand-made paper they would easily bring a hundred dollars each today. 1601 is a genuine classic as classics of that sort go it is better than the gross obscenities of rabelais and perhaps in some day to come the taste that justified gargantua and the decameron will give this literary refugee shelter and setting among the more conventional writings of mark twain human taste is a curious thing delicacy is purely a matter of environment and point of view in a notebook of a later period clemens himself wrote it depends on who writes a thing whether it is coarse or not i once wrote a conversation between elizabeth shakespeare ben johnson beaumont sir walter raleigh lord bacon sir nicholas throckmorton and a stupid old nobleman this latter being cupbearer to the queen and ostensible reporter of the talk there were four maids of honor present and a sweet young girl two years younger than the boy beaumont i built a conversation which could have happened i used words such as were used at that time sixteen o one i sent it anonymously to a magazine and how the editor abused it and the sender but that man was a praiser of rabelais and had been saying oh that we had a rabelais i judged that i could furnish him one eighteen hundred and seventy six was a presidential year the year of the hayes tilden campaign clemens and howells were both warm republicans and actively interested in the outcome clemens as he confessed for the first time in his life before his return to hartford he announced himself publicly as a hayes man made so by governor hayes letter of acceptance which he said expresses my own political convictions his politics had not been generally known up to that time 
and a tilden and hendricks club in jersey city had invited him to be present and give them some political counsel at a flag-raising he wrote declining pleasantly enough then added you have asked me for some political counsel or advice in view of mr tilden's civil war record my advice is not to raise the flag he wrote howells if tilden is elected i think the entire country will go pretty straight to uh, mrs howells bad place howells was writing a campaign biography of hayes which he hoped would have a large sale and clemens urged him to get it out quickly and save the country howells working like a beaver in turn urged clemens to take the field in the cause returning to hartford clemens presided at a political rally and made a speech the most widely quoted of the campaign all papers without distinction as to party quoted it and all readers regardless of politics read it with joy yet conditions did not improve when howells book had been out a reasonable length of time he wrote that it had sold only two thousand copies there's success for you he said it makes me despair of the republic i can tell you clemens however did not lose faith and went on shouting for hayes and damning tilden till the final vote was cast in later life he changed his mind about tilden as did many others through sympathy sympathy could make mark twain change his mind any time he stood for the right but above all for justice he stood for the wronged regardless of all other things end of chapter one hundred and eight summer labors at quarry farm read by john greenman this is section five of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter one hundred and nine the public appearance of tom sawyer clemens gave a few readings in boston and philadelphia but when urged to go elsewhere made the excuse that he was having his portrait painted and could not leave home as a matter of fact he was enjoying himself with frank millet who had been invited to the house to do the portrait and had captured the fervent admiration of the whole family millet was young handsome and lively clemens couldn't see enough of him the children adored him and added his name to the prayer which included each member of the household the holy family clemens called it millet had brought with him but one piece of canvas for the portrait and when the first sketch was finished mrs clemens was so delighted with it that she did not wish him to touch it again she was afraid of losing some particular feeling in it which she valued millet went to the city for another canvas and clemens accompanied him while millet was doing his shopping it happened to occur to clemens that it would be well to fill in the time by having his hair cut he left word with a clerk to tell millet that he had gone across the street by and by the artist came over and nearly wept with despair when he saw his subject sheared of the auburn gray sprinkled aureola that had made his first sketch a success he tried it again and the result was an excellent likeness but it never satisfied millet the adventures of tom sawyer appeared late in december eighteen seventy six and immediately took its place as foremost of american stories of boy life a place which it unquestionably holds to this day we have already considered the personal details of this story for they were essentially nothing more than the various aspects of mark twain's own boyhood it is only necessary to add a word concerning the elaboration of this period in literary form from every point it is a masterpiece this picture of boy life in a little lazy drowsy town with all the irresponsibility and general disreputability of boy character coupled with that indefinable formless elusive something we call boy conscience which is more likely to be boy terror and a latent instinct of manliness these things are so truly portrayed that every boy and man reader finds the tale fitting into his own remembered years 
as if it had grown there. Every boy has played off sick to escape school. Every boy has reflected in his heart Tom's picture of himself being brought home dead, and gloated over the stricken consciences of those who had blighted his young life. Every boy of that day, at least, every normal, respectable boy, grew up to fear God and dread the Sunday school, as Howells puts it in his review. As for the story itself, the narrative of it, it is pure delight. The pirate camp on the island is simply boy heaven. What boy, for instance, would not change any other glory or boon that the world holds for this? They built a fire against the side of a great log twenty or thirty steps within the somber depths of the forest, and then cooked some bacon in the frying-pan for supper, and used up half of the corn pone stock they had brought. It seemed glorious sport to be feasting in that wild, free way in the virgin forest of an unexplored and uninhabited island, far from the haunts of men, and they said they never would return to civilization. The climbing fire lit up their faces, and threw its ruddy glare upon the pillared tree-trunks of their forest temple, and upon the varnished foliage and the festooning vines. There is a magic in it. Mark Twain, when he wrote it, felt renewed in him all the old fascination of those days and nights with Tom Blankenship, John Briggs, and the Bowen boys on Glasscox Island. Everywhere in Tom Sawyer there is a quality, entirely apart from the humor and the narrative, which the younger reader is likely to overlook. No one forgets the whitewashing scene, but not many of us from our early reading recall this delicious bit of description which introduces it. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill beyond the village and above it was green with vegetation and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land dreamy reposeful and inviting tom's night visit home the graveyard scene with the murder of dr robinson the adventures of tom and becky in the cave these are all marvelously invented Literary thrill touches the ultimate in one incident of the cave episode. Brander Matthews has written, Nor is there any situation quite as thrilling as that awful moment in the cave when the boy and the girl are lost in the darkness, and when Tom suddenly sees a human hand bearing a light, and then finds that the hand is the hand of Indian Joe, his one mortal enemy. I have always thought that the vision of the hand in the cave in Tom Sawyer was one of the very finest things in the literature of adventure since Robinson Crusoe first saw a single footprint in the sand of the seashore. Mark Twain's invention was not always a reliable quantity, but with that eccentricity which goes with any attribute of genius, it was likely at any moment to rise supreme. If to the critical, hardened reader, the tale seems a shade overdone here and there, a trifle extravagant in its delineations, let him go back to his first long-ago reading of it, and see if he recalls anything but his pure delight in it then. As a boy's story, it has not been equaled. Tom Sawyer has ranked in popularity with Roughing It. Its sales go steadily on from year to year and are likely to continue so long as boys and girls do not change, and men and women remember. Colonel Henry Watterson, when he finished Tom Sawyer, wrote, I have just laid down Tom Sawyer, and cannot resist the pressure. It is immense. I read every word of it, and didn't skip a line, and nearly disgraced myself several times in the presence of a sleeping car full of honorable and pious people. Once I had to get to one side, and have a cry, as for an internal compound of laughter and tears, there was no end to it. 
the funeral of the boys, the cave business, and the hunt for the hidden treasure are as dramatic as anything I know of in fiction, while the pathos, particularly everything relating to Huck and Aunt Polly, makes a cross between Dickens' skill and Thackeray's nature, which, resembling neither, is thoroughly impressive and original. End of chapter 109 The Public Appearance of Tom Sawyer Read by John Greenman This is section six of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 110, Mark Twain and Bret Hart Write a Play. It was the fall and winter of 76 that Bret Hart came to Hartford and collaborated with Mark Twain on the play Ah Sin, a comedy drama or melodrama written for Charles T. Parslow, the great impersonator of Chinese character. Hart had written a successful play which unfortunately he had sold outright for no great sum, and was eager for another venture. Hart had the dramatic sense and the constructive invention. He also had humor, but he felt the need of the sort of humor that Mark Twain could furnish. Furthermore, he believed that a play backed by both their reputations must start with great advantages. Clemens also realized these things, and the arrangement was made. Speaking of their method of working, Clemens once said, Well, Brett came down to Hartford, and we talked it over, and then Brett wrote it while I played billiards. But, of course, I had to go over it to get the dialect right, Brett never did know anything about dialect, which is hardly a fair statement of the case. They both worked on the play, and worked hard. During the period of its construction, Hart had an order for a story which he said he must finish at once, as he needed the money. It must be delivered by the following night, and he insisted that he must be getting at it without a moment's delay. Still, he seemed in no haste to begin. The evening passed, bedtime came, then he asked that an open fire might be made in his room and a bottle of whiskey sent up, in case he needed something to keep him awake. George attended to these matters, and nothing more was heard of Hart until very early next morning, when he rang for George and asked for a fresh fire and an additional supply of whiskey. At breakfast time he appeared, fresh, rosy, and elate, with the announcement that his story was complete. That forenoon the Saturday morning club met at the Clemens home. It was a young women's club, of which Mark Twain was a sort of honorary member, a club for the purpose of intellectual advancement, somewhat on the order of the Monday evening club of men, except that the papers read before it were not prepared by members, but by men and women prominent in some field of intellectual progress. Bret Hart had agreed to read to them on this particular occasion, and he gaily appeared and gave them the story just finished, Thankful Blossom, a tale which Mark Twain always regarded as one of Hart's very best. The new play, Ah Sin, by Mark Twain and Bret Hart, was put on at Washington at the National Theatre on the evening of May 7, 1877. It had been widely exploited in the newspapers, and the fame of the authors ensured a crowded opening. Clemens was unable to go over on account of a sudden attack of bronchitis. Parslow was nervous accordingly, and the presence of Hart does not seem to have added to his happiness. "'I am not very well myself,' he wrote to Clemens. "'The excitement of the first night is bad enough, but to have the annoyance with Hart that I have is too much for a new beginner. Nevertheless, the play seems to have gone well with Parslow as Ah Sin, a Chinese laundry man who was also a great number of other diverting things, with a fair support and a happy-go-lucky presentation of frontier life, which included a supposed murder, a false accusation, and a general clearing up of mystery by the pleasant and wily and useful and entertaining Ah Sin. It was not a great play, it was neither very coherent nor convincing, 
but it had a lot of good fun in it, with character parts which, if not faithful to life, were faithful enough to the public conception of it to be amusing and exciting. At the end of each act not only Parslow, but also the principal members of the company, were called before the curtain for special acknowledgments. When it was over there was a general call for Ah Sin, who came before the curtain and read a telegram. Charles T. Parslow. I am on the sick list, and therefore cannot come to Washington, but I have prepared two speeches, one to deliver an event of failure of the play, and the other if successful. Please tell me which I shall send. May be better to put it to vote. Mark Twain. The House cheered the letter and when it was put to vote decided unanimously that the play had been a success, a verdict more kindly than true. J. I. Ford, of the theater management, wrote to Clemens, next morning after the first performance, urging him to come to Washington in person and wet nurse the play until it could do for itself. Ford expressed satisfaction with the play and its prospects, and concludes, I enclose notices. Come if you can. Your presence will be worth ten thousand men. The king's name is a tower of strength. I have urged the president to come tonight. The play made no money in Washington, but Augustin Daly decided to put it on in New York at the Fifth Avenue Theater, with a company which included, besides Parslow, Edmund Collier, P. A. Anderson, Dora Goldthwaite, Henry Crisp, and Mrs. Wells, a very worthy group of players indeed. Clemens was present at the opening, dressed in white, which he affected only for warm weather use in those days, and made a speech at the end of the third act. Ah Sin did not excite much enthusiasm among New York dramatic critics. The houses were promising for a time, but for some reason the performance as a whole did not contain the elements of prosperity. It set out on its provincial travels with no particular prestige beyond the reputation of its authors, and it would seem that this was not enough, for it failed to pay, and all parties concerned presently abandoned it to its fate, and it was heard of no more. Just why Ah Sin did not prosper, it would not become us to decide at this far remove of time and taste. Poorer plays have succeeded, and better plays have failed since then, and no one has ever been able to demonstrate the mystery. A touch somewhere, a pulling about and a readjustment, might have saved Ah Sin, but the pullings and haulings which they gave it did not. Perhaps it still lies in some managerial vault, and some day may be dragged to light and reconstructed and recast, and come into its reward. Who knows? or it may have drifted to that harbor of forgotten plays, whence there is no returning. As between Hart and Clemens, the whole matter was unfortunate. In the course of their association there arose a friction, and the long-time friendship disappeared. End of chapter 110. Mark Twain and Bret Hart write a play. Read by John Greenman. This is section seven of Mark Twain, a biography, volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 111, A Bermuda Holiday. On the 16th of May, 1877, Mark Twain set out on what in his notebook he declared to be the first actual pleasure trip he had ever taken meaning that on every previous trip he had started with a purpose other than that of mere enjoyment. He took with him his friend and pastor, the Reverend Joseph H. Twitchell, and they sailed for Bermuda, an island resort not so well known or so fashionable as today. They did not go to a hotel. Under assumed names they took up quarters in a boarding-house, with a Mrs. Kirkham, and were unmolested and altogether happy in their wanderings through four golden days. Mark Twain could not resist keeping a notebook, setting down bits of scenery and character and incident, just as he had always done. He was impressed with the cheapness of property and living in the Bermuda of that period. 
he makes special mention of some cottages constructed of coral blocks all as beautiful and as neat as a pin at the cost of four hundred and eighty dollars each to twichell he remarked joe this place is like heaven and i'm going to make the most of it mark said twichell that's right make the most of a place that is like heaven while you have a chance in one of the entries the final one clemens says bermuda is free at present from the triple curse of railways telegraphs and newspapers but this will not last the year i propose to spend next year here and no more when they were ready to leave and started for the steamer twichell made an excuse to go back his purpose being to tell their landlady and her daughter that without knowing it they had been entertaining mark twain did you ever hear of mark twain asked twichell the daughter answered yes she said until i'm tired of the name i know a young man who never talks of anything else well said twichell that gentleman with me is mark twain the kirkhams declined to believe it at first and then were in deep sorrow that they had not known it earlier twichell promised that he and clemens would come back the next year and they meant to go back we always mean to go back to places but it was thirty years before they returned at last and then their pleasant landlady was dead on the home trip they sighted a wandering vessel manned by blacks trying to get to new york she had no cargo and was pretty helpless later when she was reported again clemens wrote about it in a hartford paper telling the story as he knew it the vessel had shipped the crew on a basis of passage to new york in exchange for labor so it was a pleasure excursion clemens dwelt on this fancy i have heard of a good many pleasure excursions but this heads the list it is monumental and if ever the tired old tramp is found i should like to be there and see him in his sorrowful rags and his venerable head of grass and seaweed and hear the ancient mariners tell the story of their mysterious wanderings through the solemn solitudes of the ocean long afterward this vagrant craft was reported again still drifting with the relentless gulf stream perhaps she reached new york in time one would like to know but there seems no good way to find out that first bermuda voyage was always a happy memory to mark twain to twichell he wrote that it was the joyousest trip he had ever made not a heartache anywhere not a twinge of conscience i often come to myself out of a reverie and detect an undertone of thought that had been thinking itself without volition of mind viz that if we had only had ten days of those walks and talks instead of four there was but one regret howells had not been with them clemens denounced him for his absence if you had gone with us and let me pay the fifty dollars which the trip and the board and the various knick-knacks and mementos would cost i would have picked up enough droppings from your conversation to pay me five hundred per cent profit in the way of the several magazine articles which i could have written whereas i can now write only one or two and am therefore largely out of pocket by your proud ways clemens would not fail to write about his trip he could not help doing that and he began some rambling notes of an idle excursion as soon as he landed in hartford they were quite what the name would signify 
leisurely, pleasant commentaries on a loafing, peaceful vacation. They are not startling in their humor or description, but are gently amusing and summary, reflecting, bubble-like, evanescent fancies of Bermuda. Howells, shut up in a Boston editorial office, found them delightful enough, and very likely his Atlantic readers agreed with him. The story of Isaac and the Prophets of Baal was one that Captain Ned Wakeman had told to Twitchell during a voyage which the latter had made to Aspinwall with that vigorous old seafarer. So in the rambling notes Wakeman appears as Captain Hurricane Jones, probably a step in the evolution of the later name of Stormfield. The best feature of the series, there were four papers in all, is a story of a rescue in mid-ocean, but surely the brightest ripple of humor is the reference to Bermuda's mahogany tree. There was exactly one mahogany tree on the island. I know this to be reliable, because I saw a man who said he had counted it many a time, and could not be mistaken. He was a man with a haze lip and a pure heart, and everybody said he was as true as steel. Such men are all too few. Clemens cared less for these papers than did Howells. He had serious doubts about the first two and suggested their destruction, but with Howells' appreciation his own confidence in them returned, and he let them all go in. They did not especially advance his reputation, but perhaps they did it no harm. End of chapter 111, A Bermuda Holiday, read by John Greenman. This is section 8 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 112, A New Play and a New Tale. He wrote a short story that year which is notable mainly for the fact that in it the telephone becomes a literary property, probably for the first time. The loves of Alonzo Fitz, Clarence, and Rosanna Ethelton employed in the consummation what was then a prospect rather than a reality, long-distance communication. His work that summer consisted mainly of two extensive undertakings, one of which he completed without delay. He still had the dramatic ambition, and he believed that he was capable now of constructing a play entirely from his own resources. To Howells in June he wrote, "'Today I am deep in a comedy which I began this morning. Principal character, an old detective. I skeletoned the first act and wrote the second today, and am dog-tired now. Fifty-four pages of manuscript in seven hours. Seven days later, the 4th of July, he said, I have piled up one hundred and fifty-one pages on my comedy. The first, second, and fourth acts are done, and done to my satisfaction, too. Tomorrow and next day we'll finish the third act and the play. Never had so much fun over anything in my life. Never such consuming interest and delight. And just think, I had Saul Smith Russell in my mind's eye for the old detective's part, and bang it, he has gone off pottering with Oliver Optic, or else the papers lie. He was working with enthusiasm, you see, believing in it with a faith which, alas, was no warrant for its quality. Even Howells caught his enthusiasm and became eager to see the play, and to have the story it contained told for the Atlantic. But in the end it proved a mistake. Dion Boucicot, when he read the manuscript, pronounced it better than Ah Sin, but that was only qualified praise. Actors who considered the play anxious enough to have Mark Twain's name on their posters and small bills were obliged to admit that, while it contained marvelous lines, it 
wouldn't go. John Brougham wrote, There is an absolute embarrassment of riches in your detective, most assuredly, but the difficulty is to put it into profitable form. The quartz is there in abundance, only requiring the necessary manipulation to extract the gold. In narrative structure the story would be full of life, character, and the most exuberant fun, but it is altogether too diffuse in its present condition for dramatic representation, and I confess I do not feel sufficient confidence in my own experience, even if I had the time, which on reflection I find I have not, to undertake what, under different circumstances, would be a labor of love. Your sincerely, John Brougham. That was frank, manly, and to the point. It covered the ground exactly. Simon Wheeler, the amateur detective, had plenty of good material in it, plenty of dialogue and situations, but the dialogue wouldn't play, and the situations wouldn't act. Clemens realized that perhaps the drama was not, after all, his forte. He dropped Simon Wheeler, lost his interest in Ah Sin, even leased Colonel Sellers for the coming season, and so, in a sort of fury, put theatrical matters out of his mind. He had entered upon what, for him, was a truer domain. One day he picked up from among the books at the farm a little juvenile volume, an English story of the thirteenth century by Charlotte M. Junge, entitled The Prince and the Page. It was a story of Edward I and his cousins, Richard and Henry de Montfort. In part it told of the submerged personality of the latter, picturing him as having dwelt in disguise as a blind beggar for a period of years. It was a story of a sort, and with a setting that Mark Twain loved, and as he read there came a correlative idea. Not only would he disguise a prince as a beggar, but a beggar as a prince. He would have them change places in the world, and each learn the burdens of the other's life. There is no point of resemblance between the prince and the pauper, and the tale that inspired it. No one would ever guess that the one had grown out of the readings of the other and no comparison of any sort is possible between them. The plot presented physical difficulties. He still had some lurking thought of stage performance, and saw in his mind a spectacular presentation, with all the costumery of an early period as background for a young and beautiful creature who would play the part of Prince. The old device of changelings in the cradle, later used in Puddinhead Wilson, presented itself to him, but it could not provide the situations he had in mind. Finally came the thought of a playful interchange of raiment and state, with startling and unlooked-for consequence. The guise and personality of Tom Canty, of Offal Court, for those of the son of Henry the Eighth, little Edward Tudor, more lately sixth English king of that name. This little prince was not his first selection for the part. His original idea had been to use the late King Edward the Seventh, then Prince of Wales, at about fifteen, but he found that it would never answer to lose a prince among the slums of modern London, and have his proud estate denied and jeered at by a modern mob. He felt that he could not make it seem real. So he followed back through history, looking along for the proper time in Prince, till he came to little Edward, who was too young. But no matter, he would do. He decided to begin his new venture in story form. He could dramatize it later. The situation appealed to him immensely. The idea seemed a brand new one. It was delightful, it was fascinating, and he was saturated with the atmosphere and literature and history, the data and detail of that delightful old time. He put away all thought of cheap, modern play-acting and writing to begin one of the loveliest and most entertaining and instructive tales of old English life. He decided to be quite accurate in his picture of the period, and he posted himself on old London very carefully. He bought a pocket-map, which he studied in the minutest detail. He wrote about four hundred manuscript pages of the tale that summer, then, as the inspiration seemed to lag a little, put it aside, as was his habit, to wait until the ambition for it should be renewed. It was a long wait, as usual. He did not touch it again for more than three years. 
End of chapter 112 A New Play and a New Tale Read by John Greenman This is section 9 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 113, Two Domestic Dramas. Some unusual happenings took place that summer of 1877. John T. Lewis, colored, already referred to as the religious antagonist of Anti Cord, by great presence of mind and bravery, saved the lives of Mrs. Clemens' sister-in-law, Mrs. Charles Charlie Langdon, her little daughter Julia, and her nursemaid. They were in a buggy, and their runaway horse was flying down East Hill toward Elmira to certain destruction, when Lewis, laboring slowly homeward with a loaded wagon, saw them coming, and turned his team across the road, after which he leapt out and with extraordinary strength and quickness grabbed the horse's bridle and brought him to a standstill. The Clemens and Crane families, who had seen the runaway start at the farm gate, arrived half-wild with fear, only to find the supposed victims entirely safe. Everybody contributed in rewarding Lewis. He received money, $1,500, and various other presents, including inscribed books and trinkets also what he perhaps valued more than anything a marvelous stem-winding gold watch clemens writing a full account to dr brown of the watch says and if any scoffer shall say behold this thing is out of character there is an inscription within which will silence him for it will teach him that this wearer aggrandizes the watch not the watch, the wearer. In another paragraph he says, When Lewis arrived the other evening, after having saved those lives by a feat which I think is the most marvelous I can call to mind, when he arrived hunched up on his manure wagon and as grotesquely picturesque as usual, Everybody wanted to go and see how he looked. They came back and said he was beautiful. It was so, too, and yet he would have photographed exactly as he would have done any day these past seven years that he has occupied this farm. Lewis acknowledged his gifts in a letter which closed with a paragraph of rare native loftiness but i beg to say humbly that inasmuch as divine providence saw fit to use me as an instrument for the saving of those precious lives the honor conferred upon me was greater than the feat performed lewis lived to enjoy his prosperity and the honor of the clemens and langdon households for twenty-nine years when he was too old to work there was a pension to which clemens contributed also henry h rogers so the simple-hearted noble old negro closed his days in peace mrs crane in a letter late in july nineteen o six told of his death he was always cheerful and seemed not to suffer much pain told stories and was able to eat almost everything three days ago a new difficulty appeared on account of which his doctor said he must go to the hospital for care such as it was quite impossible to give it in his home. He died on his way there. Thus it happened that he died on the road where he had performed his greatest deed. A second unusual incident of that summer occurred in Hartford. There had been a report of a strange man seen about the Clemens place, thought to be a prospecting burglar, and Clemens went over to investigate. A little searching inquiry revealed that the man was not a burglar, but a mechanic out of employment, a lover of one of the housemaids, who had given him food and shelter on the premises, intending no real harm. When the girl found that her secret was discovered, she protested that he was her fiancé, though she said he appeared lately to have changed his mind and no longer wished to marry her. The girl seemed heartbroken, 
and sympathy for her was naturally the first and about the only feeling which Clemens developed for the time being. He reasoned with the young man, but without making much headway. Finally his dramatic instinct prompted him to a plan of a sort which would have satisfied even Tom Sawyer. He asked Twitchell to procure a license for the couple, and to conceal himself in a ground-floor bathroom. He arranged with the chief of police to be on hand in another room, with the rest of the servants quietly to prepare a wedding feast, and finally with Lizzie herself to be dressed for the ceremony. He had already made an appointment with the young man to come to see him at a certain hour on a matter of business, and the young man arrived in the belief, no doubt, that it was something which would lead to profitable employment. When he came in, Clemens gently and quietly reviewed the situation, told him of the young girl's love for him, how he had been sheltered and fed by her, how through her kindness to him she had compromised her reputation for honesty and brought upon her all the suspicion of having sheltered a burglar, how she was ready and willing to marry him, and how he, Clemens, was ready to assist them to obtain work and a start in life. But the young man was not enthusiastic. He was a Swede, and slow of action. He resolutely declared that he was not ready to marry yet, and in the end refused to do so. Then came the dramatic moment. Clemens quietly but firmly informed him that the wedding ceremony must take place, that by infesting his premises he had broken the law, not only against trespass, but most likely against housebreaking. There was a brief discussion of this point. Finally Clemens gave him five minutes to make up his mind, with the statement that he had an officer in waiting, and unless he would consent to the wedding he would be taken in charge. The young man began to temporize, saying that it would be necessary for him to get a license and a preacher. But Clemens stepped to the door of the bathroom, opened it, and let out Twitchell, who had been sweltering there in that fearful place for more than an hour, it being August. The delinquent lover found himself confronted with all the requisites of matrimony except the bride, and just then this detail appeared on the scene, dressed for the occasion. Behind her ranged the rest of the servants and a few invited guests. Before the young man knew it he had a wife, and on the whole did not seem displeased. It ended with a gay supper and festivities. Then Clemens started them handsomely by giving each of them a check for one hundred dollars, and in truth, which in this case at least is stranger than fiction, they lived happily and prosperously ever after. Some years later Mark Twain based a story on this episode, but it was never entirely satisfactory and remains unpublished. End of chapter 113, Two Domestic Dramas, read by John Greenman. This is section 10 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 114, The Whittier Birthday Speech. It was the night of December 17, 1877, that Mark Twain made his unfortunate speech at the dinner given by the Atlantic staff to John G. Whittier on his 70th birthday. Clemens had attended a number of the dinners which the Atlantic gave on one occasion or another, and had provided a part of the entertainment. It is only fair to say that his after-dinner speeches at such times had been regarded as very special events, genuine triumphs of humor and delivery. But on this particular occasion he determined to outdo himself to prepare something unusual, startling, and something altogether unheard of. When Mark Twain had an impulse like that, it was possible for it to result in something dangerous, especially in those earlier days. This time it produced a bombshell, not just an ordinary bombshell or even a twelve-inch projectile, but a shell of planetary size. It was a sort of hoax, always a doubtful plaything, and in this case it brought even quicker and more terrible retribution than usual. It was an imaginary presentation of three disreputable frontier tramps, who at some time had imposed themselves on a lonely miner as Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes. 
quoting apposite selections from their verses to the accompaniment of cards and drink, and altogether conducting themselves in a most unsavory fashion. At the end came the enlightenment that these were not what they pretended to be, but only impostors, disgusting frauds. A feature like that would be a doubtful thing to try in any cultured atmosphere. The thought of associating, ever so remotely, those three old bummers which he had conjured up with the venerable and venerated Emerson, Longfellow, and Holmes, the Olympian Trinity, seems ghastly enough today and must have seemed even more so then. But Clemens, dazzled by the rainbow splendor of his conception, saw in it only a rare colossal humor, which would fairly lift and bear his hearers along on a tide of mirth. He did not show his effort to anyone beforehand. He wanted its full beauty to burst upon the entire company as a surprise. It did that. Howells was Toastmaster, and when he came to present Clemens, he took particular pains to introduce him as one of his foremost contributors and dearest friends. Here, he said, was a humorist who never left you hanging your head for having enjoyed his joke. Thirty years later Clemens himself wrote of his impressions as he rose to deliver his speech. I vaguely remember some of the details of that gathering, Dimly I can see a hundred people, uh, no, perhaps uh, fifty, shadowy figures, sitting at tables, feeding, ghosts now to me, and nameless forevermore. I don't know who they were, but I can very distinctly see, seated at the grand table, and facing the rest of us, Mr. Emerson supernaturally grave, unsmiling. Mr. Whittier, grave, lovely, his beautiful spirit shining out of his face. Mr. Longfellow, with his silken white hair and his benignant face. Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, flashing smiles and affection and all good fellowship everywhere, like a rose diamond whose facets are being turned toward the light first one way and then another a charming man and always fascinating whether he was talking or whether he was sitting still what he would call still but what would be more or less motion to other people I can see those figures with entire distinctness across this abyss of time. William Winter, the poet, had just preceded him, and it seemed a moment aptly chosen for his so different theme. And then, to quote Howells, the amazing mistake, the bewildering blunder, the cruel catastrophe was upon us. After the first two or three hundred words, when the general plan and purpose of the burlesque had developed, when the names of Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes began to be flung about by those bleary outcasts, and their verses, given that sorry association, those Atlantic diners became petrified with amazement and horror. Too late, then, the speaker realized his mistake. He could not stop. He must go on to the ghastly end and somehow he did it, while there fell a silence weighing many tons to the square inch, which deepened from moment to moment, and was broken only by the hysterical and blood-curdling laughter of a single guest, whose name shall not be handed down to infamy. Howells can remember little more than that, but Clemens recalls that one speaker made an effort to follow him, Bishop, the novelist, and that Bishop didn't last long. It was not many sentences after his first before he began to hesitate and break and lose his grip and totter and wobble, and at last he slumped down in a limp and mushy pile. 
The next man had not strength to rise, and somehow the company broke up. Howell's next recollection is of being in a room of the hotel, and of hearing Charles Dudley Warner saying in the gloom, "'Well, Mark, you're a funny fellow.' He remembers how, after a sleepless night, Clemens went out to buy some bric-a-brac, with a soul far from bric-a-brac, and returned to Hartford in a writhing agony of spirit. He believed that he was ruined forever, so far as his Boston associations were concerned, and when he confessed all the tragedy to Mrs. Clemens, it seemed to her also that the mistake could never be wholly repaired. The fact that certain papers quoted the speech and spoke well of it, and certain readers who had not listened to it thought it enormously funny, gave very little comfort. But perhaps his chief concern was the ruin which he believed he had brought upon Howells. He put his heart into a brief letter. My dear Howells, my sense of disgrace does not abate. It grows. I see that it is going to add itself to my list of permanencies, a list of humiliations that extends back to when I was seven years old, and which keep on persecuting me regardless of my repentances. I feel that my misfortune has injured me all over the country. Therefore, it will be best that I retire from before the public at present. It will hurt the Atlantic for me to appear in its pages now, so it is my opinion, and my wife's, that the telephone story had better be suppressed. Will you return those proofs or revises to me, so that I can use the same on some future occasion? It seems as if I must have been insane when I wrote that speech and saw no harm in it, no disrespect toward those men whom I reverenced so much, and what shame I brought upon you after what you said in introducing me. It burns me like fire to think of it. The whole matter is a dreadful subject. Let me drop it here, at least on paper. Penitently yours, Mark. So, all in a moment his world had come to an end, as it seemed, but Howell's letter, which came rushing back by first mail, brought hope. It was a fatality, Howell said, one of those sorrows into which a man walks with his eyes wide open, no one knows why. Howells assured him that Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes would so consider it beyond doubt, that Charles Eliot Norton had already expressed himself exactly in the right spirit concerning it. Howells declared that there was no intention of dropping Mark Twain's work from the Atlantic. You are not going to be floored by it. There is more justice than that even in this world. Especially as regards me, just call the sore spot well. I can say more, and with better heart, in praise of your good feeling, which was what I always liked in you, since this thing happened than I could before. It was agreed that he should at once write a letter to Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes, and he did write, laying his heart bare to them. Longfellow and Holmes answered in a fine spirit of kindliness, and Miss Emerson wrote for her father in the same tone. Emerson had not been offended, for he had not heard the speech, having arrived even then at that stage of semi-oblivion as to immediate things which eventually so completely shut him away. Longfellow's letter made light of the whole matter. The newspapers, he said, had caused all the mischief. A bit of humor at a dinner-table talk is one thing. A report of it in the morning papers is another. One needs the lamplight and the scenery. These failing, what was meant in jest assumes a serious aspect. I do not believe that anybody was much hurt. Certainly I was not, and Holmes tells me that he was not. So I think you may dismiss the matter from your mind without further remorse. It was a very pleasant dinner, and I think Whittier enjoyed it very much. Holmes likewise referred to it as a trifle. 
It never occurred to me for a moment to take offense or to feel wounded by your playful use of my name. I have heard some mild questionings as to whether, even in fun, it was good taste to associate the names of the authors with the absurdly unlike personalities attributed to them, but it seems to be an open question. Two of my friends, gentlemen of education and the highest social standing, were infinitely amused by your speech and stoutly defended it against the charge of impropriety. More than this, one of the cleverest and best-known ladies we have among us was highly delighted with it. Miss Emerson's letter was to Mrs. Clemens, and its home-like New England fashion did much to lift the gloom. Dear Mrs. Clemens, at New Year's our family always meets to spend two days together. Today my father came last, and brought with him Mr. Clemens' letter, so that I read it to the assembled family, and I have come right upstairs to write to you about it. My sister said, Oh, let father write, but my mother said, No, don't wait for him, go now, don't stop to pick that up, go this minute and write. I think that is a noble letter, tell them so. First, let me say that no shadow of indignation has ever been in any of our minds. The night of the dinner, my father says, he did not hear Mr. Clemens' speech. He was too far off, and my mother says that when she read it to him the next day it amused him. But what you will want is to know, without any softening, how we did feel. We were disappointed. We have liked almost everything we have ever seen over Mark Twain's signature. It has made us like the man, and we have delighted in the fun. Father has often asked us to repeat certain passages of The Innocents Abroad, and of a speech at a London dinner in 1872, and we all expect both to approve and to enjoy when we see his name. Therefore, when we read this speech it was a real disappointment. I said to my brother that it didn't seem good or funny, and he said, no, it was unfortunate. Still, some of those quotations were very good. And he gave them with relish, and my father laughed, though never having seen a card in his life, he couldn't understand them like his children. My mother read it lightly, and had hardly any second thoughts about it. To my father it is as if it had not been. He never quite heard, never quite understood it, and he forgets easily and entirely. I think it doubtful whether he writes to Mr. Clemens, for he is old and long ago gave up answering letters. I think you can see just how bad and how little bad it was as far as we are concerned, and this lovely heart-breaking letter makes up for our disappointment in our much-liked author, and restores our former feeling about him. Ellen T. Emerson the sorrow dulled a little as the days passed, but just after Christmas Clemens wrote to Howells, I haven't done a stroke of work since the Atlantic dinner, but I'm going to try tomorrow. How could I ever... Ah, well, I am a great and sublime fool, but then I am God's fool, and all his work must be contemplated with respect. So as long as that unfortunate speech is remembered, there will be differences of opinion as to its merits and propriety. Clemens himself, reading it for the first time in nearly thirty years, said, I find it gross, coarse. Well, I needn't go on with particulars. I don't like any part of it, from the beginning to the end. I find it always offensive and detestable. How do I account for this change of view? I don't know. But almost immediately afterward he gave it another consideration and reversed his opinion completely. All the spirit and delight of his old first conception returned, and preparing it for publication he wrote, North American Review, December 1907, now with comment included in the volumes of speeches, also see Appendix O at the end of last volume, I have read it twice, and 
unless i'm an idiot it hasn't a single defect in it from the first word to the last it is just as good as good can be it is smart it is saturated with humor there isn't a suggestion of coarseness or vulgarity in it anywhere it was altogether like mark twain to have those two absolutely opposing opinions in that brief time for after all it was only a question of the human point of view and mark twain's points of view were likely to be as extremely human as they were varied of course the first of these impressions the verdict of the fresh mind uninfluenced by the old conception was the more correct one the speech was decidedly out of place in that company the skit was harmless enough but it was of the comstock grain it lacked refinement and what was still worse it lacked humor at least the humor of a kind suited to that long ago company of listeners it was another of those grievous mistakes which genius and not talent can make for genius is a sort of possession the individual is pervaded dominated for a time by an angel or an imp and he seldom of himself is able to discriminate between his controls a literary imp was always lying in wait for mark twain the imp of the burlesque tempting him to do the outre the outlandish the shocking thing it was this that olivia clemens had to labor hardest against the cheapening of his own high purpose with an extravagant false note at which sincerity conviction and artistic harmony took wings and fled away notably he did a good burlesque now and then but his fame would not have suffered if he had been delivered altogether from his besetting temptation end of chapter 114 the whittier birthday speech read by john greenman this is section 11 of mark twain a biography volume 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter 115 Hartford and Billiards. Clemens was never much inclined to work, away from his Elmira study. Magnanimous incident literature, from the Atlantic, was about his only completed work of the winter of 1877 to 78. He was always tinkering with the visit to heaven, and after one reconstruction, Howells suggested that he bring it out as a book in England with Dean Stanley's endorsement though this may have been only semi-serious counsel. The story continued to lie in seclusion. Clemens had one new book in the field, a small book, but profitable. Dan Sloat's firm issued for him the Mark Twain scrapbook, and at the end of the first royalty period rendered a statement of 25,000 copies sold, which was well enough for a book that did not contain a single word that critics could praise or condemn. Sloat issued another little book for him soon after, Punch Brothers Punch, which besides that lively sketch contained the random notes and seven other selections. Mark Twain was tempted to go into the lecture field that winter not by any of the offers, though these were numerous enough, but by the idea of a combination which he thought might be not only profitable but pleasant. Thomas Nast had made a great success of his character lectures, and Clemens, recalling Nast's long-ago proposal, found it newly attractive. He wrote characteristically, "'My dear Nast, I did not think I should ever stand on a platform again until the time was come for me to say, I die innocent. But the same old offers keep arriving. I have declined them all, just as usual, though sorely tempted as usual. Now I do not decline because I mind talking to an audience, but because, one, traveling alone is so heartbreakingly dreary, and, two, 
shouldering the whole show is such a cheer-killing responsibility therefore i now propose to you what you proposed to me in eighteen sixty seven ten years ago when i was unknown viz that you stand on the platform and make pictures and i stand by you and blackguard the audience i should enormously enjoy meandering around to big towns don't want to go to the little ones with you for company my idea is not to fatten the lecture agents and lyceums on the spoils but to put all the ducats religiously into two equal piles and say to the artist and lecturer absorb these for instance here follows a plan and a possible list of the cities to be visited the letter continues call the gross receipts one hundred thousand dollars for four months and a half and the profit from six thousand to seventy five thousand i try to make the figures large enough and leave it to the public to reduce them i did not put in philadelphia because pew owns that town and last winter when i made a little reading trip he only paid me three hundred dollars and pretended his concert i read fifteen minutes in the midst of a concert cost him a vast sum and so he couldn't afford any more i could get up a better concert with a barrel of cats i have imagined two or three pictures and concocted the accompanying remarks to see how the thing would go i was charmed well you think it over nast and drop me a line we should have some fun undoubtedly this would have been a profitable combination but nast had a distaste for platforming had given it up as he thought for life so clemens settled down to the fireside days that afforded him always the larger comfort the children were at an age to be entertaining and to be entertained in either case they furnished him plenty of diversion when he did not care to write they had learned his gift as a romancer and with this audience he might be as extravagant as he liked they sometimes assisted by furnishing subjects they would bring him a picture requiring him to invent a story for it without a moment's delay sometimes they suggested the names of certain animals or objects and demanded that these be made into a fairy tale if they heard the name of any new creature or occupation they were likely to offer them as impromptu inspiration once he was suddenly required to make a story out of a plumber and a bog constrictor but he was equal to it on one side of the library along the bookshelves that joined the mantelpiece were numerous ornaments and pictures at one end was the head of a girl that they called emmeline and at the other was an oil painting of a cat when other subjects failed the romancer was obliged to build a story impromptu and without preparation beginning with the cat working along through the bric-a-brac and ending with emmeline this was the unvarying program he was not allowed to begin with emmeline and end with the cat and he was not permitted to introduce an ornament from any other portion of the room he could vary the story as much as he liked in fact he was required to do that the trend of its chapters from the cat to emmeline was a well-trodden and ever entertaining way he gave up his luxurious study to the children as a sort of nursery and playroom and took up his writing quarters first in a room over the stables then in the billiard room which on the whole he preferred to any other place for it was a third-story remoteness and he could knock the balls about for inspiration the billiard room became his headquarters 
he received his callers there and impressed them into the game if they could play well and good if they could not play so much the better he could beat them extravagantly and he took a huge delight in such conquests every friday evening or oftener a small party of billiard lovers gathered and played until a late hour told stories and smoked till the room was blue comforting themselves with hot scotch and general good fellowship mark twain always had a genuine passion for billiards he was never tired of the game he could play all night he would stay till the last man gave out from sheer weariness then he would go on knocking the balls about alone he liked to invent new games and new rules for old games often inventing a rule on the spur of the moment to fit some particular shot or position on the table it amused him highly to do this to make the rule advantage his own play and to pretend a deep indignation when his opponents disqualified his rulings and rode him down s c dunham was among those who belonged to the friday evening club as they called it and henry c robinson long dead and rare ned bunce and f g whitmore and the old room there at the top of the house with its little outside balcony rang with their voices and their laughter in that day when life and the world for them was young clemens quoted to them sometimes come fill the cup and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling the bird of time has but a little way to flutter and the bird is on the wing omar was new then on this side of the atlantic and to his serene eat drink and be merry philosophy in fitzgerald's rhyme these were early converts mark twain had an impressive musical delivery of verse the players were willing at any moment to listen as he recited for some we loved the loveliest and best that from his vintage rolling time has pressed have drunk their cup a round or two before and one by one crept silently to rest ah make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend dust unto dust and under dust to lie sans wine sans song sans singer and sans end the rubaiyat had made its first appearance in hartford a little before in a column of extracts published in the current twichell immediately wrote clemens a card read if you haven't the extracts from oman khayyam on the first page of this morning's current i think we'll have to get the book i never yet came across anything that uttered certain thoughts of mine so adequately and it's only a translation read it and we'll talk it over there is something in it very like the passage of emerson you read me last night in fact identical with it in thought surely this omar was a great poet anyhow he has given me an immense revelation this morning hoping that you are better j h t twichell's only a translation has acquired a certain humor with time end of chapter one hundred and fifteen hartford and billiards read by john greenman this is section twelve of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter one hundred and sixteen off for germany the german language became one of the interests of the clemens home during the early months of eighteen seventy eight the clemenses had long looked forward to a sojourn in europe and the demand for another mark twain book of travel furnished an added reason for their going they planned for the spring sailing and to spend a year or more on the continent making their headquarters in germany so they entered into the study of the language with an enthusiasm and perseverance that ensured progress there was a german nurse for the children 
and the whole atmosphere of the household presently became lingually teutonic it amused mark twain as everything amused him but he was a good student he acquired a working knowledge of the language in an extraordinarily brief time just as in an earlier day he had picked up piloting he would never become a german scholar but his vocabulary and use of picturesque phrases particularly those that combined english and german words were often really startling not only for their humor but for their expressiveness necessarily the new study would infect his literature he conceived a plan for making captain wakeman stormfield come across a copy of ollendorf in heaven and proceed to learn the language of a near-lying district they arranged to sail early in april and as on their former trip persuaded miss clara spaulding of elmira to accompany them they wrote to the houses breaking the news of the journey urging them to come to hartford for a good-bye visit howells and his wife came the twichells warners and other hartford friends paid repeated farewell calls the furniture was packed the rooms desolated the beautiful home made ready for closing they were to have pleasant company on the ship bayard taylor then recently appointed minister to germany wrote that he had planned to sail on the same vessel murat halstead's wife and daughter were listed among the passengers clemens made a brief speech at taylor's farewell dinner the mark twain party consisting of mr and mrs clemens miss spaulding little susie and clara bay and a nursemaid rosa sailed on the holsatia april eleventh eighteen seventy eight bayard taylor and the halstead ladies also sailed as per program likewise murat halstead himself for whom no program had been made there was a storm outside and the holsatia anchored down the bay to wait until the worst was over as the weather began to moderate halstead and others came down in a tug for a final word of good-bye when the tug left halstead somehow managed to get overlooked and was presently on his way across the ocean with only such wardrobe as he had on and what bayard taylor a large man like himself was willing to lend him halstead was accused of having intentionally allowed himself to be left behind and his case did have a suspicious look but in any event they were glad to have him along in a written word of good-bye to howells clemens remembered a debt of gratitude and paid it in full measure that was his habit and that reminds me ungrateful dog that i am that i owe as much to your training as the rude country job printer owes to the city boss who takes him in hand and teaches him the right way to handle his art i was talking to mrs clemens about this the other day and grieving because i never mentioned it to you thereby seeming to ignore it or to be unaware of it nothing that has passed under your eye needs any revision before going into a volume while all my other stuff does need so much in that ancient day before the wireless telegraph the voyager when the land fell away behind him felt a mighty sense of relief and rest which to some extent has gone now forever he cannot entirely escape the world in this new day but then he had a complete sense of dismissal from all encumbering cares of life among the first notebook entries mark twain wrote to go abroad has something of the same sense that death brings i am no longer of ye what ye say of me is now of no consequence but of how much consequence when i am with ye and of ye i know you will refrain from saying harsh things because they cannot hurt me since i am out of reach and cannot hear them this is why we say no harsh things of the dead it was a rough voyage outside but the company made it pleasant within halstead and taylor were good smoking-room companions 
Taylor had a large capacity for languages and a memory that was always a marvel. He would repeat for them Arabian, Hungarian, and Russian poetry, and show them the music and construction of it. He sang German folklore songs for them, and the Lorelei, then comparatively unknown in America. Such was his knowledge of the language that even educated Germans on board submitted questions of construction to him and accepted his decisions. He was wisely chosen for the mission he had to fill, but unfortunately he did not fill it long. Both Halstead and Taylor were said to have heart trouble. Halstead, however, survived many years. Taylor died December 19, 1878. End of chapter 114. Off for Germany. Read by John Greenman. This is section 13 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 117, Germany and German. From the notebook, It is a marvel that never loses its surprise by repetition, this aiming a ship at a mark three thousand miles away and hitting the bull's-eye in a fog as we did when the fog fell on us the captain said we ought to be at such and such a spot it had been eighteen hours since an observation was had with the silly islands bearing so and so and about so many miles away hove the lead and got forty-eight fathoms looked on the chart and sure enough this depth of water showed that we were right where the captain said we were another idea for ages man probably did not know why god carpeted the ocean bottom with sand in one place shells in another and so on but we see now the kind of bottom the lead brings up shows where a ship is when the soundings don't and also it confirms the soundings they reached hamburg after two weeks stormy sailing they rested a few days there then went to hanover and frankfurt arriving at heidelberg early in may they had no lodgings selected in Heidelberg, and leaving the others at an inn, Clemens set out immediately to find apartments. Chance, or direction, or both, led him to the beautiful Schloss Hotel, on a hill overlooking the city, and as fair a view as one may find in all Germany. He did not go back after his party. He sent a message telling them to take carriage and drive at once to the Schloss then he sat down to enjoy the view. Coming up the hill, they saw him standing on the veranda, waving his hat in welcome. He led them to their rooms, spacious apartments, and pointed to the view. They were looking down on beautiful Heidelberg Castle, densely wooded hills, the far-flowing Neckar, and the haze-empurpled valley of the Rhine. By and by, pointing to a small cottage on the hilltop, he said, "'I have been picking out my little house to work in there it is over there the one with the gable in the roof mine is the middle room on the third floor mrs clemens thought the occupants of the house might be surprised if he should suddenly knock and tell them he had come to take possession of his room nevertheless they often looked over in that direction and referred to it as his office. They amused themselves by watching his people and trying to make out what they were like. One day he went over there, and sure enough there was a sign out, Moblierte Wohnung zu Vermieden. A day or two later he was established in the very room he had selected, it being the only room but one vacant. In A Tramp Abroad, Mark Twain tells of the beauty of their Heidelberg environment. To Howells he wrote, Our bedroom has two great 
glass bird cages enclosed balconies one looking toward the rhine valley and sunset the other looking up the neckar cul-de-sac and naturally we spend nearly all our time in these we have tables and chairs in them we do our reading writing studying smoking and suppering in them it must have been a noble genius who devised this hotel lord how blessed is the repose the tranquillity of this place only two sounds the happy clamor of the birds in the groves and the muffled music of the neckar tumbling over the opposing dikes it is no hardship to lie awake a while nights for this subdued roar has exactly the sound of a steady rain beating upon a roof it is so healing to the spirit and it bears up the thread of one's imaginings as the accompaniment bears up a song i have waited for a call to go to work i knew it would come well it began to come a week ago my notebook comes out more and more frequently every day since three days ago i concluded to move my manuscripts over to my den now the call is loud and decided at last so tomorrow i shall begin regular steady work and stick to it till the middle of july or august first when i look for twitchell we will then walk about germany two or three weeks and then i'll go to work again perhaps in munich the walking tour with twichell had been contemplated in the scheme for gathering book material but the plan for it had not been completed when he left hartford now he was anxious that they should start as soon as possible twichell receiving the news in hartford wrote that it was a great day for him that his third son had been happily born early that morning and now the arrival of this glorious gift of a tramp through germany and switzerland completed his blessings i am almost too joyful for pleasure he wrote i labor with my felicities how i shall get to sleep to-night i don't know though i have had a good start in not having slept much last night oh my do you realize mark what a symposium it is to be i do to begin with i am thoroughly tired and the rest will be worth everything to walk with you and talk with you for weeks together why it's my dream of luxury harmony who at sunrise this morning deemed herself the happiest woman on the continent when i read your letter to her widened her smile perceptibly and revived another degree of strength in a minute she refused to consider her being left alone but only the great chance opened to me shoes mark remember that ever so much of our pleasure depends upon your shoes don't fail to have adequate preparation made in that department meantime the struggle with the awful german language went on it was a general hand-to-hand -hand contest from the head of the household down to little clara not one was exempt to clemens it became a sort of nightmare once in his notebook he says dreamed all bad foreigners went to german heaven couldn't talk and wished they had gone to the other place and a little farther along i wish i could hear myself talk german to mrs crane in elmira he reported their troubles clara spaulding is working herself to death with her german never loses an instant while she is awake or asleep either for that matter dreams of enormous serpents who poke their heads up under her arms and glare upon her with red-hot eyes and inquire about the genitive case and the declensions of the definite article 
Livy is bully-ragging herself about as hard, pesters over her grammar and her reader and her dictionary all day. Then, in the evening, these two students stretch themselves out on sofas and sigh and say, Oh, there's no use. We never can learn it in the world. Then Livy takes a sentence to go to bed on, goes gaping and stretching to her pillow, murmuring, Ich bin Ihnen sehr verbunden, Ich bin Ihnen sehr verbunden, Ich bin Ihnen sehr verbunden. I wonder if I can get that packed away so it will stay till morning and about an hour after midnight she wakes me up and says, I do so hate to disturb you, but is it ich ben Johnson ser befinden? And Mrs. Clemens wrote, Oh, Sue, dear, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many shall seek to enter it and shall not be able. I am not striving these days. I am just interested in German. Rosa the maid was required to speak to the children only in German, though Bay at first would have none of it. The nurse and governess tried to blandish her in vain. She maintained a calm and persistent attitude of scorn. Little Susie tried and really made progress, but one day she said pathetically, "'Mama, I wish Rosa was made in English.' Yet a little later Susie herself wrote her Aunt Sue, I know a lot of German. Everybody says I know a lot. I give you a million dollars to see you, and you would give two hundred dollars to see the lovely woods that we see. Even Howells in far-off America caught the infection and began a letter in German, though he hastened to add, Or do you prefer English by this time? Really, I could imagine the German going hard with you, for you always seem to me a man who liked to be understood with the least possible personal inconvenience. Clemens declared more than once that he scorned the outrageous and impossible German grammar, and abandoned it altogether. In his notebook he records how two Germans, strangers in Heidelberg, asked him a direction, and that when he gave it, in the most elaborate and correct German he could muster, one of them only lifted his eyes and murmured, Gott in Himmel. He was daily impressed with the lingual attainments of foreigners and his own lack of them. In the notes he comments, Am addressed in German, and when I can't speak it immediately, the person tackles me in French and plainly shows astonishment when I stop him. They naturally despise such an ignoramus. Our doctor here speaks as pure English as I. On the 4th of July he addressed the American students in Heidelberg in one of those mixtures of tongues for which he had a peculiar gift. The room he had rented for a study was let by a typical German family, and he was a great delight to them. He practiced his German on them and interested himself in their daily affairs. Howells wrote insistently for some assurance of contributions to the Atlantic. "'I must begin printing your private letters to satisfy the popular demand,' he said. "'People are constantly asking when you are going to begin.' Clemens replied that he would be only too glad to write for the Atlantic if his contributions could be copyrighted in Canada, where pirates were persistently enterprising. I do not know that I have any printable stuff just now, separable stuff, that is, but I shall have by and by. It is very gratifying to hear that it is wanted by anybody. I stand always prepared to hear the reverse, and am constantly surprised that it is delayed so long. Consequently, it is not going to astonish me when it comes. The Clemens party enjoyed Heidelberg, though in different ways. 
the children romped and picnicked in the castle grounds which adjoined the hotel mrs clemens and miss spaulding were devoted to bric-a-brac hunting picture galleries and music clemens took long walks or made excursions by rail and diligence to farther points art and opera did not appeal to him the notebook says i have attended operas whenever i could not help it for fourteen years now i am sure i know of no agony comparable to the listening to an unfamiliar opera i am enchanted with the airs of trovatore and other old operas which the hand organ and the music box have made entirely familiar to my ear i am carried away with delighted enthusiasm when they are sung at the opera but oh how far between they are and what long arid heart-breaking and headaching between times of that sort of intense but incoherent noise which always so reminds me of the time the orphan asylum burned down sunday night the eleventh huge crowd out tonight to hear the band play the fremersberg i suppose it is very low-grade music i know it must be low-grade music because it so delighted me it so warmed me moved me stirred me uplifted me enraptured me that at times i could have cried and at others split my throat with shouting the great crowd was another evidence that it was low-grade music for only the few are educated up to a point where high-class music gives pleasure i have never heard enough classic music to be able to enjoy it and the simple truth is i detest it not mildly but with all my heart what a poor lot we human beings are anyway if bass music gives me wings why should i want any other but i do i want to like the higher music because the higher and better like it but you see i want to like it without taking the necessary trouble and giving the thing the necessary amount of time and attention the natural suggestion is to get into that upper tier that dress circle by a lie we will pretend we like it this lie this pretense gives to opera what support it has in america and then there is painting what a red rag is to a bull turner's slave ship is to me mr ruskin is educated in art up to a point where that picture throws him into as mad an ecstasy of pleasure as it throws me into one of rage his cultivation enables him to see water in that yellow mud his cultivation reconciles the floating of unfloatable things to him chains etc it reconciles him to fishes swimming on top of the water the most of the picture is a manifest impossibility that is to say a lie and only rigid cultivation can enable a man to find truth in a lie a boston critic said the slave ship reminded him of a cat having a fit in a platter of tomatoes that went home to my non-cultivation and i thought here is a man with an unobstructed eye mark twain has dwelt somewhat upon these matters in a tramp abroad he confesses in that book that later he became a great admirer of turner 
though perhaps never of the slave-ship picture. In fact, Mark Twain was never artistic, in the common acceptance of that term. Neither his art nor his tastes were of an artistic kind. End of chapter 117 Germany and German Read by John Greenman This is section 14 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 118, Tramping with Twitchell. Clemens met him at Baden-Baden, and they immediately set out on a tramp through the Black Forest, excursioning as pleased them, and having an idyllic good time. They did not always walk, but they often did. At least, they did sometimes, when the weather was just right and Clemens' rheumatism did not trouble him. But they were likely to take a carriage, or a donkey cart, or a train, or any convenient thing that happened along. They did not hurry, but idled and talked and gathered flowers, or gossiped with wayside natives and tourists, though always preferring to wander along together beguiling the way with discussion and speculation and entertaining tales. They crossed on into Switzerland in due time, and considered the conquest of the Alps. The family followed by rail, or diligence, and greeted them here and there when they rested from their wanderings. Mark Twain found an immunity from attention in Switzerland, which for years he had not known elsewhere. His face was not so well known and his pen-name was carefully concealed. It was a large relief to be no longer an object of public curiosity, but Twitchell, as in the Bermuda trip, did not feel quite honest, perhaps, in altogether preserving the mask of unrecognition. In one of his letters home he tells how, when a young man at their table was especially delighted with Mark Twain's conversation, he could not resist taking the young man aside and divulging to him the speaker's identity. I could not forbear telling him who Mark was, he says, and the mingled surprise and pleasure his face exhibited made me glad I had done so. They claimed the Rigi, after which Clemens was not in good walking trim for some time. So Twitchell went on a trip on his own account to give his comrade a chance to rest. Then away again to Interlaken, where the Jungfrau rises, cold and white, on over the loneliness of Gemi Pass, with glaciers for neighbors and the unfading white peaks against the blue, to Visp and to Zermatt, where the Matterhorn points like a finger that directs mankind to God. This was true alpine wandering, sweet vagabondage. The association of the wanderers was a very intimate one, their minds were closely attuned, and there were numerous instances of thought echo mind answering to mind, without the employment of words. Clemens records in his notes, Sunday a.m., August 11th. Been reading Romola yesterday afternoon, last night, and this morning. At last I came upon the only passage which has thus far hit me with force, Tito compromising with his conscience and resolving to do not a bad thing, but not the best thing. Joe entered the room five minutes, uh, no, uh, three minutes later, and without prelude said, I read that book you've got there six years ago, and got a mighty good text for a sermon out of it, the passage where the young fellow compromises with his conscience, and resolves to do not a bad thing, but not the best thing. This is Joe's first reference to this book since he saw me buy it twenty-four hours ago, so my mind operated on his in this instance. He said he was sitting yonder in the reading-room, three minutes ago, I have not got up yet, thinking of nothing in particular, and didn't know 
what brought Romola into his head. But into his head it came, and that particular passage. Now I, forty feet away, in another room, was reading that particular passage at that particular moment couldn't suggest Romola to him earlier, because nothing in the book had taken hold of me till I came to that one passage on page 112, Tauschnitz edition. And again, the instances of mind telegraphing are simply innumerable. This evening Joe and I sat long at the edge of the village looking at the Matterhorn. Then Joe said, We ought to go to the Servin Hotel and inquire for Livy's telegram. If he had been but one instant later, I should have said those words instead of him. Such entries are frequent, and one day there came along a kind of object lesson, they were toiling up a mountainside when Twitchell began telling a very interesting story which had happened in connection with a friend still living, though Twitchell had no knowledge of his whereabouts at the time. The story finished just as they rounded a turn in the cliff, and Twitchell, looking up, ended his last sentence, "'And there's the man!' which was true, for they were face to face with the very man of whom he had been telling." another subject that entered into their discussion was the law of accidents clemens held that there was no such thing as an accident that it was all forewritten in the day of the beginning that every event however slight was embryonic in that first instant of created life and immutably timed to its appearance in the web of destiny once on their travels when they were on a high bank above a brawling stream a little girl who started to run toward them slipped and rolled under the bottom rail of the protecting fence her feet momentarily hanging out over the precipice and the tearing torrent below it seemed a miraculous escape from death and furnished an illustration for their discussion the condition of the ground the force of her fall the nearness of the fatal edge all these had grown inevitably out of the first great projection of thought and the child's fall and its escape had been invested in life's primal atom. The author of A Tramp Abroad tells us of the rushing stream that flows out of the Arcadian sky valley, the Gasternthal, and goes plunging down to Kandersteg, and how he took exercise by making Harris, Twitchell, set stranded logs adrift while he lounged comfortably on a boulder and watched them go tearing by also how he made Harris run a race with one of those logs. But that is literature. Twitchell, in a letter home, has preserved a likelier and lovelier story. Mark is a queer fellow. There is nothing that he so delights in as a swift, strong stream. You can hardly get him to leave one when once he is within the influence of its fascinations. To throw in stones and sticks seems to afford him rapture. Tonight, as we were on our way back to the hotel, seeing a lot of driftwood caught by the torrent side below the path, I climbed down and threw it in. When I got back to the path, Mark was running downstream after it as hard as he could go, throwing up his hands and shouting in the wildest ecstasy. And when a piece went over a fall and emerged to view in the foam below, he would jump up and down and yell. He said afterward that he hadn't been so excited in three months. He acted just like a boy. Another feature of his extreme sensitiveness in certain directions. Then generalizing, Twitchell adds, He has coarse spots in him, but I never knew a person so finely regardful of the feelings of others in some ways. He hates to pass another person walking, and will practice some subterfuge to take off what he feels is the discourtesy of it, and he is exceedingly timid, tremblingly timid, about approaching strangers, hates to ask a question. His sensitive regard for others extends to animals. When we are driving, his concern is all about the horse. 
he can't bear to see the whip used or to see a horse pull hard Today, when the driver clucked up his horse and quickened his pace a little mark said the fellows got the notion that we are in a hurry he is exceedingly considerate toward me in regard of everything or uh, most things the days were not all sunshine sometimes it rained and they took shelter by the wayside or if there was no shelter they plodded along under their umbrellas still talking away and if something occurred that clemens wanted to put down they would stand stock still in the rain and twichell would hold the umbrella while clemens wrote a good while sometimes oblivious to storm and discomfort and the long way yet ahead after the day on gemi pass twichell wrote home mark today was immensely absorbed in the flowers he scrambled around and gathered a great variety and manifested the intensest pleasure in them he crowded a pocket of his notebook with his specimens and wanted more room so i stopped the guide and got out my needle and thread and out of a stiff paper a hotel advertisement i had about me made a paper bag a cornucopia like and tied it to his vest in front and it answered the purpose admirably he filled it full with a beautiful collection and as soon as we got here tonight he transferred it to a cardboard box and sent it by mail to livy a strange mark he is full of contradictions i spoke last night of his sensitive to others feelings today the guide got behind and came up as if he would like to go by yet hesitated to do so mark paused went aside and busied himself a minute picking a flower in the halt the guide got by and resumed his place in front mark threw the flower away saying i didn't want that i only wanted to give the old man a chance to go on without seeming to pass us mark is splendid to walk with amid such grand scenery for he talks so well about it has such a power of strong picturesque expression i wish you might have heard him today his vigorous speech nearly did justice to the things we saw in an address which twichell gave many years later he recalls another pretty incident of their travels they had been toiling up the gorner grat as we paused for a rest a lamb from a flock of sheep near by ventured inquisitively toward us whereupon mark seated himself on a rock and with becoming hand and soft words tried to get it to come to him on the lamb's part it was a struggle between curiosity and timidity but in a succession of advances and retreats it gained confidence though at a very gradual rate it was a scene for a painter the great american humorist on one side of the game and that silly little creature on the other with the matterhorn for a background mark was reminded that the time he was consuming was valuable but to no purpose the gorner grat could wait he held on with undiscouraged perseverance till he carried his point the lamb finally put its nose in his hand and he was happy over it all the rest of the day the matter of religion came up now and again in the drift of their discussions it was twichell's habit to have prayers in their room every night at the hotels and clemens was willing to join in the observances once twichell finding him in a responsive mood a remorseful mood gave his sympathy and spoke of the larger sympathy of divinity clemens listened and seemed soothed and impressed but his philosophies were too wide and too deep for creeds and doctrines a day or two later as they were tramping along in the hot sun his honesty had to speak out joe he said i'm going to make a confession i don't believe in your religion at all i've been living a lie right straight along whenever i pretended to for a moment sometimes i have been almost a believer but it immediately drifts away from me again i don't believe 
one word of your Bible was inspired by God any more than any other book. I believe it is entirely the work of man, from beginning to end, atonement and all. The problem of life and death and eternity and the true conception of God is a bigger thing than is contained in that book. So the personal side of religious discussion closed between them and was never afterward reopened. They joined Mrs. Clemens and the others at Lausanne at last, and their Swiss holiday was over. Twitchell set out for home by way of England, and Clemens gave himself up to reflection and rest after his wanderings. Then, as the days of their companionship passed in review, quickly and characteristically he sent a letter after his comrade. Dear old Joe, it is actually all over. I was so low-spirited at the station yesterday, and this morning when I woke, I couldn't seem to accept the dismal truth that you were really gone, and the pleasant tramping and talking at an end. Ah, my boy, it has been such a rich holiday to me, and I feel under such deep and honest obligations to you for coming. I am putting out of my mind all memory of the times when I misbehaved toward you and hurt you. I am resolved to consider it forgiven, and to store up and remember only the charming hours of the journeys and the times when I was not unworthy to be with you and share a companionship which to me stands first after Livy's. It is justifiable to do this, for why should I let my small infirmities of disposition live and grovel among my mental pictures of the eternal sublimities of the Alps? Livy can't accept or endure the fact that you are gone, but you are, and we cannot get around it. So take our love with you, and bear it also over the sea to harmony, and God bless you both. Mark. End of chapter 118. Tramping with Twitchell. Read by John Greenman. This is section 15 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 119, Italian Days. The Clemens party wandered down into Italy, to the lakes, Venice, Florence, Rome, loitering through the galleries, gathering here and there beautiful furnishings, pictures, marbles, and the like, for the Hartford home. In Venice they bought an old careen bed, a massive regal affair with serpentine columns surmounted by singularly graceful cupids, and with other cupids sporting on the headboard, the work of some artist who had been dust three centuries, maybe, for this bed had come out of an old Venetian palace, dismantled and abandoned. It was a furniture with a long story, and the years would add mightily to its memories. It would become a stately institution in the Clemens household. The cupids on the posts were removable, and one of the highest privileges of childhood would be to occupy that bed and have down one of the cupids to play with. It was necessary to be ill to acquire that privilege not violently and dangerously ill, but interestingly so, ill enough to be propped up with pillows and have one's meals served on a tray, with dolls and picture-books handy, and among them a beautiful rosewood cupid who had kept dimpled and dainty for so many, many years. They spent three weeks in Venice, a dreamlike experience, especially for the children who were on the water most of the time, 
and became fast friends with their gondolier, who taught them some Italian words, then a week in Florence and a fortnight in Rome. From the notebook, Bay. When the waiter brought my breakfast this morning I spoke to him in Italian. Mama. What did you say? Bay. I said, Polly vous Francais? M. What does it mean? B. I don't know. What does it mean, Susie? S. It means Polly wants a cracker. Clemens discovered that in twelve years his attitude had changed somewhat concerning the old masters. He no longer found the bright new copies an improvement on the originals, though the originals still failed to wake his enthusiasm. Mrs. Clemens and Miss Spaulding spent long hours wandering down avenues of art, accompanied by him on occasion, though not always willingly. He wrote his sorrow to Twitchell. I do wish you were in Rome to do my sightseeing for me. Rome interests me as much as East Hartford could, and no more. That is, the Rome which the average tourist feels an interest in. There are other things here which stir me enough to make life worth living. Livy and Clara are having a royal time worshipping the old masters, and I as good a time gritting my ineffectual teeth over them. Once when Sarah Orney Jewett was with the party, he remarked that if the old masters had labeled their fruit, one wouldn't be so likely to mistake pears for turnips. Youth, said Mrs. Clemens gravely, if you do not care for these masterpieces yourself, you might at least consider the feelings of others. And Miss Jewett, regarding him severely, added in her quaint Yankee fashion, Now you've been spoken to. He felt duly reprimanded, but his taste did not materially reform. He realized that he was no longer in a proper frame of mind to write of general sightseeing. One must be eager, verdant, to write happily the story of travel. Replying to a letter from Howells on the subject, he said, I wish I could give those sharp satires on European life which you mention, but of course a man can't write successful satire except he be in a calm, judicial good humor, whereas I hate travel, and I hate hotels, and I hate the opera and I hate the old masters. In truth, I don't ever seem to be in a good enough humor with anything to satirize it. No, I want to stand up before it and curse it and foam at the mouth, or take a club and pound it to rags and pulp. I have got in two or three chapters about Wagner's operas, and managed to do it without showing temper, but the strain of another such effort would burst me. Clemens became his own courier for a time in Italy, and would seem to have made more of a success of it than he did a good many years afterward, if we may believe the story he has left us of his later attempt. "'Am a shining success as a courier,' he records, by the use of franks, have learned how to handle the railway guide intelligently and with confidence. He declares that he will have no more couriers, but possibly he could have employed one to advantage on the trip out of Italy, for it was a desperately hard one, with bad connections and delayed telegrams, when after thirty-six hours weary, continuous traveling, they arrived at last in Munich in a drizzle and fog, and were domiciled in their winter quarters at No. 1A Karlstrasse, they felt that they had reached the home of desolation itself, the very throne of human misery. And the rooms were so small, the conveniences so meager, and the porcelain stove was grim, ghastly, dismal intolerable. 
so livy and clara spaulding sat down forlorn and cried and i retired to a private place to pray by and by we all retired to our narrow german beds and when livy and i had finished talking across the room it was all decided that we should rest twenty-four hours then pay whatever damages were required and straightway fly to the south of france the rooms had been engaged by letter months before of their proprietress fraulein dahlweiner who had met them at the door with a lantern in her hand full of joy in their arrival and faith in her ability to make them happy it was a faith that was justified next morning when they all woke rested the weather had cleared there were bright fires in the rooms the world had taken on a new aspect fraulein dahlweiner the pathetic hard-working little figure became almost beautiful in their eyes in her efforts for their comfort she arranged larger rooms and better conveniences for them their location was central and there was a nearby park they had no wish to change clemens in his letter to howells boasts that he brought the party through from rome himself and that they never had so little trouble before but in looking over this letter thirty years later he commented probably a lie he secured a room some distance away for his work but then could not find his swiss notebook he wrote twichell that he had lost it and that after all he might not be obliged to write a volume of travels but the notebook turned up and the work on the new book proceeded for a time it went badly he wrote many chapters only to throw them aside he had the feeling that he had somehow lost the knack of descriptive narrative he had become as it seemed too didactic he thought his description was inclined to be too literal his humor manufactured these impressions passed by and by interest developed and with it enthusiasm and confidence in a letter to twichell he reported his progress i was about to write to my publisher and propose some other book when the confounded thing the notebook turned up and down went my heart into my boots but there was now no excuse so i went solidly to work tore up a great part of the manuscript written in heidelberg wrote and tore up continued to write and tear up and at last reward of patient and noble persistence my pen got the old swing again since then i'm glad that providence knew better what to do with the swiss notebook than i did further along in the same letter there breaks forth a true heart answer to that voice of the alps which once heard is never wholly silent o oh, switzerland the further it recedes into the enriching haze of time the more intolerably delicious the charm of it and the cheer of it and the glory and majesty and solemnity and pathos of it grow those mountains had a soul they thought they spoke and what a voice it was and how real deep down in my memory it is sounding yet alp calleth unto alp that stately old scriptural wording is the right one for god's alps and god's ocean how puny we were in that awful presence and how painless it was to be so how fitting and right it seemed and how stingless was the sense of our unspeakable insignificance and lord how pervading were the repose and peace and blessedness that poured out of the heart of the invisible great spirit of the mountains now what is it there are mountains and mountains and mountains in this world but only these take you by the heart-strings i wonder what the secret of it is well time and time and again it has seemed to me that 
I must drop everything and flee to Switzerland once more. It is a longing, a deep, strong, tugging longing. That is the word. We must go again, Joe. End of chapter 119, Italian Days, read by John Greenman. This is section 16 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 120, In Munich. That winter in Munich was not recalled as an unpleasant one in after years. His work went well enough, always a chief source of gratification. Mrs. Clemens and Miss Spaulding found interest in the galleries, in quaint shops, in the music and picturesque life of that beautiful old Bavarian town. The children also liked Munich. It was easy for them to adopt any new environment or custom. The German Christmas, with its lavish tree and toys and cakes, was an especial delight. The German language they seemed fairly to absorb. Writing to his mother, Clemens said, I cannot see but that the children speak German as well as they do English. Susie often translates Livy's orders to the servants. I cannot work and study German at the same time, so I have dropped the latter and do not even read the language, except in the morning paper to get the news. In Munich, as was the case wherever they were known, there were many callers. Most Americans and many foreigners felt it proper to call on Mark Twain. It was complimentary, but it was wearying sometimes. Mrs. Clemens, in a letter written from Venice, where they had received even more than usual attention, declared there were moments when she almost wished she might never see a visitor again. Originally there was a good deal about Munich in the new book and some of the discarded chapters might have been retained with advantage. They were ruled out in the final weeding as being too serious, along with the French chapters. Only a few Italian memories were left to follow the Switzerland wanderings. The book does record one Munich event, though transferring it to Heilsbrunn. It is the incident of the finding of the lost sock in the vast bedroom. It may interest the reader to compare what really happened, as set down in a letter to Twitchell, with a story as written for publication. Last night I awoke at three this morning, and after raging to myself for two interminable hours, I gave it up. I rose, assumed a cat-like stealthiness to keep from waking Livy, and proceeded to dress in the pitch dark. Slowly but surely I got on garment after garment, all down to one sock. I had one slipper on and the other in my hand. Well, on my hands and knees I crept softly around, pawing and feeling and scooping along the carpet and among chair legs for that missing sock. I kept that up and still kept it up and kept it up. At first I only said to myself, blame that sock, but that soon ceased to answer. My expletives grew steadily stronger and stronger and at last, when I found I was lost, I had to sit flat down on the floor and take hold of something to keep from lifting the roof off with the profane explosion that was trying to get out of me. I could see the dim blur of the window, but of course it was in the wrong place and could give me no information as to where I was. But I had one comfort. I had not waked Livy. I believed I could find that sock in silence if the night lasted long enough. 
so I started again, and softly pawed all over the place, and sure enough, at the end of half an hour I laid my hand on the missing article. I rose joyfully up and butted the wash bowl and pitcher off the stand, and simply raised, so to speak. Livy screamed, then said, Who is it? What is the matter? I said, There ain't anything the matter. I'm hunting for my sock. She said, Are you hunting for it with a club? I went in the parlor and lit the lamp, and gradually the fury subsided, and the ridiculous features of the thing began to suggest themselves. So I lay on the sofa with notebook and pencil, and transferred the adventure to our big room in the hotel at Heilsbrunn, and got it on paper a good deal to my satisfaction. He wrote with frequency to Howells, and sent him something for the magazine now and then, the Gambetta Duel burlesque, which would make a chapter in the book later, and the story of The Great Revolution in Pitcairn, included in the stolen white elephant volume. The Pitcairn and Elephant Tales were originally chapters in A Tramp Abroad, also the unpleasant coffin-box yarn, which Howells rejected for the Atlantic and generally condemned, though for a time it remained a favorite with its author. Howells' novel, The Lady of the Aroostook, was then running through the Atlantic, and in one of his letters Clemens expresses the general deep satisfaction of his household in that tale. If your literature has not struck perfection now, we are not able to see what is lacking. It is all such truth, truth to the life. Everywhere your pen falls, it leaves a photograph. Possibly you will not be a fully accepted classic until you have been dead one hundred years. It is the fate of the Shakespeare's of all genuine professions. But then your books will be as common as Bibles, I believe. In that day I shall be in the encyclopedias too. Thus, Mark Twain, history and occupation unknown, but he was personally acquainted with Howells. Though in humorous form, this was a sincere tribute. Clemens always regarded with awe William Dean Howells' ability to dissect and photograph with such delicacy the minutia of human nature, just as Howells always stood in awe of Mark Twain's ability to light, with a single flashing sentence, the whole human horizon. End of chapter 120 In Munich Read by John Greenman This is section 17 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 121, Paris, England, and Homeward Bound. They decided to spend their spring months in Paris, so they gave up their pleasant quarters with Fraulein Dahlweiner and journeyed across Europe, arriving at the French capital February 28, 1879. Here they met another discouraging prospect, for the weather was cold and damp. The cabmen seemed brutally ill-mannered. Their first hotel was chilly, dingy, uninviting. Clemens, in his notebook, set down his impressions of their rooms. A paragraph will serve. Ten squatty, ugly armchairs, upholstered in the ugliest and coarsest conceivable scarlet plush. Two hideous sofas of the same uncounted armless chairs ditto. Five ornamental chairs, seats covered with a coarse rag, embroidered in 
flat expanse with a confusion of leaves such as no tree ever bore six or seven a dirty white and the rest a faded red how those hideous chairs do swear at the hideous sofa near them this is the very hatefulest room i have seen in europe oh how cold and raw and unwarmable it is it was better than that when the sun came out and they found happier quarters presently at the hotel normandy rue de l'echelle but alas the sun did not come out often enough it was one of those french springs and summers when it rains nearly every day and is distressingly foggy and chill between times clemens received a bad impression of france and the french during that parisian sojourn from which he never entirely recovered in his notebook he wrote france has neither winter nor summer nor morals apart from these drawbacks it is a fine country the weather may not have been entirely accountable for his prejudice but from whatever cause mark twain to the day of his death had no great love for the french as a nation conversely the french as a nation did not care greatly for mark twain there were many individual frenchmen that mark twain admired as there were many frenchmen who admired the work and personality of mark twain but on neither side was there the warm fond general affection which elsewhere throughout europe he invited and returned his book was not yet finished in paris he worked on it daily but without enthusiasm the city was too noisy the weather too dismal his notebook says may seventh i wish this terrible winter would come to an end have had rain almost without interruption for two months and one week may twenty eighth this is one of the coldest days of this most damnable and interminable winter it was not all gloom and discomfort there was congenial company in paris and dinner parties and a world of callers aldridge the scintillating of aldridge clemens used to say when aldridge speaks it seems to me he is the bright face of the moon and i feel like the other side aldridge unlike clemens was not given to swearing the parisian notebook has this memorandum aldridge gives his seat in the horse car to a crutched cripple and discovers that what he took for a crutch is only a length of walnut beading and the man not lame whereupon aldridge uses the only profanity that ever escaped his lips damn a damned man who would carry a damned piece of beading under his damned arm aldridge the scintillating was there also gedney bunce of hartford frank millet and his wife helmar hjorth boyson and his wife and a mr and mrs chamberlain artist people whom the clemenses had met pleasantly in italy turgenev as in london came to call also baron tauschnitz that nobly born philanthropist of german publishers who devoted his life often at his personal cost to making the literature of other nations familiar to his own tauschnitz had early published the innocents following it with other mark twain volumes as they appeared paying always of his own will and accord all that he could afford to pay for this privilege which was not really a privilege for the law did not require him to pay at all he traveled down to paris now to see the author and to pay his respects to him a mighty nice old gentleman clemens found him richard whiting was in paris that winter and there were always plenty of young american painters whom it was good to know they had what they called the stomach club a jolly organization whose purpose was indicated by its name mark twain occasionally attended its sessions 
and on one memorable evening, when Edwin A. Abbey was there, speeches were made which never appeared in any printed proceedings. Mark Twain's address that night has obtained a wide celebrity among the clubs of the world, though no line of it, or even its title, has ever found its way into published literature. Clemens had a better time in Paris than the rest of his party. He could go and come and mingle with the sociabilities when the abnormal weather kept the others housed in. He did a good deal of sightseeing of his own kind, and once went up in a captive balloon. They were all studying French, more or less, and they read histories and other books relating to France. Clemens renewed his old interest in Joan of Arc, and for the first time appears to have conceived the notion of writing the story of that lovely character. The Reign of Terror interested him. He reread Carlyle's Revolution, a book which he was never long without reading, and they all read A Tale of Two Cities. When the weather permitted, they visited the scenes of that grim period. In his notebook he comments, The Reign of Terror shows that without distinction or rank the people were savages marquises dukes lawyers blacksmiths they each figure in due proportion to their crafts and again for one thousand years this savage nation indulged itself in massacre every now and then a big massacre or a little one the spirit is peculiar to france i mean in christendom no other state has had it in this france has always walked abreast kept her end up with her brethren the turks and the burmese their chief traits love of glory and massacre Yet it was his sense of fairness that made him write as a sort of quittance. You perceive I generalize with intrepidity from single instances. It is the tourist's custom. When I see a man jump from the Vendome column, I say, they like to do that in Paris. Following this implied atonement, he records a few conclusions, drawn doubtless from Parisian reading and observation. Childish race and great. I'm for cremation. I disfavor capital punishment. Samson was a Jew, therefore not a fool. The Jews have the best average brain of any people in the world. The Jews are the only race in the world who work wholly with their brains, and never with their hands. There are no Jew beggars, no Jew tramps, no Jew ditchers, hod-carriers, day-laborers, or followers of toilsome mechanical trade. They are peculiarly and conspicuously the world's intellectual aristocracy. Communism is idiocy. They want to divide up the property. Suppose they did it. It requires brains to keep money as well as to make it. In a precious little while the money would be back in the former owner's hands and the communist would be poor again. The division would have to be remade every three years, or it would do the communist no good. A curious thing happened one day in Paris. Boyesen, in great excitement, came to the Normandy and was shown to the Clemens apartment. He was pale and could hardly speak for his emotion. He asked immediately if his wife had come to their rooms. On learning that she had not, he declared that she was lost or had met with an accident. She had been gone several hours, he said, and had sent no word, a thing which she had never done before. He besought Clemens to aid him in his search for her, to do something to help him find her. Clemens, without showing the least emotion or special concentration of interest, said quietly, I will. 
"'Where will you go first? Boyenson demanded. Still in the same even voice, Clemens said, "'To the elevator.' He passed out of the room, with Boyenson behind him, into the hall. The elevator was just coming up, and as they reached it, it stopped at their landing, and Mrs. Boyenson stepped out. She had been delayed by a breakdown and a blockade. Clemens said afterward that he had a positive conviction that she would be on the elevator when they reached it. It was one of those curious psychic evidences which we find all along during his life, or, if the skeptics prefer to call them coincidences, they are privileged to do so. Paris, June 1, 1879. Still this vindictive winter continues. Had a raw, cold rain today. Tonight we sit around a rousing wood fire. They stood it for another month, and then, on the 10th of July, when it was still chilly and disagreeable, they gave it up and left for Brussels, which he calls a dirty, beautiful, architecturally interesting town. Two days in Brussels, then to Antwerp, where they dined on the Trenton with Admiral Rhone, then to Rotterdam, Dresden, Amsterdam, and London, arriving there the 29th of July, which was rainy and cold, in keeping with all Europe that year. Had to keep a rousing big kennel coal fire blazing in the grate all day, a remarkable summer, truly. London meant a throng of dinners, as always, brilliant notable affairs, too far away to recall. A letter written by Mrs. Clemens at the time preserves one charming, fresh bit of that departed bloom. Clara, Spaulding, went in to dinner with Mr. Henry James. She enjoyed him very much. I had a little chat with him before dinner, and he was exceedingly pleasant and easy to talk with. I had expected just the reverse, thinking one would feel looked over by him and criticized. Mr. Whistler, the artist, was at the dinner, but he did not attract me. Then there was a lady, over eighty years old, a Mrs. Stewart, who was Washington Irving's love, and she is said to have been his only love, and because of her he went unmarried to his grave. Mrs. Clemens was misinformed. Irving's only love was a Miss Hoffman. She was also an intimate friend of Madame Bonaparte. You would judge Mrs. Stewart to be about fifty, and she was the life of the drawing-room after dinner, while the ladies were alone before the gentlemen came up. It was lovely to see such a sweet old age. Every one was so fond of her, every one deferred to her. Yet every one was joking her, making fun of her, but she was always equal to the occasion, giving back as bright replies as possible. You had not the least sense that she was aged. She quoted French in her stories with perfect ease and fluency, and had all the time such a kindly, lovely way. When she entered the room before dinner, Mr. James, who was then talking with me, shook hands with her and said, "'Good evening, you wonderful lady.' After she had passed, he said, "'She is the youngest person in London. She has the youngest feelings and the youngest interests. She is always interested.' It was a perfect delight to hear her and see her. For more than two years they had had an invitation from Reginald Chumley to pay him another visit. So they went for a week to Condover, where many friends were gathered, including Millet, the painter, and his wife, who had been the wife of Ruskin, numerous relatives, and other delightful company. It was one of the happiest chapters of their foreign sojourn. Moncure de Conway, who was in London at the time, recalls in his autobiography a visit which he made with Mr. and Mrs. Clemens to Stratford-on-Avon. Mrs. Clemens was an ardent Shakespearean, and Mark Twain determined to give her a surprise. He told her that we were going on a journey to Epworth, and persuaded me to connive with the joke by writing to Charles Flower not to meet us himself, but send his carriage. 
On arrival at the station we directed the driver to take us straight to the church. When we entered, and Mrs. Clemens read on Shakespeare's grave, Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear, she started back, exclaiming, Where am I? Mark received her reproaches with an affluence of guilt, but never did lady enjoy a visit more than that to Avon Bank. Mrs. Charles Flower, nee Martineau, took Mrs. Clemens to her heart, and contrived that every social or other attraction of that region should surround her. From the Notebook Sunday, August 17th, 79 raw and cold and a drenching rain went to hear mr spurgeon house three quarters full say three thousand people first hour lacking one minute taken up with two prayers two ugly hymns and scripture reading sermon three quarters of an hour long a fluent talker, good, sonorous voice, topic treated in the unpleasant old fashion. Man, a mighty bad child, God working at him in forty ways and having a world of trouble with him. A wooden faced congregation, just the sort to see no incongruity in the majesty of heaven stooping to plead and sentimentalize over such and see in their salvation an important matter tuesday august nineteenth went up windermere lake in the steamer talked with the great darwin they had planned to visit dr brown in scotland mrs clemens in particular longed to go for his health had not been of the best, and she felt that they would never have a chance to see him again. Clemens in after years blamed himself harshly for not making the trip, declaring that their whole reason for not going was an irritable reluctance on his part to take the troublesome journey, and a perversity of spirit for which there was no real excuse. There is documentary evidence against this harsh conclusion. They were, in fact, delayed here and there by misconnections, and the continued terrific weather, barely reaching Liverpool in time for their sailing date, August 23rd. Unquestionably he was weary of railway travel, for he always detested it. Time would magnify his remembered reluctance, until, in the end, he would load his conscience with the entire burden of blame. Their ship was the Gallia, and one night, when they were nearing the opposite side of the Atlantic, Mark Twain, standing on deck, saw for the third time in his experience a magnificent lunar rainbow, a complete arch, the colors part of the time very brilliant, but little different from a day rainbow. It is not given to many persons in the world to see even one of these phenomena. After each previous vision there had come to him a period of good fortune. Perhaps this also boded well for him. End of chapter 121 Paris England and Homeward Bound, read by John Greenman. This is section 18 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 122, An Interlude. The Gallia reached New York September 3, 1879. A report of his arrival in the New York Sun stated that Mark Twain had changed in his absence, that only his drawl seemed natural. His hat, as he stood on the deck of the incoming Cunarder, Gallia, was of the pattern that English officers wear in India, and his suit of clothes was such as a merchant might wear in his store. He looked older than when he went to Germany, and his hair has turned quite gray. It was a late hour when they were finally up to the dock, and Clemens, anxious to get through the customs house, urged the inspector to accept his carefully prepared list of dutiable articles without opening the baggage. But the official was dubious. 
Clemens argued eloquently, and a higher authority was consulted. Again Clemens stated his case and presented his arguments. A still higher chief of inspection was summoned, evidently from his bed. He listened sleepily to the preamble, then suddenly said, Oh, chalk this baggage, of course. Don't you know it's Mark Twain and that he'll talk all night? They went directly to the farm, for whose highlight sunlit loveliness they had been longing through all their days of absence. Mrs. Clemens in her letters had never failed to dwell on her hunger for that fair hilltop. From his accustomed study table Clemens wrote to Twitchell, You have run about a good deal, Joe, but you have never seen any place that was so divine as the farm. Why don't you come here and take a foretaste of heaven? Clemens declared he would roam no more forever and settle down to the happy farm routine. He took up his work, which had not gone well in Paris, and found his interest in it renewed. In the letter to Twitchell he said, I am revising my manuscript. I did not expect to like it, but I do. I have been knocking out early chapters for more than a year now, not because they had not merit, but merely because they hindered the flow of the narrative. It was a dredging process. Day before yesterday, my shovel fetched up three more chapters and laid them, reeking, on the festering shore-pile of their predecessors, and now I think the yarn swims right along, without hitch or halt. I believe it will be a readable book of travels. I cannot see that it lacks anything but information." Mrs. Clemens was no less weary of travel than her husband, yet she had enjoyed their roaming, and her gain from it had been greater than his. Her knowledge of art and literature, and of the personal geography of nations, had vastly increased. Her philosophy of life had grown beyond all counting. She had lost something, too. She had outstripped her traditions. One day, when she and her sister had walked across the fields and had stopped to rest in a little grove by a pretty pond, she confessed, timidly enough, and not without sorrow, how she had drifted away from her orthodox views. She had ceased to believe, she said, in the orthodox Bible God, who exercised a personal supervision over every human soul. The hordes of people she had seen in many lands, the philosophies she had listened to from her husband and those wise ones about him, the life away from the restricted round of home, all had contributed to this change. Her God had become a larger God, the greater mind which exerts its care of the individual through immutable laws of time and change and environment. The supreme good which comprehends the individual flower, dumb creature, or human being, only as a unit in the larger scheme of life and love. Her sister was not shocked or grieved. She too had grown with the years, and though perhaps less positively directed, had by a path of her own reached a wider prospect of conclusions. It was a sweet day there in the little grove by the water, and would linger in the memory of both so long as life lasted. Certainly it was the larger faith, though the movement must always come when the narrower, nearer, more humanly protecting arm of orthodoxy lends closer comfort. Long afterward, in the years that followed the sorrow of heavy bereavement, Clemens once said to his wife, Livy, if it comforts you to lean on the Christian faith, do so. And she answered, I can't, youth. I haven't any. And the thought that he had destroyed her illusion, without affording a compensating solace, was one that would come back to him now and then, all his days. End of chapter 122 An Interlude Read by John Greenman
This is section 19 of Mark Twain, a biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 123, The Grant Speech of 1879. If the lunar rainbow had any fortuitous significance, perhaps we may find it in the two speeches which Mark Twain made in November and December of that year. The first of these was delivered at Chicago, on the occasion of the reception of General Grant by the Army of the Tennessee, on the evening of November 13, 1879. Grant had just returned from his splendid tour of the world. His progress from San Francisco eastward had been such an ovation as is only accorded to sovereignty. Clemens received an invitation to the reunion, but, dreading the long railway journey, was at first moved to decline. He prepared a letter in which he made business his excuse, and expressed his regret that he would not be present to see and hear the veterans of the Army of the Tennessee at the moment when their old commander entered the room and rose in his place to speak. Besides, he said, I wanted to see the general again anyway, and renew the acquaintance. He would remember me, because I was the person who did not ask him for an office. He did not send the letter. Reconsidering, it seemed to him that there was something strikingly picturesque in the idea of a Confederate soldier who had been chased for a fortnight in the rain through Rawls and Monroe counties, Missouri, now being invited to come and give welcome home to his old imaginary pursuer. It was in the nature of an imperative command which he could not refuse to obey. He accepted and agreed to speak. They had asked him to respond to the toast of the ladies, but for him the subject was worn out. He had already responded to that toast at least twice. He telegraphed that there was one class of the community that had always been overlooked upon such occasions, and that if they would allow him to do so, he would take that class for a toast, the babies. Necessarily they agreed, and he prepared himself accordingly. He arrived in Chicago in time for the prodigious procession of welcome. Grant was to witness the march from a grand reviewing stand, which had been built out from the second story of the Palmer House. Clemens had not seen the general since the embarrassing introduction in Washington twelve years before. Their meeting was characteristic enough. Carter Harrison, mayor of Chicago, arriving with Grant, stepped over to Clemens and asked him if he wouldn't like to be presented. Grant also came forward, and a moment later Harrison was saying, "'General, let me present Mr. Clemens, a man almost as great as yourself.' They shook hands. There was a pause of a moment, then Grant said, looking at him gravely, "'Mr. Clemens, I am not embarrassed, are you?' So he remembered that first long-ago meeting. It was a conspicuous performance. The crowd could not hear the words, but they saw the greeting and the laugh, and cheered both men. Following the procession, there were certain imposing ceremonies of welcome at Haverley's Theatre, where long, laudatory eloquence was poured out upon the returning hero, who sat unmoved while the storm of music and cheers and oratory swept about him. Clemens, writing of it that evening to Mrs. Clemens, said, I never sat elbow to elbow with so many historic names before. Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Schofield, Pope, Logan, and so on. What an iron man Grant is. He sat facing the house with his right leg crossed over his left, his right boot sole tilted up at an angle, and his left hand and arm reposing on the arm of his chair. You note that position? Well, when glowing references were made to other grandees on the stage, those grandees always showed a trifle of nervous consciousness, and as these references came frequently, the nervous changes of position and attitude were also frequent. But Grant, 
he was under a tremendous and ceaseless bombardment of praise and congratulations but as true as i'm sitting here he never moved a muscle of his body for a single instant during thirty minutes you could have played him on a stranger for an effigy perhaps he never would have moved but at last a speaker made such a particularly ripping and blood-stirring remark about him that the audience rose and roared and yelled and stamped and clapped an entire minute grant sitting as serene as ever when general sherman stepped up to him laid his hand affectionately on his shoulder bent respectfully down and whispered in his ear then grant got up and bowed and the storm of applause swelled into a hurricane but it was the next evening that the celebration rose to a climax this was at the grand banquet at the palmer house where six hundred guests sat down to dinner and grant himself spoke and logan and harlbutt and villas and woodford and pope fifteen in all including roger g ingersoll and mark twain chicago has never known a greater event than that dinner for there has never been a time since when those great soldiers and citizens could have been gathered there to howells clemens wrote imagine what it was like to see a bullet-shredded old battle flag reverently unfolded to the gaze of a thousand middle-aged soldiers most of whom hadn't seen it since they saw it advancing over victorious fields when they were in their prime and imagine what it was like when grant their first commander stepped into view while they were still going mad over the flag and then right in the midst of it all somebody struck up when we were marching through georgia well you should have heard the thousand voices lift that chorus and seen the tears stream down if i live a hundred years i shan't ever forget these things nor be able to talk about them i shan't ever forget that i saw phil sheridan with martial cloak and plumed chapeau riding his big black horse in the midst of his own cannon by all odds the superbest figure of a soldier i ever looked upon grand times my boy grand times mark twain declared afterward that he listened to four speeches that night which he would remember as long as he lived one of them was by emory stores another by general villas another by logan and the last and greatest by robert ingersoll whose eloquence swept the house like a flame the howells letter continues i doubt if america has ever seen anything quite equal to it i am well satisfied i shall not live to see its equal again how pale those speeches are in print but how radiant how full of color how blinding they were in the delivery bob ingersoll's music will sing through my memory always as the divinest that ever enchanted my ears and i shall always see him as he stood that night on a dinner-table under the flash of lights and banners in the midst of seven hundred frantic shouters the most beautiful human creature that ever lived they fought that a mother might own her child the words look like any other print but lord bless me he borrowed the very accent of the angel of mercy to say them in and you should have seen that vast house rise to its feet and you should have heard the hurricane that followed 
that's the only test people may shout clap their hands stamp wave their napkins but none but the master can make them get up on their feet clemens own speech came last he had been placed at the end to hold the house he was preceded by a dull speaker and his heart sank for it was two o'clock and the diners were weary and sleepy and the dreary speech had made them unresponsive they gave him a round of applause when he stepped up upon the table in front of him a tribute to his name then he began the opening words of that memorable delightful fancy we haven't all had the good fortune to be ladies we haven't all been generals or poets or statesmen but when the toast works down to the babies we stand on common ground the tired audience had listened in respectful silence through the first half of the sentence he made one of his effective pauses on the word babies and when he added in that slow rich measure of his we stand on common ground they let go a storm of applause there was no weariness and inattention after that at the end of each sentence he had to stop to let the tornado roar itself out and sweep by when he reached the beginning of the final paragraph among the three or four million cradles now rocking in the land are some which this nation would preserve for ages as sacred things if we could know which ones they are the vast audience waited breathless for his conclusion step by step he led toward some unseen climax some surprise of course for that would be his way then steadily and almost without emphasis he delivered the opening of his final sentence and now in his cradle somewhere under the flag the future illustrious commander-in-chief of the american armies is so little burdened with his approaching grandeurs and responsibilities as to be giving his whole strategic mind at this moment to trying to find out some way to get his own big toe into his mouth an achievement which meaning no disrespect the illustrious guest of this evening also turned his attention to some fifty-six years ago he paused and the vast crowd had a chill of fear after all he seemed likely to overdo it to spoil everything with a cheap joke at the end no one ever knew better than mark twain the value of a pause he waited now long enough to let the silence become absolute until the tension was painful then wheeling to grant himself he said with all the dramatic power of which he was master and if the child is but the father of the man there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded the house came down with a crash the linking of their hero's great military triumphs with that earliest of all conquests seemed to them so grand a figure that they went mad with the joy of it even grant's iron serenity broke he rocked and laughed while the tears streamed down his cheeks they swept around the speaker with their congratulations in their efforts to seize his hand he was borne up and down the great dining hall grant himself pressed up to make acknowledgments it tore me all to pieces he said and sherman exclaimed lord bless you my boy i don't know how you do it the little speech has been in cold type so many years since then that the reader of it today may find it hard to understand the flame of response it kindled so long ago but that was another day and another nation and mark twain like robert ingersoll knew always his period and his people 
End of chapter 123, The Grant Speech of 1879, read by John Greenman. This is section 20 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 124, Another Atlantic Speech. The December good fortune was an opportunity Clemens had to redeem himself with the Atlantic contingent at a breakfast given to Dr. Holmes. Howells had written concerning it as early as October, and the first impulse had been to decline. It would be something of an ordeal, for though two years had passed since the fatal Whittier dinner, Clemens had not been in that company since, and the lapse of time did not signify. Both Howells and Warner urged him to accept, and he agreed to do so on condition that he be allowed to speak. "'If anybody talks there, I shall claim the right to say a word myself, and be heard among the very earliest, else it would be confoundedly awkward for me, and for the rest, too. But you may read what I say beforehand, and strike out whatever you choose. Howells advised against any sort of explanation. Clemens accepted this as wise counsel, and prepared an address relevant only to the guest of honor. It was a noble gathering. Most of the guests of the Whittier dinner were present, and this time there were ladies. Emerson, Longfellow, and Whittier were there, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Julia Ward Howe also the knightly Colonel Waring, and Stedman, and Parkman, and grand old John Bigelow, old even then. He died in 1911, in his ninety-fourth year. Howells was conservative in his introduction this time. It was better taste to be so. He said simply, We will now listen to a few words of truth and soberness from Mark Twain. Clemens is said to have risen diffidently, but that was his natural manner. It probably did not indicate anything of the inner tumult he really felt. Outwardly he was calm enough, and what he said was delicate and beautiful, the kind of thing that he could say so well. It seems fitting that it should be included here, the more so that it tells a story not elsewhere recorded. This is the speech in full. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would have traveled a much greater distance than I have come to witness the paying of honors to Dr. Holmes, for my feeling toward him has always been one of peculiar warmth. When one receives a letter from a great man for the first time in his life, it is a large event to him, as all of you know by your own experience. You never can receive letters enough from famous men afterward to obliterate that one, or dim the memory of the pleasant surprise it was, and the gratification it gave you. Lapse of time cannot make it commonplace or cheap. Well, the first great man who ever wrote me a letter was our guest Oliver Wendell Holmes. He was also the first great literary man I ever stole anything from, and that is how I came to write to him, and he to me. When my first book was new, a friend of mine said, The dedication is very neat. Yes, I said, I thought it was. My friend said, I always admired it, even before I saw it in The Innocents Abroad. I naturally said, what do you mean? Where did you ever see it before? 
Well, I saw it first some years ago as Dr. Holmes' dedication to his Songs in Many Keys. Of course, my first impulse was to prepare this man's remains for burial. But upon reflection I said I would reprieve him for a moment or two and give him a chance to prove his assertion, if he could. We stepped into a bookstore, and he did prove it. I had stolen that dedication almost word for word. I could not imagine how this curious thing happened, for I knew one thing, for a dead certainty, that a certain amount of pride always goes along with a teaspoon of brains, and that this pride protects a man from deliberately stealing other people's ideas. That is what a teaspoon of brains will do for a man, and admirers had often told me I had nearly a basketful, though they were rather reserved as to the size of the basket. However, I thought the thing out and solved the mystery. Some years before, I had been laid up a couple of weeks in the Sandwich Islands and had read and re-read Dr. Holmes' poems till my mental reservoir was filled with them to the brim. The dedication lay on top and handy, so by and by I unconsciously took it. Well, of course, I wrote to Dr. Holmes and told him I hadn't meant to steal, and he wrote back and said, in the kindest way, that it was all right, and no harm done, and added that he believed we all unconsciously worked over ideas gathered in reading and hearing, imagining they were original with ourselves. He stated a truth, and did it in such a pleasant way, and salved over my sore spot so gently and so healingly that I was rather glad I had committed the crime for the sake of the letter. I afterward called on him and told him to make perfectly free with any ideas of mine that struck him as good protoplasm for poetry. He could see by that time that there wasn't anything mean about me, so we got along right from the start. Holmes in his letter had said, I rather think the innocents abroad will have many more readers than songs in many keys. You will be stolen from a great deal oftener than you will borrow from other people. I have met Dr. Holmes many times since, and lately he said, <coughs> however, I am wandering wildly away from the one thing which I got on my feet to do, that is, to make my compliments to you, my fellow teachers of the great public, and likewise to say I am right glad to see that Dr. Holmes is still in his prime and full of generous life, and as age is not determined by years, but by trouble and by infirmities of mind and body, I hope it may be a very long time yet before any can truthfully say he is growing old. Whatever Mark Twain may have lost on that former occasion came back to him multiplied when he had finished this happy tribute. So the year for him closed prosperously. The rainbow of promise was justified. 
End of chapter 124. Another Atlantic speech. Read by John Greenman. This is section 21 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 125, The Quieter Things of Home. Upset and disturbed, as Mark Twain often was, he seldom permitted his distractions to interfere with the program of his fireside. His days and his nights might be fevered, but the evenings belonged to another world. The long European wandering left him more than ever enamored of his home. To him it had never been so sweet before, so beautiful, so full of peace. Company came, distinguished guests and the old neighborhood circles. Dinner parties were more frequent than ever, and they were likely to be brilliant affairs. The best minds, the brightest wits, gathered around Mark Twain's table. Booth, Barrett, Irving, Sheridan, Sherman, Howells, Aldrich, they all assembled, and many more. There was always someone on the way to Boston or New York who addressed himself for the day or the night, or for a brief call, to the Mark Twain fireside. Certain visitors from foreign lands were surprised at his environment, possibly expecting to find him among less substantial, more bohemian surroundings. Henry Drummond, the author of Natural Law in the Spiritual World, in a letter of this time, said, I had a delightful day at Hartford last Wednesday. Called on Mark Twain, uh, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, and the widow of Horace Bushnell. I was wishing A had been at the Mark Twain interview. He is funnier than any of his books, and to my surprise, a most respected citizen, devoted to things aesthetic, and the friend of the poor and struggling. Life of Henry Drummond by George Adam Smith The quieter evenings were no less delightful. Clemens did not often go out. He loved his own home best. The children were old enough now to take part in a form of entertainment that gave him and them a special pleasure, acting charades. These he invented for them, and costumed the little performers, and joined in the acting as enthusiastically and as unrestrainedly as if he were back in that frolicsome boyhood on John Quarles' farm. The Warner and Twitchell children were often there and took part in the gay amusements. The children of that neighborhood played their impromptu parts well and naturally. They were in a dramatic atmosphere, and had been from infancy. There was never any preparation for the charades. A word was selected, and the parts of it were whispered to the little actors. Then they withdrew to the hall, where all sorts of costumes had been laid out for the evening, dressed their parts, and each detachment marched into the library, performed its syllable, and retired, leaving the audience, mainly composed of parents, to guess the answer. Often they invented their own words, did their own costuming, and conducted the entire performance independent of grown-up assistance or interference. Now and then, even at this early period, they conceived and produced little plays, and of course their father could not resist joining in these. At other times, evenings, after dinner, he would sit at the piano and recall the old darky songs, spirituals, and jubilee choruses, singing them with fine spirit, if not with perfect technique, the children joining in these moving melodies. He loved to read aloud to them. It was his habit to read his manuscript to Mrs. Clemens, and, now that the children were older, he was likely to include them in his critical audience. It would seem to have been the winter after their return from Europe that this custom was inaugurated, for the Prince and the Pauper manuscript was the first one so read, and it was just then he was resuming work on this tale. Each afternoon or evening, when he had finished his chapter, he assembled his little audience and read them the result. The children were old enough to delight in that half-real, half-fairy tale of the wandering prince and the royal pauper, and the charm and simplicity of the story are measurably due to those two small listeners to whom it was adapted in that early day of its creation. 
Clemens found the prince a blessed relief from a tramp abroad, which had become a veritable nightmare. He had thought it finished when he left the farm, but discovered that he must add several hundred pages to complete its bulk. It seemed to him that he had been given a life sentence. He wrote six hundred pages and tore up all but two hundred and eighty-eight. He was about to destroy these and begin again when Mrs. Clemens' health became poor and he was advised to take her to Elmira, though it was then midwinter. To Howells he wrote, I said, if there is one death that is painfuler than another, may I get it if I don't do that thing. So I took the two hundred and eighty-eight pages to Bliss and told him that was the very last line I should ever write on this book, a book which required six hundred pages of manuscript, and I have written nearly four thousand first and last. I am as sorry and flighty as a rocket today, with the unutterable joy of getting that old man of the sea off my back, where he has been roosting more than a year and a half. They remained a month at Elmira, and on their return Clemens renewed work on The Prince and the Pauper. He reported to Howells that if he never sold a copy of his jubilant delight in writing, it would suffer no diminution. A week later his enthusiasm had still further increased. I take so much pleasure in my story that I am loath to hurry, not wanting to get it done. Did I ever tell you the plot of it? It begins at 9 a.m. January 27th, 1547. He follows with a detailed synopsis of his plot, which in this instance he had worked out with unusual completeness, a fact which largely accounts for the unity of the tale. Then he adds, My idea is to afford a realizing sense of the exceeding severity of the laws of that day by inflicting some of their penalties upon the king himself and allowing him a chance to see the rest of them applied to others all of which is to account for certain mildnesses which distinguished edward the sixth reign from those that precede it and follow it imagine this fact i have even fascinated mrs clemens with this yarn for youth my stuff generally gets considerable damning with faint praise out of her but this time it is all the other way she is become the horse leech's daughter and my mill doesn't grind fast enough to suit her this is no mean triumph my dear sir he forgot perhaps to mention his smaller auditors but we may believe they were no less eager in their demands for the tale's continuance end of chapter 125 the quieter things of home read by john greenman This is section 22 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 126, A Tramp Abroad. A Tramp Abroad came from the presses on the 13th of March, 1880. It had been widely heralded, and there was an advance sale of 25,000 copies. It was of the same general size and outward character as the Innocents, numerously illustrated, and was regarded by its publishers as a satisfactory book. It bore no very striking resemblance to the Innocents on close examination, its pictures drawn for the most part by a young art student named Brown, whom Clemens had met in Paris, were extraordinarily bad, while the crude engraving process by which they had been reproduced tended to bring them still further into disrepute. 
A few drawings by True Williams were better, and those drawn by Clemens himself had a value of their own. The book would have profited had there been more of what the author calls his works of art. Mark Twain himself had dubious anticipation as to the book's reception, but Howells wrote, "'Well, you are a blessing. You ought to believe in God's goodness, since he has bestowed upon the world such a delightful genius as yours to lighten its troubles.' Clemens replied, "'Your praises have been the greatest uplift I ever had. When a body is not even remotely expecting such things, how the surprise takes the breath away. We had been interpreting your stillness to melancholy and depression caused by that book. This is honest. Why, everything looks brighter now. A check for untold cash could not have made our hearts sing as your letter has done. A letter from Tauschnitz, proposing to issue an illustrated edition in Germany, besides putting it into his regular series, was an added satisfaction. To be in Tauschnitz's series was of itself a recognition of the book's merit. To Twitchell, Clemens presented a special copy of The Tramp with a personal inscription, which must not be omitted here. My dear Harris. No, I mean my dear Joe. But just imagine it for a moment. I was collecting material in Europe during fourteen months for a book, and now that the thing is printed I find that you, who were with me only a month and a half of the fourteen, are in actual presence, not imaginary, in four hundred and forty of the five hundred and thirty-one pages the book contains. Hang it! If you had stayed at home, it would have taken me fourteen years to get the material. You have saved me an intolerable whole world of hated labor, and I'll not forget it, my boy. You'll find reminders of things all along that happened to us, and of others that didn't happen, but you'll remember the spot where they were invented. You will see how the imaginary perilous trip up the Riffelberg is preposterously expanded. That horse student is on page 192. The Fremersberg is neighboring. The Black Forest novel is on page 211. I remember when and where we projected that, in the leafy glades, with the mountain sublimities dozing in the blue haze beyond the gorge of Allerheiligen. There's the new member, page 213, the dentist yarn, 223, the true chamois, 242. At page 248 is a pretty long yarn, spun from a mighty brief text meeting, for a moment, that pretty girl who knew me and whom I had forgotten. At 281 is Harris, and should have been so entitled, but Bliss has made a mistake and turned you into some other character. 305 brings back the whole Rigi tramp to me at a glance. At 185 and 186 are specimens of my art, and the frontispiece is the combination which I made by pasting one familiar picture over the lower half of an equally familiar one, this fine work being worthy of Titian, I have shed the credit of it upon him. Well, you'll find more reminders of things scattered through here than are printed, or could have been printed in many books. All the legends of the Nikar 
which I invented for that unstoried region, are here. One is in the appendix. The steel portrait of me is just about perfect. We had a mighty good time, Joe, and the six weeks I would dearly like to repeat any time, but the rest of the fourteen months never. With love, yours, Mark. Hartford, March 16, 1880. Possibly Twitchell had vague doubts concerning a book of which he was so large a part, and its favorable reception by the critics and the public generally was a great comfort. When the Howells letter was read to him, he is reported as having sat with his hands on his knees, his head bent forward, a favorite attitude, repeating at intervals, Howells said that, did he? Old Howells said that? There had been many and varying opinions since then as to the literary merits of A Tramp Abroad. Human tastes differ, and a mixed book of this kind invites as many opinions as it has chapters. The word uneven pretty safely describes any book of size, but it has a special application to this one. Written under great stress and uncertainty of mind, it could hardly be uniform. It presents Mark Twain at his best, and at his worst. Almost any American writer was better than Mark Twain at his worst. Mark Twain at his best was unapproachable. It is inevitable that A Tramp Abroad and The Innocents Abroad should be compared, though with hardly the warrant of similarity. The books are as different as was their author at the periods when they were written. A Tramp Abroad is the work of a man who was traveling and observing for the purpose of writing a book and for no other reason. The Innocents Abroad was written by a man who was reveling in every scene and experience, every new phase and prospect, whose soul was alive to every historic association, and to every humor that a gay party of young sightseers could find along the way. The notebooks of that trip fairly glow with the inspiration of it. Those of the later wanderings are mainly filled with brief terse records interspersed with satire and denunciation in the innocence the writer is the enthusiast with a sense of humor in the tramp he has still the sense of humor but he has become a cynic restrained but a cynic none the less in the innocence he laughs at delusions and fallacies and enjoys them in the tramp he laughs at human foibles and affectations and wants to smash them very often he does not laugh heartily and sincerely at all, but finds his humor in extravagant burlesque. In later life his gentler laughter, his old, untroubled enjoyment of human weakness, would return, but just now he was in that middle period, when the damned human race amused him indeed, though less tenderly. It seems proper to explain that in applying this term to mankind, he did not mean that the race was foredoomed, but rather that it ought to be. Reading the innocents, the conviction grows that, with all its faults, it is literature from beginning to end. Reading the tramp, the suspicion arises that, regardless of technical improvement, its percentage of literature is not large. Yet, as noted in an earlier volume, so eminent a critic as Brander Matthews has pronounced in its favor, and he undoubtedly had a numerous following. Howells expressed his delight in the book at the time of its issue, though one wonders how far the personal element entered into his enjoyment, and what would be his final decision if he read the two books side by side today. He reviewed A Tramp Abroad adequately and finely in the Atlantic, and justly, for on the whole it is a vastly entertaining book, and he did not overpraise it. A Tramp Abroad had an introduction in the manuscript, a pleasant word to the reader, but not a necessary one, and eventually it was omitted. Fortunately the appendix remained. Beyond question it contains some of the very best things in the book the descriptions of the german portier and the german newspaper are happy enough and the essay on the awful german language is one of mark twain's supreme bits of humor it is mark twain at his best 
Mark Twain in a field where he had no rival, the field of good-natured, sincere, fun-making ridicule of the manifest absurdities of some national custom or institution which the nation itself could enjoy, while the individual suffered no wound. The present Emperor of Germany is said to find comfort in this essay on his national speech when all other amusements fail. It is delicious beyond words to express. It is unique. In the body of the book there are also many delights. The description of the ant might rank next to the German language almost in its humor, and the meeting with the unrecognized girl at Lucerne has a lively charm. Of the serious matter, some of the word pictures are flawless in their beauty. This, for instance, suggested by the view of the Jungfrau from Interlaken. There was something subduing in the influence of that silent and solemn and awful presence. One seemed to meet the immutable, the indestructible, the eternal face to face and to feel the trivial and fleeting nature of his own existence the more sharply by the contrast. One had the sense of being under the brooding contemplation of a spirit, not an inert mass of rocks and ice, a spirit which had looked down through the slow drift of ages upon a million vanished races of men and judged them and would judge a million more and still be there watching unchanged and unchangeable after all life should be gone and the earth have become a vacant desolation while i was feeling these things i was groping without knowing it toward an understanding of what the spell is which people find in the Alps and in no other mountains, that strange, deep, nameless influence which, once felt, cannot be forgotten. Once felt leaves always behind it a restless longing to feel it again, a longing which is like homesickness a grieving, haunting yearning, which will plead, implore, and persecute till it has its will. I met dozens of people, imaginative and unimaginative, cultivated and uncultivated, who had come from far countries and roamed through the Swiss Alps year after year. They could not explain why. They had come first, they said, out of idle curiosity, because everybody talked about it. They had come since because they could not help it, and they should keep on coming while they lived, for the same reason. They had tried to break their chains and stay away, but it was futile. Now they had no desire to break them. Others came nearer formulating what they felt. They said they could find perfect rest and peace nowhere else when they were troubled. All frets and worries and chafings sank to sleep in the presence of the benignant serenity of the Alps. The great spirit of the mountain breathed his own peace upon their hurt minds and sore hearts, and healed them. They could not think base thoughts or do mean and sordid things here before the visible throne of God. Indeed, all the serious matter in the book is good. The reader's chief regret is likely to be that there is not more of it. The main difficulty with the humor is that it seems overdone. It is likely to be carried too far and continued too long. The ascent of Riffelberg is an example. Though spotted with delights, it seems to one reader at least less admirable 
than other of the book's important features, striking as it does more emphatically the chief note of the book's humor, that is to say, exaggeration. Without doubt there must be many, very many, who agree in finding a fuller enjoyment in a tramp abroad than in the innocents, only the burden of the world's opinion lies the other way. The world has a weakness for its illusions, the splendor that falls on castle walls, the glory of the hills at evening, the pathos of the days that are no more. It answers to tenderness, even on the page of humor, and to genuine enthusiasm, sharply sensing the lack of these things, instinctively resenting, even when most amused by it, extravagance and burlesque. The Innocence Abroad is more soul-satisfying than its successor, more poetic, more sentimental, if you will. The Tramp contains better English usage, without doubt, but it is less full of happiness and bloom, and the halo of romance. The heart of the world has felt this, and has demanded the book in fewer numbers. The sales of the innocents during the earlier years more than doubled those of the tramp during a similar period. The later ratio of popularity is more nearly three to one. It has been repeatedly stated that in England the tramp has the greater popularity, an assertion not sustained by the publisher's accountings. End of chapter 126, A Tramp Abroad, read by John Greenman. This is section 23 of Mark Twain, A Biography, volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 127, Letters, Tales, and Plans. The reader has not failed to remark the great number of letters which Samuel Clemens wrote to his friend William Dean Howells, yet comparatively few can even be mentioned. He was always writing to Howells on every subject under the sun, whatever came into his mind, business, literature, personal affairs. He must write about it to Howells. Once, when nothing better occurred, he sent him a series of telegrams, each a stanza from an old hymn, possibly thinking they might carry comfort. Clemens had then, and for many years, the habit of writing to me about what he was doing, and still more of what he was experiencing. Nothing struck his imagination, in or out of the daily routine, but he wished to write me of it and he wrote with the greatest fullness and a lavish dramatization, sometimes to the length of twenty or forty pages. My Mark Twain by W. D. Howells Whatever of picturesque happened in the household, he immediately set it down for Howells' entertainment. Some of these domestic incidents carry the flavor of his best humor. Once he wrote, Last night, when I went to bed, Mrs. Clemens said, George didn't take the cat down to the cellar. Rosa says he has left it shut up in the conservatory. So I went down to attend to Abner, the cat. About three in the morning, Mrs. C. woke me and said, I do believe I hear that cat in the drawing room. What did you do with him? I answered, with the confidence of a man who has managed to do the right thing for once, and said, I opened the conservatory doors, took the library off the alarm, and spread everything open, so that there wasn't any obstruction between him and the cellar. Language wasn't capable of conveying this woman's disgust, but the sense of what she said was, he couldn't have done any harm in the conservatory, so you must go and make the entire house free to him and the burglars, imagining that he will prefer the coal bins to the drawing room if you had had Mr. Howells to help you, 
I should have admired, but not have been astonished, because I should know that together you would be equal to it. But how you managed to contrive such a stately blunder all by yourself is what I cannot understand. So, you see, even she knows how to appreciate our gifts. I knocked off during these stirring hours, and don't intend to go to work again till we go away for the summer, four or six weeks hence. So I am writing to you, not because I have anything to say, but because you don't have to answer, and I need something to do this afternoon. The rightful Earl has Friday 7th. Well, never mind about the rightful Earl. He merely wanted to borrow money. I never knew an American Earl that didn't. After a trip to Boston, during which Mrs. Clemens did some bric-a-brac shopping, he wrote, Mrs. Clemens has two imperishable topics now, the Museum of Andirons, which she collected, and your dinner. It is hard to tell which she admires the most. Sometimes she leans one way, and sometimes the other, but I lean pretty steadily toward the dinner, because I can appreciate that, whereas I am no prophet in andirons. There has been a procession of Adams Express wagons filing before the door all day delivering andirons. In a more serious vein, he refers to the aged violinist Ole Bull and his wife, whom they had met during their visit, and their enjoyment of that gentle-hearted pair. Clemens did some shorter work that spring, most of which found its way into the Atlantic. Edward Mills and George Benton, one of the contributions of this time, is a moral sermon in its presentation of a pitiful human spectacle and misdirected human zeal. It brought a pack of letters of approval, not only from laity, but the church, and in some measure may have helped to destroy the silly sentimentalism which manifested itself in making heroes of spectacular criminals. That fashion has gone out, largely. Mark Twain wrote frequently on the subject, though never more effectively than in this particular instance. Mrs. McWilliams and the Lightning was another Atlantic story, a companion piece to Mrs. McWilliams' experience with the membranous croup, and in the same delightful vein, a vein in which Mark Twain was likely to be at his best, the transcription of a scene not so far removed in character from that in the cat letter just quoted, something which may or may not have happened, but might have happened, approximately as set down, Rose Terry Cook wrote, "'Horrid man! How did you know the way I behave in a thunderstorm? Have you been secreted in the closet or lurking on the shed roof? I hope you got thoroughly rained on, and worst of all is that you made me laugh at myself. My real terrors turned round and grimaced at me. They were sublime, and you have made them ridiculous.' just come out here another year and have four houses within a few rods of you struck and then see if you write an article of such exasperating levity i really hate you but you are funny in addition to his own work he conceived a plan for orion clemens himself had been attempting from time to time an absolutely faithful autobiography a document in which his deeds and misdeeds, even his moods and inmost thoughts, should be truly set down. He had found it an impossible task. He confessed freely that he lacked the courage, even the actual ability, to pen the words that would lay his soul bare. But he believed Orion equal to the task. He knew how rigidly honest he was, how ready to confess his shortcomings, 
how eager to be employed at some literary occupation it was mark twain's belief that if orion could record in detail his long weary struggle his succession of attempts and failures his past dreams and disappointments along with his sins of omission and commission it would make one of those priceless human documents such as have been left by benvenuto cellini casanova and rousseau simply tell your story to yourself he wrote laying all hideousness utterly bare reserving nothing banish the idea of the audience and all hampering things orion out in keokuk had long since abandoned the chicken farm and a variety of other enterprises he had prospected insurance mining journalism his old trade of printing and had taken down and hung up his law shingle between each of these seizures aside from business too he had been having a rather spectacular experience he had changed his politics three times twice in one day and his religion as many more once when he was delivering a political harangue in the street at night a parade of the opposition he had but just abandoned them marched by carrying certain flaming transparencies which he himself had made for them the day before finally after delivering a series of infidel lectures he had been excommunicated and condemned to eternal flames by the presbyterian church he was therefore ripe for any new diversion and the autobiography appealed to him he set about it with splendid enthusiasm wrote a hundred pages or so of his childhood with a startling minutia of detail and frankness and mailed them to his brother for inspection they were all that mark had expected more than he had expected he forwarded them to howells with great satisfaction suggesting with certain excisions they be offered anonymously to the atlantic readers but howells's taste for realism had its limitations he found the story interesting indeed torturingly heart-wringingly so and advising strongly against its publication returned it orion was steaming along at the rate of ten to twenty pages a day now forwarding them as fast as written while his courage was good and the fires warm clemens receiving a package by every morning mail soon lost interest then developed a hunted feeling becoming finally desperate he wrote wildly to shut orion off urging him to let his manuscript accumulate and to send it in one large consignment at the end this orion did and it is fair to say that in this instance at least he stuck to his work faithfully to the bitter disheartening end and it would have been all that mark twain had dreamed it would be had orion maintained the simple narrative spirit of its early pages but he drifted off into theological byways into discussions of his excommunication and infidelities which were frank enough but lacked human interest in old age mark twain once referred to orion's autobiography in print and his own disappointment in it which he attributed to orion's having departed from the idea of frank and unrestricted confession to exalt himself as a hero a statement altogether unwarranted and due to one of those curious confusions of memory and imagination that more than once resulted in a complete reversal of the facts a quantity of orion's manuscript has been lost and destroyed but enough fragments of it remain to show its fidelity to the original plan it is just one long record of fleeting hope futile effort and humiliation it is the story of a life of disappointment of a man who has been defeated and beaten down and crushed by the world until he has nothing but confession left to surrender howells in his letter concerning the opening chapters said that they would some day make good material fortunately the earliest of these chapters were preserved and as the reader may remember furnished much of the childhood details for this biography whatever may have been mark twain's later impression of his brother's manuscript its story of failure and disappointment moved him to definite action at the time several years before in hartford 
orion had urged him to make his publishing contracts on a basis of half profits instead of on the royalty plan clemens remembering this had insisted on such an arrangement for the publication of a tramp abroad and when his first statement came in he realized that the new contract was very largely to his advantage he remembered orion's anxiety in the matter and made it now a valid excuse for placing his brother on a firm financial footing out of the suspicions which you bred in me years ago has grown this result to wit that i shall within the twelve months get forty thousand dollars out of this tramp instead of twenty thousand twenty thousand after taxes and other expenses are stripped away is worth to the investor about seventy-five dollars a month so i shall tell mr perkins his lawyer and financial agent to make your check that amount per month hereafter this ends the loan business and hereafter you can reflect that you are living not on borrowed money but on money which you have squarely earned and which has no taint or savor of charity about it and you can also reflect that the money which you have been receiving of me is charged against the heavy bill which the next publisher will have to stand who gets a book of mine from that time forward orion clemens was worth substantially twenty thousand dollars till the day of his death and after him his widow far better was it for him that the endowment be conferred in the form of an income than had the capital amount been placed in his hands end of chapter one hundred and twenty seven letters tales and plans read by john greenman this is section twenty four of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow Payne. chapter one hundred and twenty eight mark twain's absent-mindedness a number of amusing incidents have been more or less accurately reported concerning mark twain's dim perception of certain physical surroundings and his vague resulting memories his absent-mindedness as we say it was not that he was inattentive no man was ever less so if the subject interested him but only that the casual incidental thing seemed not to find a fixed place in his deeper consciousness by no means was mark twain's absent-mindedness a development of old age on the two occasions following he was in the very heyday of his mental strength especially was it when he was engaged upon some absorbing or difficult piece of literature that his mind seemed to fold up and shut most of the world away soon after his return from europe when he was still struggling with a tramp abroad he wearily put the manuscript aside one day and set out to invite f g whitmore over for a game of billiards whitmore lived only a little way down the street and clemens had been there time and again it was such a brief distance that he started out in his slippers and with no hat but when he reached the corner where the house a stone's throw away was in plain view he stopped he did not recognize it it was unchanged but its outlines had left no impress upon his mind he stood there uncertainly a little while then returned and got the coachman patrick mcaleer to show him the way the second and still more picturesque instance belongs also to this period one day when he was playing billiards with whitmore george the butler came up with a card who is he george clemens asked without looking at the card i don't know sir but he's a gentleman mr clemens now george how many times have i told you i don't want to see strangers when i'm playing billiards this is just some book agent or insurance man or somebody with something to sell i don't want to see him and i'm not going to oh but uh, this is a gentleman i'm sure mr clemens uh, just look at his card sir 
Yes, of course, I see. Nice engraved card. But I don't know him, and if it was St. Peter himself, I wouldn't buy the key of salvation. You tell him so. Tell him. Oh, well, I suppose I've got to go and get rid of him myself. I'll be back in a minute, Whitmore. He ran down the stairs, and as he got near the parlor door, which stood open, he saw a man sitting on a couch with what seemed to be some framed watercolor pictures on the floor near his feet. Aha, he thought, I see, a picture agent. I'll soon get rid of him. He went in with his best, well, what can I do for you, air, which he, as well as any man living, knew how to assume, a friendly air enough, but not encouraging. The gentleman rose and extended his hand. How are you, Mr. Clemens? he said. Of course, this was the usual thing with men who had axes to grind or goods to sell. Clemens did not extend a very cordial hand. He merely raised a loose, indifferent hand, a discouraging hand. And how is Mrs. Clemens? asked the uninvited guest. So this was his game. He would show an interest in the family and ingratiate himself in that way. He would be asking after the children next. Well, Mrs. Clemens is about as usual, I believe. And the children, Miss Susie and little Clara. This was a bit startling. He knew their names. Still, that was easy to find out. He was a smart agent, wonderfully smart. He must be got rid of. The children are well quite well and pointing down at the pictures we've got plenty of these we don't want any more no we don't care for any more skillfully working his visitor toward the door as he talked the man looking nonplussed a good deal puzzled allowed himself to be talked into the hall and toward the front door here he paused a moment mr clemens will you tell me where mr charles dudley warner lives this was the chance. He would work him off on Charlie Warner. Perhaps Warner needed pictures. Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, right across the yard. I'll show you. There's a walk right through. You don't need to go around the front way at all. You'll find him at home, too, I'm pretty sure. All the time working his caller out and down the step and in the right direction. The visitor again extended his hand. Please remember me to Mrs. Clemens and the children. Oh, certainly, certainly, with pleasure. Uh, good day. Yes, uh, that's the house. Goodbye. On the way back to the billiard room, Mrs. Clemens called to him. She was ill that day. Youth? Yes, Livy, he went in for a word. George brought me Mr. B's card. I hope you are very nice to him. The B's? were so nice to us once last year when you were gone the bees why livy yes of course and i asked him to be sure to call when he came to hartford he gazed at her helplessly well he's been here oh youth have you done anything yes of course i have he seemed to have some pictures to sell so i sent him over to warner's I noticed he didn't take them with him. Land sakes, Livy, what can I do? Which way did he go, youth? Why, I sent him to Charlie Warner's. I thought, go right after him, go quick. Tell him what you have done. He went without further delay, bareheaded and in his slippers, as usual. Warner and B were in cheerful and friendly converse. They had met before. Clemens entered gaily. Oh, yes, I see. You found him all right. Charlie, we met Mr. B and his wife in Europe last summer, and they made things pleasant for us. I wanted to come over here with him, but was a good deal occupied just then. Livy isn't very well, but she seems a good deal better so I just followed along to have a good talk all together. 
he stayed an hour and whatever bad impression had formed in b s mind faded long before the hour ended returning home clemens noticed the pictures still on the parlor floor george he said what pictures are those that gentleman left why mr clemens those are our own pictures i've been straightening up the room a little and mrs clemens had me set them around to see how they would look in new places the gentleman was looking at them while he was waiting for you to come down end of chapter one hundred and twenty eight mark twain's absent-mindedness read by john greenman this is section twenty five of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter one hundred and twenty nine further affairs at the farm it was at elmira in july eighteen eighty that the third little girl came jane lampton for her grandmother but always called jean she was a large lovely baby robust and happy when she had been with them a little more than a month clemens writing to twichell said dear old joe concerning jean clemens if anybody said he didn't see no pints about that frog that's any better'n any other frog i should think he was convicting himself of being a pretty poor sort of observer she is the comeliest and daintiest and perfectest little creature the continents and archipelagos have seen since the bay and susy were her size i will not go into details it is not necessary you will soon be in hartford where i have already hired a hall the admission fee will be but a trifle it is curious to note the change in the stock quotations of the affection board brought about by throwing this new security on the market four weeks ago the children still put mama at the head of the list right along where she had always been but now jean mama motley cats fraulein papa that is the way it stands now mama is become number two i have dropped from number four and am become number five some time ago it used to be nip and tuck between me and the cats but after the cats developed i didn't stand any more show been reading daniel webster's private correspondence i've read a hundred of his diffuse conceited eloquent bathotic or bathostic letters written in that dim no vanished past when he was a student and lord to think that this boy who is so real to me now and so booming with fresh young blood and bountiful life and sappy cynicisms about girls has since climbed the alps of fame and stood against the sun one brief tremendous moment with the world's eyes on him and then where is he why the only long thing the only real thing about the whole shadowy business is the sense of the lagging dull and hoary lapse of time that has drifted by since then a vast empty level it seems with a formless specter glimpsed fitfully through the smoke and mist that lie along its remote verge well we are all getting along here first rate livy gains strength daily and sits up a deal the baby is five weeks old and 
but no more of this. Somebody may be reading this letter eighty years hence, and so, my friend, you pitying snob, I mean, who are holding this yellow paper in your hand in 1960, save yourself the trouble of looking further. I know how pathetically trivial our small concerns would seem to you, and I will not let your eye profane them. No, I keep my news, you keep your compassion. Suffice it you to know, scoffer and ribald, that the little child is old and blind now, and once more toothless, and the rest of us are shadows these many, many years. Yes, and your time cometh. Mark. It is the ageless story. He, too, had written his youthful letters, and later had climbed the Alps of fame and was still outlined against the sun. Happily, the little child was to evade that harsher penalty, the unwarranted bitterness and affront of a lingering, palsied age. Mrs. Clemens, in a letter somewhat later, set down a thought similar to his. "'We are all going so fast. Pretty soon we shall have been dead a hundred years.' Clemens varied his work that summer, writing alternately on The Prince and the Pauper and on the story about Huck Finn, which he had begun four years earlier. He read the latter over and found in it a new interest. It did not fascinate him, as did the story of the wandering prince. He persevered only as the spirit moved him, piling up pages on both the tales. He always took a boy's pride in the number of pages he could complete at a sitting, and if the day had gone well he would count them triumphantly, and, lighting a fresh cigar, would come tripping down the long stair that led to the level of the farmhouse, and, gathering his audience, would read to them the result of his industry. That is to say, he proceeded with the story of the prince. Apparently he had not yet acquired confidence or pride enough in poor Huck to exhibit him even to friends. The reference, in the letter to Twitchell, to the cats at the farm, introduces one of the most important features of that idyllic resort. There were always cats at the farm. Mark Twain himself dearly loved cats, and the children inherited this passion. Susie once said, "'The difference between Papa and Mama is that Mama loves morals and Papa loves cats.' The cats did not always remain the same, but some of the same ones remained a good while, and were there from season to season, always welcomed and adored. They were commendable cats, with such names as Fraulein, Blatherskite, Sour Mash, Stray Kit, Sin, and Satan. And when, as happened now and then, a vacancy occurred in the cat census, there followed deep sorrow and elaborate ceremonies. Naturally, there would be stories about cats, impromptu bedtime stories which began anywhere and ended nowhere, and continued indefinitely through a land inhabited only by cats and dreams. One of these stories, as remembered and set down later, began, Once upon a time there was a noble big cat, whose Christian name was Catasaqua, because she lived in that region but she didn't have any surname, because she was a short-tailed cat, being a Manx, and didn't need one. It is very just and becoming in a long-tailed cat to have a surname, but it would be very ostentatious and even dishonorable in a Manx. Well, Catasaqua had a beautiful family of catlings, and they were of different colors, to harmonize with their characters. Cataraugus, the eldest, was white, and he had high impulses and a pure heart. Cataline, the youngest, was black, and he had a self-seeking nature. His motives were nearly always base. He was truculent and insincere. 
he was vain and foolish, and often said that he would rather be what he was and live like a bandit, yet have none above him, than be a cat o' nine tails and eat with the king. And so on without end, for the audience was asleep presently, and the end could wait. There was less enthusiasm over dogs at Quarry Farm. Mark Twain himself had no great love for the canine breed. To a woman who wrote, asking for his opinion on dogs, he said in part, By what right has the dog come to be regarded as a noble animal? The more brutal and cruel and unjust you are to him, the more your fawning and adoring slave he becomes. Whereas if you shamefully misuse a cat once, she will always maintain a dignified reserve toward you afterward. You can never get her full confidence again. He was not harsh to dogs. Occasionally he made friends with them. There was once at the farm a gentle hound named Bones, that for some reason even won his way into his affections. Bones was always a welcome companion, and when the end of summer came, and Clemens, as was his habit, started down the drive ahead of the carriage, Bones, halfway to the entrance, was waiting for him. Clemens stooped down, put his arms around him, and bade him an affectionate good-bye. He always recalled Bones tenderly, and mentioned him in letters to the farm. End of chapter 129 Further Affairs at the Farm Read by John Greenman This is section 26 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 130 Copyright and Other Fancies the continued assault of Canadian pirates on his books kept Mark Twain's interest sharply alive on the subject of copyright reform. He invented one scheme after another, but the public mind was hazy on the subject, and legislators were concerned with purposes that interested a larger number of voters. There were too few authors to be of much value at the polls, and even of those few only a small percentage were vitally concerned. For the others, foreign publishers rarely paid them the compliment of piracy while at home the copyright limit of forty-two years was about forty-two times as long as they needed protection bliss suggested a law making the selling of pirated books a penal offense a plan with a promising look but which came to nothing clemens wrote to his old friend roland m daggett who by this time was a congressman Daggett replied that he would be glad to introduce any bill that the authors might agree upon, and Clemens made at least one trip to Washington to discuss the matter, but it came to nothing in the end. It was a presidential year, and it would do just as well to keep the authors quiet by promising to do something next year. Any legislative stir is never a good thing for a campaign. Clemens' idea for copyright betterment was not a fixed one, Somewhat later, when an international treaty, which would include protection for authors, was being discussed, his views had undergone a change. He wrote, asking Howells, Will the proposed treaty protect us, and effectually, against Canadian piracy? Because, if it doesn't, there is not a single argument in favor of international copyright which a rational american senate could entertain for a moment my notions have mightily changed lately i can buy macaulay's history three volumes bound for one dollar and twenty-five cents chambers cyclopedia ten volumes cloth for seven dollars twenty-five cents we paid sixty dollars and other English copyrights in proportion. I can buy a lot of the great copyright classics in paper at from three cents to thirty cents apiece. These things 
must find their way into the very kitchens and hovels of the country a generation of this sort of thing ought to make this the most intelligent and best read nation in the world international copyright must becloud this sun and bring on the former darkness and dime novel reading morally this is all wrong governmentally it is all right for it is the duty of governments and families to be selfish and look out simply for their own international copyright would benefit a few english authors and a lot of american publishers and be a profound detriment to twenty million americans it would benefit a dozen american authors a few dollars a year and there an end the real advantages all go to english authors and american publishers and even if the treaty will kill canadian piracy and thus save me an average of five thousand dollars a year i'm down on it anyway and i'd like cussed well to write an article opposing the treaty it is a characteristic expression mark twain might be first to grab for the life preserver but he'd also be first to hand it to a humanity in greater need he could damn the human race competently but in the final reckoning it was the interest of that race that lay closest to his heart mention has been made in an earlier chapter of clemens enthusiasm or rages for this thing and that which should benefit humankind he was seldom entirely without them whether it was copyright legislation the latest invention or a new empiric practice he rarely failed to have a burning interest in some anodyne that would provide physical or mental easement for his species howells tells how once he was going to save the human race with accordion letter files the system of order which would grow out of this useful device being of such nerve and labor-saving proportions as to ensure long life and happiness to all the fountain pen in its first imperfect form must have come along about the same time and clemens was one of the very earliest authors to own one for a while it seemed that the world had known no greater boon since the invention of printing but when it clogged and balked or suddenly deluged his paper and spilled in his pocket he flung it to the outer darkness after which the stylographic pen he tried one and wrote severally to dr brown to howells and to twichell urging its adoption even in a letter to mrs howells he could not forget his new possession and speaking of howells he ought to use the stylographic pen the best fountain pen yet invented he ought to but of course he won't a blamed old sodden-headed conservative but you see yourself what a nice clean uniform manuscript it makes and the same time to twichell i am writing with a stylographic pen it takes a royal amount of cussing to make the thing go the first few days or a week but by that time the dullest ass gets the hang of the thing and after that no enrichments of expression are required and said ass finds the stylographic a genuine god's blessing i carry one in each breeches pocket and both loaded i'd give you one of them if i had you where i could teach you how to use it not otherwise for the average ass flings the thing out of the window in disgust the second day believing it hath no virtue no merit of any sort whereas the lack lieth in himself god of his mercy damn him 
it was not easy to withstand mark twain's enthusiasm howells twichell and dr brown were all presently struggling and swearing figuratively over their stylographic pens trying to believe that salvation lay in their conquest but in the midst of one letter at last howells broke down seized his old steel weapon and wrote savagely no white man ought to use a stylographic pen anyhow then with the more ancient implement continued in a calmer spirit it was only a little later that clemens himself wrote you see i am trying a new pen i stood the stylograph as long as i could and then retired to the pencil the thing i am trying now is that fountain pen which is advertised to employ and accommodate itself to any kind of pen so i selected an ordinary gold pen a limber one and sent it to new york and had it cut and fitted to this thing it goes very well indeed thus far but doubtless the devil will be in it by to-morrow mark twain's schemes were not all in the line of human advancement some of them were projected primarily at least for diversion he was likely at any moment to organize a club a sort of private club and at the time of which we are writing he proposed what was called the modest club he wrote to howells about it at present i am the only member and as the modesty required must be of a quite aggravated type the enterprise did seem for a time doomed to stop dead still with myself for lack of further material but on reflection i have come to the conclusion that you are eligible therefore i have held a meeting and voted to offer you the distinction of membership i do not know that we can find any others though i have had some thought of hay warner twichell aldridge osgood fields higginson and a few more together with mrs howells mrs clemens and certain others of the sex i have long felt there ought to be an organized gang of our kind he appends the by-laws the main ones being the object of the club shall be to eat and talk qualifications for membership shall be aggravated modesty unobtrusiveness native humility learning talent intelligence unassailable character there shall be no officers except a president and any member who has anything to eat and talk about may constitute himself president for the time being any brother or sister of the order finding a brother or a sister in imminently deadly peril shall forsake his own concerns no matter at what cost and call the police any member knowing anything scandalous about himself shall immediately inform the club so that they shall call a meeting and have the first chance to talk about it it was one of his whimsical fancies and howells replied that he would like to join it only that he was too modest that is too modest to confess that he was modest enough for membership he added that he had sent a letter with the rules to hay but doubted his modesty he said he will think he has a right to belong as much as you or i howells agreed that his own name might be put down but the idea seems never to have gone any further perhaps the requirements of membership were too severe end of chapter 130 copyright and other fancies read by john greenman This is section 27 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 131, Working for Garfield. 
eighteen hundred and eighty was a presidential year general garfield was nominated on the republican ticket against general hancock and clemens found him satisfactory garfield suits me thoroughly and exactly he wrote howells i prefer him to grant's friends the presidency can't add anything to grant he will shine on without it it is ephemeral he is eternal that was the year when the republican party became panicky over the disaffection in its ranks due to the defeat of grant in the convention and at last by pleadings and promises conciliated platt and conkling and brought them into the field general grant also was induced to save the party from defeat and made a personal tour of oratory for that purpose he arrived in hartford with his family on the sixteenth of october and while his reception was more or less partisan it was a momentous event a vast procession passed in review before him and everywhere houses and grounds were decorated to mrs clemens still in elmira clemens wrote i found mr beals hard at work in the rain with his decorations with a ladder he had strung flags around our bedroom balcony and thence around to the porte cochere which was elaborately flagged thence the flags of all nations were suspended from a line which stretched past the greenhouse to the limit of our grounds against each of the two trees on the mound halfway down to our gate stands a knight in complete armor piles of still bundled flags clutter up the ombra to be put up also gaudy shields of various shapes arms of this and other countries also some huge glittering arches and things done in gold and silver paper containing mottoes in big letters i broke mr beale's heart by persistently and inflexibly annulling and forbidding the biggest and gorgeousest of the arches it had on it in all the fires of the rainbow the home of mark twain in letters as big as your head oh we're going to be decorated sufficient don't you worry about that madam clemens was one of those delegated to receive grant and to make a speech of welcome it was a short speech but an effective one for it made grant laugh he began i am among those deputed to welcome you to the sincere and cordial hospitalities of hartford the city of the historic and revered charter oak of which most of the town is built he seemed to be at a loss what to say next and leaning over pretended to whisper to grant then as if he had obtained the information he wanted he suddenly straightened up and poured out the old-fashioned eulogy on grant's achievements adding in an aside as he finished i nearly forgot that part of my speech which evoked roars of laughter from the assembly and a grim smile from grant he spoke of grant as being out of public employment with private opportunities closed against him and added but your country will reward you never fear then he closed when wellington won waterloo a battle about on a level with any one of a dozen of your victories sordid england tried to pay him for that service with wealth and grandeurs she made him a duke and gave him four million dollars if you had done and suffered for any other country what you have done and suffered for your own you would have been affronted in the same sordid way but thank god this vast and rich and mighty republic 
is imbued to the core with a delicacy which will forever preserve her for so degrading you your country loves you your country's proud of you your country is grateful to you her applauses which have been many thundering in your ears all these weeks and months will never cease while the flag you saved continues to wave your country stands ready from this day forth to testify her measureless love and pride and gratitude toward you in every conceivable inexpensive way welcome to hartford great soldier honored statesman unselfish citizen grant's grim smile showed itself more than once during the speech and when clemens reached the sentence that spoke of his country rewarding him in every conceivable inexpensive way his composure broke up completely and he nearly laughed his entire head off according to later testimony while the spectators shouted their approval grant's son colonel fred grant major general u s army nineteen o six died april nineteen twelve dined at the clemens home that night and rev joseph twichell and henry c robinson twichell's invitation was in the form of a telegram it said i want you to dine with us saturday half past five and meet colonel fred grant no ceremony wear the same shirt you always wear the campaign was at its height now and on the evening of october twenty sixth there was a grand republican rally at the opera house with addresses by charles dudley warner henry c robinson and mark twain it was an unpleasant drizzly evening but the weather had no effect on their audience the place was jammed and packed the aisles the windows and the gallery railings full hundreds who came as late as the hour announced for the opening were obliged to turn back for the building had been thronged long before mark twain's speech that night is still remembered in hartford as the greatest effort of his life it was hardly that except to those who were caught in the psychology of the moment the tumult and the shouting of patriotism the surge and sweep of the political tide the roaring delight of the audience showed that to them at least it was convincing howells wrote that he had read it twice and that he could not put it out of his mind whatever its general effect was need not now be considered garfield was elected and perhaps grant's visit to hartford and the great mass meeting that followed contributed their might to that result clemens saw general grant again that year but not on political business the educational mission which china had established in hartford a thriving institution for eight years or more was threatened now by certain chinese authorities with abolishment yung wing a yale graduate the official by whom it had been projected and under whose management it had prospered was deeply concerned as was the rev joseph twichell whose interest in the mission was a large and personal one yung wing declared that if influence could be brought upon li hung chang then the most influential of chinese counselors the mission might be saved twichell remembering the great honors which li hung chang had paid to general grant in china also grant's admiration of mark twain went to the latter without delay necessarily clemens would be enthusiastic and act promptly he wrote to grant and grant replied by telegraph naming a day when he would see them in new york they met at the fifth avenue hotel grant was in fine spirits and by no means the silent man of his repute he launched at once into as free and flowing talk as i have ever heard says twichell marked by broad and intelligent views on the subject of china her wants disadvantages etc now and then he asked a question but kept the lead of the conversation at last he proposed of his own accord to write a letter to li hung chang advising the continuance of the mission 
asking only that I would prepare him some notes, giving him points to go by. Thus we succeeded easily, beyond our expectations, thanks, very largely, to Clemens' assistance. Clemens wrote Howells of the interview, detailing at some length Twitchell's comical mixture of delight and chagrin at not being given time to air the fund of prepared statistics with which he had come loaded. It was as if he had come to borrow a dollar and had been offered a thousand before he could unfold his case. End of chapter 131 Working for Garfield Read by John Greenman This is section 28 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 132, A New Publisher. It was near the end of the year that Clemens wrote to his mother, I have two stories and by the verbal agreement they are both going into the same book. But Livy says they're not, and by George, she ought to know. She says they're going into separate books, and that one of them is going to be elegantly gotten up, even if the elegance of it eats up the publisher's profits and mine, too. I anticipate that publisher's melancholy surprise when he calls here Tuesday. However, let him suffer. It is his own fault. People who fix up agreements with me without first finding out what Livy's plans are take their fate into their own hands. I said two stories, but one of them is only half done, two or three months' work on it yet. I shall tackle it Wednesday or Thursday, that is, if Livy yields and allows both stories to go in one book, which I hope she won't. The reader may surmise that the finished story, the highly regarded story, was The Prince and the Pauper. The other tale, the unfinished and less considered one, was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Nobody appears to have been especially concerned about Huck, except possibly the publisher. The publisher was not the American company. Elisha Bliss, after long ill health, had died that fall and this fact, in connection with a growing dissatisfaction over the earlier contracts, had induced Clemens to listen to offers from other makers of books. The revelation made by the half-profit returns from A Tramp Abroad meant to him simply that the profits had not been fairly apportioned, and he was accordingly hostile. To Orion, he wrote that, had Bliss lived, he would have remained with the company and made it reimburse him for his losses but that as matters stood he would sever the long connection. It seemed a pity, later, that he did this, but the break was bound to come. Clemens was not a business man, and Bliss was not a philanthropist. He was, in fact, a shrewd, capable publisher, who made as good a contract as he could. Yet he was square in his dealings, and the contract which Clemens held most bitterly against him, that of roughing it, had been made in good faith and accordance with the conditions of that period. In most of the later contracts Clemens himself had named his royalties, and it was not in human nature, business human nature, for bliss to encourage the size of these percentages. If one wished to draw a strictly moral conclusion from the situation, one might say that it would have been better for the American Publishing Company, knowing Mark Twain, voluntarily to have allowed him half profits, which was the spirit of his old understanding, even if not the letter of it, rather than to have waited till he demanded it, and then to lose him by the result. Perhaps that would be also a proper business deduction. Only, as a rule, business morals are regulated by the contract, and the contract is regulated by the necessities and the urgency of demand. Never mind. Mark Twain revised The Prince and the Pauper 
sent it to howells who approved of it mightily though with reservations as to certain chapters and gave it to james r osgood who was grateful and agreed to make it into a book upon which no expense for illustration or manufacture should be spared it was to be a sort of partnership arrangement as between author and publisher and large returns were anticipated among the many letters which clemens was just then writing to howells one was dated xmas eve it closes with the customary pleasantries and the final line but it is growing dark merry christmas to all of you that last was a line of large significance it meant that the air was filled with the whisper of hovering events and that he must mingle with the mystery of preparation christmas was an important season in the clemens home almost the entire day before patrick was out with the sleigh delivering food and other gifts in baskets to the poor and the home preparations were no less busy there was always a tree a large one and when all the gifts had been gathered in when elmira and fredonia had delivered their contributions and orion and his wife in keokuk had sent the annual sack of hickory nuts the big river-bottom nuts big as a silver dollar almost such nuts as few children of this later generation ever see when all this happy revenue had been gathered and the dusk of christmas eve had hurried the children off to bed it was mrs clemens who superintended the dressing of the tree her husband assisting with a willingness that was greater than his skill and with a boy's anticipation in the surprise of it next morning then followed the holidays with parties and dances and charades and little plays with the warner and twitchell children to the clemens home the christmas season brought all the old round of juvenile happiness the spirit of kindly giving the brightness and the merrymaking the gladness and tenderness and mystery that belong to no other season and have been handed down through all the ages since shepherds watched on the plains of bethlehem end of chapter one hundred and thirty two a new publisher read by john greenman this is section twenty nine of mark twain a biography volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter one hundred and thirty three the three fires some benefactions the tradition that fires occur in groups of three was justified in the clemens household that winter on each of three successive days flames started that might have led to ghastly results the children were croupy and one morning an alcohol lamp near little clara's bed blown by the draught set fire to the canopy rosa the nurse entered just as the blaze was well started she did not lose her presence of mind rosa was not the kind to lose her head once in europe when bay had crept between the uprights of a high balustrade and was hanging out over destruction rosa discovering her did not scream but spoke to her playfully and lifted her over into safety but snatched the little girl out of danger then opened the window and threw the burning bedding on the lawn the child was only slightly scorched but the escape was narrow enough next day little jean was lying asleep in her crib in front of an open wood fire carefully protected by a fire screen when a spark with some ingenuity managed to get through the mesh of the screen and land on the crib's lace covering jean's nurse julia arrived to find the lace a gust of flame and the fire spreading she grabbed the sleeping jean and screamed rosa again at hand heard the scream and rushing in once more opened a window and flung out the blazing bedclothes clemens himself also arrived and together they stamped out the fire on the third morning just before breakfast time susie was practicing at the piano in the schoolroom which adjoined the nursery at one end of the room a fire of large logs was burning susie was at the other end of the room her back to the fire a log burned in two and fell scattering coals around the woodwork which supported the mantel just as the blaze was getting fairly started a barber waiting to trim mr clemens hair chanced to look in and saw what was going on he stepped into the nursery bathroom 
brought a pitcher of water and extinguished the flames this period was always referred to in the clemens household as the three days of fire clemens would naturally make philosophical deductions from these coincidental dangers and the manner in which they had been averted he said that all these things were comprehended in the first act of the first atom that but for some particular impulse given at that remote time the alcohol flame would not have blown against the canopy the spark would not have found its way through the screen the log would not have broken apart in that dangerous way and that rosa and julia and the barber would not have been at hand to save precious life and property he did not go further and draw moral conclusions as to the purpose of these things he never drew conclusions as to purpose he was willing to rest with the event logically he did not believe in reasons for things but only that things were nevertheless he was always trying to change them to have a hand in their improvement had you asked him he would have said that this too was all in the primal atom that his nature such as it was had been minutely embodied there in that charming volume my mark twain howells tells us of clemens consideration and even tenderness for the negro race and his effort to repair the wrong done by his nation mark twain's writings are full of similar evidence and in his daily life he never missed an opportunity to pay tribute to the humbler race he would go across the street to speak to an old negro and to take his hand he would read for a negro church when he would have refused a cathedral howells mentions the colored student whose way through college clemens paid as a partial reparation due from every white man to every black man mark twain paid two colored students through college one of them educated in a southern institution became a minister of the gospel the other graduated from yale law school this incident belongs just to the period of which we are now writing and there is another which though different enough indicates the same tendency garfield was about to be inaugurated and it was rumored that frederick douglas might lose his position as marshal of the district of columbia clemens was continually besought by one and another to use his influence with the administration and in every case had refused douglas had made no such application clemens learning that the old negro's place was in danger interceded for him of his own accord he closed his letter to general garfield a simple citizen may express a desire with all propriety in the matter of recommendation to office and so i beg permission to hope that you will retain mr douglas in his present office of marshal of the district of columbia if such a course will not clash with your own preferences or with the expediences and interests of your administration i offer this petition with peculiar pleasure and strong desire because i so honor this man's high and blemishless character and so admire his brave long crusade for the liberties and elevation of his race he is a personal friend of mine but that is nothing to the point his history would move me to say these things without that and i feel them too douglas wrote to clemens thanking him for his interest at the end he said i think if a man is mean enough to want an office he ought to be noble enough to ask for it and use all honorable means of getting it i mean to ask and i will use your letter as a part of my petition it will put the president-elect in a good humor in any case and that is very important with great respect gratefully yours frederick douglas mark twain's benefactions were not all for the colored race one morning in february of this same year while the family were at late breakfast george came in to announce a lady waiting to see mr clemens in the drawing-room clemens growled george he said it's a book agent 
I won't see her. I'll die in my tracks first. He went fuming and raging inwardly, and began at once to ask the nature of the intruder's business. Then he saw that she was very young and modest, with none of the assurance of a canvasser, so he gave her a chance to speak. She told him that a young man employed in Pratt & Whitney's machine shops had made a statue in clay, and would like to have Mark Twain come and look at it and see if it showed any promise of future achievement. His name, she said, was Carl Gerhardt, and he was her husband. Clemens protested that he knew nothing about art, but the young woman's manner and appearance, she seemed scarcely more than a child, won him. He wavered, and finally promised that he would come the first chance he had, that, in fact, he would come some time during the next week. On her suggestion he agreed to come early in the week. He specified Monday without fail. When she was gone and the door shut behind her, his usual remorse came upon him. He said to himself, Why didn't I go now? Why didn't I go with her now? She went from Clemens over to Warner's. Warner also resisted, but, tempted beyond his strength by her charm, laid down his work and went at once. When he returned he urged Clemens to go without fail, and, true to promise, Clemens took Patrick, the coachman, and hunted up the place. Clemens saw the statue, a semi-nude, for which the young wife had posed, and was struck by its evident merit. Mrs. Gerhardt told him the story of her husband's struggles between his daily work and the effort to develop his talent. He had never had a lesson, she said. If he could only have lessons, what might he not accomplish? Mrs. Clemens and Miss Spaulding called next day, and were equally carried away with Carl Gerhardt, his young wife, and his effort to win his way in art. Clemens and Warner made up their minds to interest themselves personally in the matter, and finally persuaded the painter J. Wells Champney to come over from New York and go with them to the Gerhardt's humble habitation to see his work. Champney approved of it. He thought it well worth while, he said, for the people of Hartford to go to the expense of Gerhardt's art education. He added that it would be better to get the judgment of a sculptor. So they brought over John Quincy Adams Ward, who, like all the others, came away bewitched with these young people and their struggles for the sake of art. Ward said, if any stranger had told me that this prentice did not model that thing from plaster cast, I should not have believed it. It's full of crudities, but it's full of genius, too. Hartford must send him to Paris for two years. Then, if the promise holds good, keep him there three more. When he was gone, Mrs. Clemens said, Youth, we won't wait for Hartford to do it. It would take too long. Let us send the Gerhardts to Paris ourselves, and say nothing about it to anyone else." So the Gerhardts, provided with funds and an arrangement that would enable them to live for five years in Paris if necessary, were started across the sea without further delay. Clemens and his wife were often doing something of this sort. There was seldom a time that they were not paying the way of some young man or woman through college or providing means and opportunity for development in some special field of industry. End of chapter 133 The Three Fires Some Benefactions Read by John Greenman This is section 30 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 134. Literary Projects and a Monument to Adam. Mark Twain's literary work languished during this period. He had a world of plans, as usual, and wrote plentifully, but without direction or conclusion. A curious experience, which relates a circumstance told to him by an army officer, is about the most notable of the few completed manuscripts of this period. Of the books projected, there were several, a burlesque manual of etiquette would seem to have been the most promising. Howells had faith in it, and of the still remaining fragments a few seem worth quoting. At Billiards If your ball glides along in the intense and immediate vicinity of the object ball, 
and account seems exquisitely imminent lift one leg then one shoulder then squirm your body around in sympathy with the direction of the moving ball and at the instant when the ball seems on the point of colliding throw up both of your arms violently your cue will probably break a chandelier but no matter you have done what you could to help the count at the dog fight if it occur in your block courteously give way to strangers desiring of you particularly ladies avoid showing partiality toward the one dog lest you hurt the feelings of the other one let your secret sympathies and your compassion be always with the underdog in the fight this is magnanimity but bet on the other one this is business at poker if you draw to a flush and fail to fill do not continue the conflict if you hold a pair of trays and your opponent is blind and it costs you fifty to see him let him remain unperceived if you hold nothing but ace high and by some means you know that the other man holds the rest of the aces and he calls excuse yourself let him call again another time wall street if you live in the country buy at eighty sell at forty avoid all forms of eccentricity in the restaurant when you wish to get the waiter's attention do not sing out say simply say Zzt. his old abandoned notion of hamlet with an added burlesque character came back to him and stirred his enthusiasm anew until even howells manifested deep interest in the matter one reflects how young howells must have been in those days how full of joy of existence also how mournfully he would consider such a sacrilege now clemens proposed almost as many things to howells as his brother orion proposed to him there was scarcely a letter that didn't contain some new idea with a request for advice or cooperation now it was some book that he meant to write some day and again it would be something he wanted howells to write once he urged howells to make a play or at least a novel out of orion at another time he suggested as material the rightful earl of durham he is a perfectly stunning literary bonanza and must be dug up and put on the market you must get his entire biography out of him and have it ready for osgood's magazine even if it isn't worth printing you must have it anyway and use it one of these days in one of your stories or in a play it was this notion about the american claimant which somewhat later would lead to a collaboration with howells on a drama and eventually to a story of that title but clemens chief interest at this time lay in publishing rather than in writing his association with osgood inspired him to devise new ventures of profit he planned a library of american humor which howells soon to leave the atlantic and charlie clark charles hopkins clark managing editor of the hartford current were to edit and which osgood would publish for subscription sale without realizing it clemens was taking his first step toward becoming his own publisher his contract with osgood for the prince and the pauper made him essentially that for by the terms of it he agreed to supply all the money for the making of the book and to pay osgood a royalty of seven and a half per cent for selling it reversing the usual conditions the contract for the library of humor was to be a similar one though in this case osgood was to have a larger royalty return and to share proportionately in the expense and risk mark twain was entering into a field where he did not belong where in the end he would harvest only disaster and regret 
one curious project came to an end in 1881, the plan for a monument to Adam. In a sketch written a great many years later, Mark Twain tells of the memorial which the Reverend Thomas K. Beecher and himself once proposed to erect to our great common ancestor. The story is based on a real incident. Clemens, in Elmira, one day, it was October 1879, heard of a jesting proposal made by F. G. Hall to erect a monument in Elmira to Adam. The idea promptly caught Mark Twain's fancy. He observed to Beecher that the human race really showed a pretty poor regard for its great progenitor, who was about to be deposed by Darwin's simian, not to pay him the tribute of a single monument. Mankind, he said, would probably accept the monkey ancestor, and in time the very name of Adam would be forgotten. He declared Mr. Hall's suggestion to be a sound idea. Beecher agreed that there were many reasons why a monument should be erected to Adam, and suggested that a subscription be started for the purpose. Certain businessmen, seeing an opportunity for advertising the city, took the matter semi-seriously, and offered to contribute large sums in the interest of the enterprise. Then it was agreed that Congress should be petitioned to sanction the idea exclusively to Elmira, prohibiting the erection of any such memorial elsewhere. A document to this effect was prepared, headed by F. G. Hall, and signed by other leading citizens of Elmira, including Beecher himself. General Joe Hawley came along just then on a political speech-making tour. Clemens introduced him, and Hawley in turn agreed to father the petition in Congress. What had begun merely as pleasantry began to have a formidable look. But alas, in the end, Hawley's courage had failed him. He began to hate his undertaking. He was afraid of the national laugh it would arouse, the jeers of the newspapers. It was certain to leak out that Mark Twain was behind it, in spite of the fact that his name nowhere appeared, that it was one of his colossal jokes. Now and then, in the privacy of his own room at night, Hawley would hunt up the Adam petition and read it, and feel the cold sweat breaking out. He postponed the matter from one session to another till the summer of 1881, when he was about to sail for Europe. Then he gave the document to his wife to turn over to Clemens, and ignominiously fled. For text of the petition in full, etc., see Appendix P at the end of last volume. Mark Twain's introduction of Hawley at Elmira contained this pleasantry. General Hawley was president of the Centennial Commission, was a gallant soldier in the war, he has been governor of Connecticut, member of Congress, and was president of the convention that nominated Abraham Lincoln. General Hawley, that nominated Grant. Twain, he says it was Grant, but I know better. He is a member of my church at Hartford, and the author of Beautiful Snow. Maybe he will deny that but I am only here to give him a character from his last place. As a pure citizen, I respect him. As a personal friend of years, I have the warmest regard for him. As a neighbor whose vegetable garden joins mine, why, why, I watch him. But that's nothing. We all do that with any neighbor. General Hawley keeps his promises, not only in private, but in public. He is an editor who believes what he writes in his own paper. As the author of Beautiful Snow, he added a new pang to winter. He is broad-souled, generous, noble, liberal, alive to his moral and religious responsibilities. Whenever the contribution box was passed, I never knew him to take out a cent. End of chapter 134, Literary Projects and a Monument to Adam. Read by John Greenman. This is section 31 of Mark Twain, A Biography. Volume 2. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 135 A Trip with Sherman and an Interview with Grant The Army of the Potomac gave a dinner in Hartford on the 8th of June, 1881, but little memory remains of it now beyond Mark Twain's speech and a bill of fare containing original comments ascribed to various revered authors, such as Johnson, Milton, and Carlyle. A pleasant incident followed, however, which Clemens himself used to relate. General Sherman attended the banquet, and Secretary of War Robert Lincoln. Next morning Clemens and Twitchell were leaving for West Point, where they were to address the military students, guests on the same special train on which Lincoln and Sherman had their private car. This car was at the end of the train, and when the two passengers reached the station, Sherman and Lincoln were out on the rear platform addressing the multitude. Clemens and Twitchell went in and, taking seats, waited for them. As the speakers finished, the train started, but they still remained outside, bowing and waving to the assembled citizens, so that it was under good headway before they came in. Sherman came up to Clemens, who sat smoking unconcernedly. "'Well,' he said, "'who told you you could go in this car?' nobody said clemens do you expect to pay extra fare asked sherman no said clemens i don't expect to pay any fare oh you don't then you'll work your way sherman took off his coat and military hat and made clemens put them on now said he whenever the train stops you go out on the platform and represent me and make a speech. It was not long before the train stopped, and Clemens, according to orders, stepped out on the rear platform and bowed to the crowd. There was a cheer at the sight of his military uniform, then the cheer waned, became a murmur of uncertainty, followed by an undertone of discussion. Presently somebody said, Say, that ain't Sherman, that's Mark Twain, which brought another cheer. Then Sherman had to come out, too, and the result was that both spoke. They kept this up at different stations, and sometimes Lincoln came out with them. When there was time, all three spoke, much to the satisfaction of their audiences. President Garfield was shot that summer, July 2, 1881. On the day that President Garfield was shot, Mrs. Clemens received from their friend Reginald Chumley a letter of condolence on the death of her husband in Australia startling enough though in reality rather comforting than otherwise for the reason that the mark twain who had died in australia was a very persistent impostor clemens wrote chumley being dead i might be excused from writing letters but i am not that kind of a corpse may i never be so dead as to neglect the hail of a friend from a far land. Out of this incident grew a feature of an anecdote related in Following the Equator, the joke played by the man from Bendigo. He died September 19th, and Arthur came into power. There was a great feeling of uncertainty as to what he would do. He was regarded as an excellent gentleman with a weakness for his friends. Incumbents holding a point of offices were in a state of dread. Howell's father was consul at Toronto, and believing his place to be in danger, he appealed to his son. In his book, Howells tells how, in turn, he appealed to Clemens, remembering his friendship with Grant and Grant's friendship with Arthur. He asked Clemens to write to Grant, but Clemens would hear of nothing less than a call on the general, during which the matter would be presented to him in person. Howells relates how the three of them lunched together in a little room just out of the office on baked beans and coffee brought in from some nearby restaurant. The baked beans and coffee were of about the railroad refreshment quality, but eating them with Grant was like sitting down to baked beans and coffee with Julius Caesar or Alexander or some other great Plutarchan captain. Clemens, also recalling the interview, once added some interesting details. I asked Grant if he wouldn't write a word on a card 
which Howells could carry to Washington and hand to the President. But as usual, General Grant was his natural self, that is to say, ready and determined to do a great deal more for you than you could possibly ask him to do. He said he was going to Washington in a couple of days to dine with the President, and he would speak to him himself on the subject, and make it a personal matter. Grant was in the humor to talk. He was always in a humor to talk when no strangers were present. He forced us to stay and take luncheon in a private room, and continued to talk all the time. It was baked beans, but how he sits and towers, Howells said, quoting Dame. Grant remembered Squibob Derby, John Phoenix, at West Point very well. He said that Derby was always drawing caricatures of the professors and playing jokes on everybody. He told a thing which I had heard before, but had never seen in print. A professor questioning a class concerning certain particulars of a possible siege said, Suppose a thousand men are besieging a fortress whose equipment of provisions is so-and-so. It is a military axiom that at the end of forty-five days the fort will surrender. Now, young men, if any of you were in command of such a fortress, how would you proceed? Derby held up his hand in token that he had an answer for that question. He said, I would march out, let the enemy in, and at the end of forty-five days I would change places with him. I tried hard during that interview to get General Grant to agree to write his personal memoirs for publication, but he wouldn't listen to the suggestion. His inborn diffidence made him shrink from voluntarily coming before the public and placing himself under criticism as an author. He had no confidence in his ability to write well, whereas we all know now that he possessed an admirable literary gift and style. He was also sure that the book would have no sale, and of course that would be a humility too. I argued that the book would have an enormous sale, and that out of my experience I could save him from making unwise contracts with publishers, and would have the contract arranged in such a way that they could not swindle him. But he said he had no necessity for any addition to his income. Of course he could not foresee that he was camping on a volcano, that as Ward's partner he was a ruined man even then, and of course I had no suspicion that in four years from that time I would become his publisher. He would not agree to write his memoirs. He only said that some day he would make very full notes and leave them behind him, and then, if his children chose to make them into a book, they could do so. We came away then. He fulfilled his promise entirely concerning Howell's father, who held his office until he resigned of his own accord. End of chapter 135 A Trip with Sherman and an Interview with Grant Read by John Greenman This is section 32 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 136, The Prince and the Pauper. 
during the summer absence alterations were made in the hartford home with extensive decorations by tiffany the work was not completed when the family returned clemens wrote to charles warren stoddard then in the sandwich islands that the place was full of carpenters and decorators whereas what they really needed was an incendiary if the house would only burn down we would pack up the cubs and fly to the isles of the blessed and shut ourselves up in the healing solitudes of the crater of haliakala and get a good rest for the males do not intrude there nor yet the telephone and the telegraph and after resting we would come down the mountain a piece and board with a godly breech-clouted native and eat poi and dirt and give thanks to whom all thanks belong for these privileges and never housekeep any more they had acquired more ground one morning in the spring mark twain had looked out of his window just in time to see a man lift an axe to cut down a tree on the lot which lay between his own and that of his neighbor he had heard that a house was to be built there altogether too close to him for comfort and privacy leaning out of the window he called sonorously woodman spare that tree then he hurried down obtained a stay of proceedings and without delay purchased the lot from the next-door neighbor who owned it acquiring thereby one hundred feet of extra ground and a greenhouse which occupied it it was a costly purchase the owner knew he could demand his own price he asked and received twelve thousand dollars for the strip in november clemens found that he must make another trip to canada the prince and the pauper was ready for issue and to ensure canadian copyright the author must cross the line in person he did not enjoy the prospect of a cold weather trip to the north and tried to tempt howells to go with him but only succeeded in persuading osgood who would do anything or go anywhere that offered the opportunity for pleasant company and junket it was by no means an unhappy fortnight clemens took a notebook and there are plenty of items that give reality to that long ago excursion he found the canadian girls so pretty that he records it as a relief now and then to see a plain one on another page he tells how one night in the hotel a mouse gnawed and kept him awake and how he got up and hunted for it hoping to destroy it he made a rebus picture for the children of this incident in a letter home we get a glimpse just here of how he was constantly viewing himself as literary material human material an example from which some literary aspect or lesson may be drawn following the mouse adventure we find it thus dramatized trace father brebuff all through this trip and when i am in a rage and can't endure the mouse be reading of brebuff's marvelous endurances and be shamed and finally after chasing the bright-eyed rascal several days and throwing things and trying to jump on him when in my overshoes he darts away with those same bright eyes then straightway i read brebeuf's magnificent martyrdom and turn in subdued and wondering by and by the thought occurs to me brebeuf with his good great heart would spare even that poor humble mousie and for his sake so will i i will throw the trap in the fire jump out of bed reach under fetch out the trap and find him throttled there and not two minutes dead they gave him a dinner in montreal louis frechette the canadian poet was there and clemens addressed him handsomely in the response he made to the speech of welcome from that moment frechette never ceased to adore mark twain and visited him soon after the return to hartford the prince and the pauper was published in england canada germany and america early in december eighteen eighty one 
there had been no stint of money and it was an extremely handsome book the pen and ink drawings were really charming and they were lavish as to number it was an attractive volume from every standpoint and it was properly dedicated to those good-mannered and agreeable children susy and clara clemens the story itself was totally unlike anything that mark twain had done before enough of its plan and purpose has been given in former chapters to make a synopsis of it unnecessary here the story of the wandering prince and the pauper king an impressive picture of ancient legal and regal cruelty is as fine and consistent a tale as exists in the realm of pure romance unlike its great successor the yankee at king arthur's court it never sacrifices the illusion to the burlesque while through it all there runs a delicate vein of humor only here and there is there the slightest disillusion and this mainly in the use of some ultra-modern phrase or word mark twain never did any better writing than some of the splendid scenes in the prince and the pauper the picture of london bridge the scene in the vagabond's retreat with its presentation to the little king of the wrongs inflicted by the laws of his realm the episode of the jail where his revelation reaches a climax these are but a few of the splendid pictures which the chapters portray while the spectacle of england acquiring mercy at the hands of two children a king and a beggar is one which only genius could create one might quote here but to do so without the context would be to sacrifice atmosphere half the story's charm how breathlessly interesting is the tale of it we may imagine that first little audience at mark twain's fireside hanging expectant on every paragraph hungry always for more of all mark twain's longer works of fiction it is perhaps the most coherent as to plot the most carefully thought out the most perfect as to workmanship this is not to say that it is his greatest story probably time will not give it that rank but it comes near to being a perfectly constructed story and it has an imperishable charm it was well received though not always understood by the public the reviewer was so accustomed to looking for the joke in mark twain's work that he found it hard to estimate this new product some even went so far as to refer to it as one of mark twain's big jokes meaning probably that he had created a chapter in english history with no foundation beyond his fancy of course these things pained the author of the book at one time he had been inclined to publish it anonymously to avert this sort of misunderstanding and sometimes now he regretted not having done so yet there were many gratifying notices the new york herald reviewer gave the new book two columns of finely intelligent appreciation in part he said to those who have followed the career of mark twain his appearance as the author of a charming and noble romance is really no more of a surprise than to see a stately structure risen upon sightly ground owned by an architect of genius with the resources of abundant building material and ample training at command of his capacity they have had no doubt and they rejoice in his taking a step which they felt he was able to take through all his publications may be traced the marks of the path which half led up to this happy height his humor has often been the cloak but not the mask of a sturdy purpose his work has been characterized by a manly love of truth a hatred of humbug and a scorn for cant a genial warmth and whole solidness a beautiful fancy a fertile imagination and a native feeling for the picturesque and a fine eye for color have afforded the basis of a style which has become more and more plastic and finished and in closing the characters of these two boys twins in spirit will rank with the purest and loveliest creations of child life in the realm of fiction end of chapter one hundred and thirty six the prince and the pauper read by john greenman This is section 33 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 137, Certain Attacks and Reprisals. B. 
beyond the publication of the prince and the pauper clemens was sparingly represented in print in eighty one a chapter originally intended for the book the whipping boy's story he gave to the bizarre budget a little special edition sheet printed in hartford it was the story of the bull and the bees which he later adapted for use in joan of arc the episode in which joan's father rides a bull to a funeral howells found that it interfered with the action in the story of the prince and we might have spared it from the story of joan though hardly without regret the military story a curious episode was published in the century magazine for november the fact that clemens had heard and not invented the story was set forth quite definitely and fully in his opening paragraphs nevertheless a captious reader thought it necessary to write to a new york publication concerning its origin i am an admirer of the writings of mr mark twain and consequently when i saw the table of contents of the november number of the century i bought it and turned at once to the article bearing his name and entitled a curious episode when i began to read it it struck me as strangely familiar and i soon recognized the story as a true one told me in the summer of eighteen seventy eight by an officer of the united states artillery query did mr twain expect the public to credit this narrative to his clever brain the editor seeing a chance for mark twain copy forwarded a clipping to clemens and asked him if he had anything to say in the matter clemens happened to know the editor very well and he did have something to say not for print but for the editor's private ear the newspaper custom of shooting a man in the back and then calling upon him to come out in a card and prove that he was not engaged in any infamy at the time is a good enough custom for those who think it justifiable your correspondent is not stupid i judge but purely and simply malicious he knew there was not the shadow of a suggestion from the beginning to the end of a curious episode that the story was an invention he knew he had no warrant for trying to persuade the public that i had stolen the narrative and was endeavoring to palm it off as a piece of literary invention he also knew that he was asking his closing question with a base motive else he would have asked it of me by letter not spread it before the public i have never wronged you in any way and i think you had no right to print that communication no right neither any excuse as to publicly answering that correspondent i would as soon think of bandying words in public with any other prostitute the editor replied in a manly frank acknowledgment of error he had not looked up the article itself in the century before printing the communication your letter has taught me a lesson he said the blame belongs to me for not hunting up the proofs please accept my apology mark twain was likely to be peculiarly sensitive to printed innuendos not always sometimes he would only laugh at them or be wholly indifferent indeed in his later years he seldom cared to read anything about himself one way or the other but at the time of which we are now writing the period of the early eighties he was alive to any comment of the press his strong sense of humor and still stronger sense of human weakness caused him to overlook many things which another might regard as an affront but if the thing printed were merely an uncalled-for slur an inexcusable imputation he was inclined to rage and plan violence sometimes he conceived retribution in the form of libel suits with heavy damages sometimes he wrote blasting answers which mrs clemens would not let him print at one time he planned a biography of a certain editor who seemed to be making a deliberate personal campaign against his happiness 
Clemens had heard that offending items were being printed in this man's paper. Friends, reporting with customary exaggeration, declared that these sneers and brutalities appeared almost daily, so often as to cause general remark. This was enough. He promptly began to collect data, damaging data, relating to that editor's past history. He even set a man to work in England collecting information concerning his victim. One of his notebooks contains the memoranda. A few items will show how terrific was to be the onslaught. When the naturalist finds a new kind of animal, he writes him up in the interest of science. No matter if it is an unpleasant animal, this is a new kind of animal, and in the cause of society must be written up. He is the polecat of our species. He is purely and simply a guito with the courage left out. Steel portraits of him as a sort of idiot, from infancy up, to a dozen scattered through the book, all should resemble him. But never mind the rest. When he got thoroughly interested in his project, Mrs. Clemens, who had allowed the cyclone to wear itself out a little with its own vehemence, suggested that perhaps it would be well to have someone make an examination of the files of the paper and see just what had been said of him. So he subscribed for the paper himself and set a man to work on the back numbers. We will let him tell the conclusion of the matter himself, in his report of it, to Howells. The result arrived from my New York man this morning. Oh, what a pitiable wreck of high hopes! The almost daily assaults for two months consists of one adverse criticism of P and P from an enraged idiot in the London Athenaeum, two paragraphs from some indignant Englishman in the Pall Mall Gazette who pays me the vast compliment of gravely rebuking some imaginary ass who has set me up in the neighborhood of Rabelais. Three, a remark about the Montreal dinner, touched with an almost invisible satire, and four, a remark about refusal of Canadian copyright, not complimentary, but not necessarily malicious, and, of course, adverse criticism, which is not malicious, is a thing which none but fools irritate themselves about. There, that is the prodigious bugaboo in its entirety. Can you conceive of a man's getting himself into a sweat over so diminutive a provocation? I am sure I can't. What the devil can those friends of mine have been thinking about to spread those three or four harmless things out into two months of daily sneers and affronts. Boil down, this vast outpouring of malice amounts to simply this. One jest. One can make nothing more serious than that out of it. One jest, and that is all. For foreign criticisms do not count, they being matters of news, and proper for publication in anybody's newspaper. Well, my mountain has brought forth its mouse, and a sufficiently small mouse it is, God knows, and my three weeks' hard work has got to go into the ignominious pigeonhole. Confound it, I could have earned ten thousand dollars with infinitely less trouble. Howells refers to this episode and concludes, So the paper was acquitted and the editor's life was spared. The wretch never, never knew how near he was to losing it. With incredible preliminaries of obloquy, and a subsequent devotion to lasting infamy. End of chapter 137 Certain Attacks and Reprisals Read by John Greenman This is section 34 of Mark Twain, A Biography. 
Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 138. Many Undertakings. To write a detailed biography of Mark Twain at this period would be to defy perusal, even to set down all the interesting matters interesting to the public of his time would mean not only to exhaust the subject but the reader he lived at the top of his bent and almost anything relating to him was regarded as news daily and hourly he mingled with important matters or spoke concerning them a bare list of the interesting events of mark twain's life would fill a large volume he was so busy so deeply interested himself so vitally alive to every human aspect he read the papers through and there was always enough to arouse his indignation the doings of the human race at large could be relied upon to do that and he would write and write to relieve himself his mental niagara was always pouring away turning out articles essays communications on every conceivable subject mainly with the idea of reform there were many public and private abuses and he wanted to correct them all he covered reams of paper with lurid heresies political religious civic for most of which there was no hope of publication now and then he was allowed to speak out an order from the post office department at washington concerning the subscription of envelopes seemed to him unwarranted he assailed it and directly the nation was being entertained by a controversy between mark twain and the postmaster general's private secretary who subsequently receded from the field at another time on the matter of postage rates he wrote a paper which began reader suppose you were an idiot and suppose you were a member of congress but i repeat myself it is hardly necessary to add that the paper did not appear on the whole clemens wrote his strictures more for relief than to print and such of these papers as are preserved to-day form a curious collection of human documents many of them could be printed to-day without distress to any one the conditions that invited them are changed the heresies are not heresies any more he may have had some thought of their publication in later years for once he wrote sometimes my feelings are so hot that i have to take the pen and put them out on paper to keep them from setting me afire inside then all that ink and labor are wasted because i can't print the result i have just finished an article of this kind and it satisfies me entirely it does my weather-beaten soul good to read it and admire the trouble it would make for me and the family i will leave it behind and utter it from the grave there is a free speech there and no harm to the family it is too late and too soon to print most of these things too late to print them for their salutary influence too soon to print them as literature he was interested in everything in music as little as he knew of it he had an ear for melody a dramatic vision and the poetic conception of sound reading some lilting lyric he could fancy the words marching to melody and would cast about among his friends for someone who could supply a tuneful setting. Once he wrote to his friend the Reverend Dr. Parker, who was a skilled musician, urging him to write a score for Tennyson's bugle song, outlining an attractive scheme for it which the order of his fancy had formulated. Dr. Parker replied that the bugle song, often attempted, had been the despair of many musicians. He was interested in business affairs already before the european trip he had embarked in and disembarked from a number of pecuniary ventures he had not been satisfied with a strictly literary income the old tendency to speculative investment acquired during those restless mining days always possessed him there were no silver mines in the east 
no holes in the ground into which to empty money and effort there were plenty of equivalents inventions stock companies and the like he had begun by putting five thousand dollars into the american publishing company but that was a sound and profitable venture and deserves to be remembered for that reason then a man came along with a patent steam generator which would save ninety per cent of the fuel energy or some such amount and mark twain was early persuaded that it would revolutionize the steam manufacturers of the world so he put in whatever bank surplus he had and bade it a permanent good-bye following the steam generator came a steam pulley a rather small contrivance but it succeeded in extracting thirty two thousand dollars from his bank account in a period of sixteen months by the time he had accumulated a fresh balance a new method of marine telegraphy was shown him so he used it up on that twenty five thousand dollars being the price of this adventure a watch company in western new york was ready to sell him a block of shares by the time he was prepared to experiment again but it did not quite live to declare the first dividend on his investment senator john p jones invited him to join in the organization of an accident insurance company and such was jones confidence in the venture that he guaranteed clemens against loss mark twain's only profit from this source was in the delivery of a delicious speech which he made at a dinner given to Cornelius Walford of London, an insurance author of repute. Jones was paying back the money presently, and about that time came a young inventor named Graham Bell, offering stock in a contrivance for carrying the human voice on an electric wire. At almost any other time Clemens would eagerly have welcomed this opportunity, but he was so gratified at having got his money out of the insurance venture that he refused to respond to the happy hello call of fortune in some memoranda made thirty years later he said i declined i said i didn't want anything more to do with wildcat speculation then he bell offered the stock to me at twenty-five i said i didn't want it at any price he became eager insisted that i take five hundred dollars worth he said he would sell me as much as i wanted for five hundred dollars offered to let me gather it up in my hands and measure it in a plug hat said i could have a whole hatful for five hundred dollars but i was the burnt child and I resisted all these temptations, resisted them easily, went off with my check intact, and next day lent five thousand of it on an unendorsed note to a friend who was going to go bankrupt three days later. About the end of the year I put up a telephone wire from my house down to the current office, the only telephone wire in town, and the first one that was ever used in a private house in the world. That had been only a little while before he sailed for Europe. When he returned he would have been willing to accept a very trifling interest in the telephone industry for the amount of his insurance salvage. He had a fresh interest in patents now, and when his old friend Dan Sloat got hold of a new process for engraving, the kaolatype or chalk plate process which was going to revolutionize the world of illustration he promptly acquired a third interest and eventually was satisfied with nothing short of control it was an ingenious process a sheet of perfectly smooth steel was coated with a preparation of kaolin or china clay and a picture was engraved through the coating down to the steel surface this formed the matrix into which the molten metal was poured to make the stereotype plate or die for printing it was clemens notion that he could utilize this process for the casting of brass dies for stamping book covers that so applied the fortunes to be made out of it would be larger and more numerous howells tells how at one time clemens thought the damned human race was almost to be redeemed by a process of founding brass without air bubbles in it this was the time referred to and the race had to go unredeemed 
for after long worried costly experimenting the brass refused to accommodate its nature to the new idea while the chalk plate itself with all its subsidiary and auxiliary possibilities was infringed upon right and left and the protecting patent failed to hold the process was doomed in any case it was barely established before the photographic etching processes superior in all ways were developed and came quickly into use the kaolatype enterprise struggled nobly for a considerable period clemens brought his niece's husband young charles l webster from fredonia to manage it for him and backed it liberally webster was vigorous hard-working and capable but the end of each month showed a deficit until clemens was from forty to fifty thousand dollars out of pocket in his effort to save the race with chalk and brass the history of these several ventures and there were others dismissed here in a few paragraphs would alone make a volume not without interest certainly not without humor following came the typesetting machine but we are not ready for that of necessity it is a longer costlier story mrs clemens did not share his enthusiasm in these various enterprises she did not oppose them at least not strenuously but she did not encourage them she did not see their need their home was beautiful they were happy he could do his work in deliberation and comfort she knew the value of money better than he cared more for it in her own way but she had not his desire to heap up vast and sudden sums to revel in torrential golden showers she was willing to let well enough alone clemens could not do this and suffered accordingly in the midst of fair home surroundings and honors we find him writing to his mother life has come to be a very serious matter with me i have a badgered harassed feeling a good part of my time it comes mainly from business responsibilities and annoyances he had no moral right to be connected with business at all he had a large perception of business opportunity but no vision of its requirements its difficulties and details he was the soul of honor but in anything resembling practical direction he was but a child during any period of business venture he was likely to be in hot water eagerly excited worried impatient alternately suspicious and overtrusting rash frenzied and altogether upset yet never even to the end of his days would he permanently lose faith in speculative ventures human traits are sometimes modified but never eliminated the man who is born to be a victim of misplaced confidence will continue to be one so long as he lives and there are men willing to victimize him the man who believes in himself as an investor will uphold that faith against all disaster so long as he draws breath and has money to back his judgments end of chapter one hundred and thirty eight many undertakings read by john greenman this is section thirty five of mark twain a biography volume two this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 139 Financial and Literary By a statement made on the 1st of January, 1882, of Mark Twain's disbursements for the preceding year, it is shown that considerably more than $100,000 had been expended during that twelve months. It is a large sum for an author to pay out in one year, it would cramp most authors to do it, and it was not the best financing, even for Mark Twain. It required all that the books could earn, all the income from the various securities, and a fair sum from their principal. There is a good deal of biography in the statement. Of the amount expended, $46,000 represented investments, but of this comfortable sum less than $5,000 would cover the legitimate purchases. The rest had gone in the ventures, from whose born no dollar would ever return. Also a large sum had been spent for the additional land and for improvements on the home, 
somewhat more than thirty thousand dollars altogether while the home life had become more lavish the establishment had grown each year to a larger scale the guests and entertainments had become more and more numerous until the actual household expenditure required about as much as the books and securities could earn it was with the increased scale of living that clemens had become especially eager for some source of commercial profit something that would yield a return not in paltry thousands but hundreds of thousands like colonel sellers he must have something with millions in it almost any proposition that seemed to offer these possible millions appealed to him and in his imagination he saw the golden freshet pouring in his natural taste was for a simple inexpensive life yet in his large hospitality and in a certain boyish love of grandeur he gloried in the splendor of his entertainment the admiration and delight of his guests there were always guests they were coming and going constantly clemens used to say that he proposed to establish a bus line between their house and the station for the accommodation of his company he had the southern hospitality much company appealed to a very large element in his strangely compounded nature for the better portion of the year he was willing to pay the price of it whether in money or in endurance and mrs clemens heroically did her part she loved these things also in her own way she took pride in them and realized that they were a part of his vast success yet in her heart she often longed for the simpler life above all for the farm life at elmira her spirit cried out for the rest and comfort there in one of her letters she says the house has been full of company and i have been whirled around how can a body help it oh i cannot help sighing for the peace and quiet of the farm this is my work and i know that i do very wrong when i feel chafed by it but how can i be right about it sometimes it seems as if the simple sight of people would drive me mad i am all wrong if i would simply accept the fact that this is my work and let other things go i know i should not be so fretted but i want so much to do other things to study and do things with the children and i cannot i have the best french teacher that i ever had and if i could give any time to it i could not help learning french when we reflect on the conditions we are inclined to say how much better it would have been to have remained there among the hills in that quiet inexpensive environment to have let the world go but that was not possible the game was of far larger proportions than any that could be restricted to the limits of retirement and the simpler round of life mark twain's realm had become too large for his court to be established in a cottage it is hard to understand that in spite of a towering fame mark twain was still not regarded by certain american arbiters of reputations as a literary fixture his work was not yet recognized by them as being of important meaning and serious purport in boston at that time still the athens of america he was enjoyed delighted in but he was not honored as being quite one of the elect howells tells us that in proportion as people thought themselves refined they questioned that quality which all recognize in him now but which was then the inspired knowledge of the simple-hearted multitude even at the atlantic dinners his place was below the salt a place of honor but not of the greatest honor he did not sit on the dais with emerson longfellow holmes whittier howells and aldrich we of a later period who remember him always as the center of every board the one supreme figure his splendid head and crown of silver hair the target of every eye find it hard to realize the cambridge conservatism that clad him figuratively always in motley and seated him lower than the throne itself howells clearly resented this condition and from random review corners had ventured heresy now in eighteen eighty two he seems to have determined to declare himself in a large free way concerning his own personal estimate of mark twain he prepared for the century magazine a biographical appreciation in which he served notice to the world that mark twain's work considered even as literature 
was of very considerable importance indeed. Whether or not Howells then realized the inspired knowledge of the multitude, and that most of the nation outside of the counties of Suffolk and Essex already recognized his claim, is not material. Very likely he did, but he also realized the mental dusk of the cultured uninspired and his prerogative to enlighten them. His Century article was a kind of manifesto, a declaration of independence no longer confined to the obscurities of certain book notices, where, of course, one might be expected to stretch friendly favor a little for a popular Atlantic contributor. In the open field of the Century magazine, Howells ventured to declare, Mark Twain's humor is as simple in form and as direct as the statesmanship of Lincoln or the generalship of Grant. When I think how purely and wholly American it is, I am a little puzzled at its universal acceptance. Why, in fine, should an English chief justice keep Mark Twain's books always at hand? Why should Darwin have gone to them for rest and refreshment at midnight, when spent with scientific research? I suppose that Mark Twain transcends all other American humorists in the universal qualities. He deals very little with the pathetic, which he nevertheless knows very well how to manage, as he has shown, notably in the true story of the old slave mother. But there is a poetic lift in his work, even when he permits you to recognize it only as something satirized. There is always the touch of nature, the presence of a sincere and frank manliness in what he says, the companionship of a spirit which is at once delightfully open and deliciously shrewd. Elsewhere I have tried to persuade the reader that his humor is, at its best, the foamy break of the strong tide of earnestness in him, but it would be limiting him unjustly to describe him as a satirist, and it is hardly practicable to establish him in people's minds as a moralist. He has made them laugh too long. They will not believe him serious. They think some joke is always intended. This is the penalty, as Dr. Holmes has pointed out, of making one's first success as a humorist. There was a paper of Mark Twain's printed in the Atlantic Monthly some years ago and called The Facts Concerning the Late Carnival of Crime in Connecticut which ought to have won popular recognition of the ethical intelligence underlying his humor. It was, of course, funny, but under the fun it was an impassioned study of the human conscience. Hawthorne, or Bunyan, might have been proud to imagine that powerful allegory, which had a grotesque force far beyond either of them. Yet it quite failed of the response I had hoped for it, and I shall not insist here upon Mark Twain as a moralist, though I warn the reader that if he leaves out of the account an indignant sense of right and wrong, a scorn of all affectations and pretense, an ardent hate of meanness and injustice, he will come infinitely short of knowing Mark Twain. Howells realized the unwisdom and weakness of dogmatic insistence and the strength of understatement. To him Mark Twain was already the moralist, the philosopher, and the statesman. He was willing that the reader should take his time to realize these things. The article with his subject's portrait as a frontispiece appeared in the century for September 1882. If it carried no new message to many of its readers, it at least set the stamp of official approval upon what they had already established in their hearts. End of chapter 139 Financial and Literary Read by John Greenman This is section 36 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 140. Down the River. 
Osgood was doing no great things with The Prince and the Pauper, but Clemens gave him another book presently, a collection of sketches, The Stolen White Elephant. It was not an especially important volume, though some of the features, such as Mrs. McWilliams and the Lightning and the Carnival of Crime, are among the best of their sort, while the elephant story is an amazingly good take-off on what might be called the spectacular detective. The interview between Inspector Blunt and the owner of the elephant is typical. The inspector asks, Now, what does this elephant eat, and how much? Well, as to what he eats, he will eat anything. He will eat a man. He will eat a Bible. He will eat anything between a man and a Bible. Good, very good indeed, uh, but too general. Uh, details are necessary. Details are the only valuable thing in our trade. Uh, very well. As to men, at one meal, or, if you prefer, uh, during one day, uh, how many men will he eat if fresh? Uh, he would not care whether they were fresh or not. At a single meal, he would eat five ordinary men. Very good, five men. We will put that down. Uh, what nationalities would he prefer? Uh, he is indifferent about nationalities. He prefers acquaintances, but is not prejudiced against strangers. Very good. Now, as to Bibles, uh, how many Bibles would he eat at a meal? he would eat an entire edition. Clemens and Osgood had a more important publishing enterprise on hand. The long-deferred completion of the Mississippi book was to be accomplished. The long-deferred trip down the river was to be taken. Howells was going abroad, but the charming Osgood was willing to make the excursion, and a young man named Roswell Phelps of Hartford was engaged as a stenographer to take the notes. Clemens made a farewell trip to Boston to see Howells before his departure, and together they went to Concord to call on Emerson, a fortunate thing, for he lived but a few weeks longer. They went again in the evening, not to see him, but to stand reverently outside and look at his house. This was in April. Longfellow had died in March. The fact that Howells was going away indefinitely made them reminiscent and sad. Just what breach Clemens committed during this visit is not remembered now, and it does not matter, but his letter to Howells after his return to Hartford makes it pretty clear that it was memorable enough at the time. Halfway in it he breaks out, But, oh, hell, there is no hope for a person that is built like me, because there is no cure, no cure. If I could only know when I have committed a crime, then I could conceal it, and not go stupidly dribbling it out, circumstance by circumstance, into the ears of a person who will give no sign till the confession is complete, and then the sudden damnation drops on a body like the released pile-driver and he finds himself in the earth down to his chin when he merely supposed he was being entertaining next day he was off with osgood and the stenographer for st louis where they took the steamer gold dust down the river he intended to travel under an assumed name but was promptly recognized both at the southern hotel and on the boat in life on the mississippi he has given us the atmosphere of his trip, with his new impressions of old scenes. Also his first interview with the pilot, whom he did not remember, but who easily remembered him. I did not write that story in the book quite as it happened, he reflected once many years later. We went on board at night. Next morning I was up bright and early and out on deck to see if I could recognize any of the old landmarks, I could not remember any. I did not know where we were at all. It was a new river to me, entirely. I climbed up in the pilot house, and there was a fellow of about forty at the wheel. I said, Good morning. He answered pleasantly enough. His face was entirely strange to me. 
then i sat down on the high seat back of the wheel and looked out at the river and began to ask a few questions such as a landsman would ask he began in the old way to fill me up with the old lies and i enjoyed letting him do it then suddenly he turned around to me and said i want a cup of coffee you hold her will you till i come back and before i could say a word he was out of the pilot house door and down the steps it all came so suddenly that i sprang to the wheel of course as i would have done twenty years before then in a moment i realized my position here i was with a great big steamboat in the middle of the mississippi river without any further knowledge than that fact and the pilot out of sight i settled my mind on three conclusions first that the pilot might be a lunatic second that he had recognized me and thought i knew the river third that we were in a perfectly safe place where i could not possibly kill the steamboat but that last conclusion though the most comforting was an extremely doubtful one i knew perfectly well that no sane pilot would trust his steamboat for a single moment in the hands of a greenhorn unless he were standing by the greenhorn's side of course by force of habit when i grabbed the wheel i had taken the steering marks ahead and astern and i made up my mind to hold her on those marks to the hair but i could feel myself getting old and gray then all at once i recognized where we were we were in what is called the grand chain a succession of hidden rocks one of the most dangerous places on the river there were two rocks there only about seventy feet apart and you've got to go exactly between them or wreck the boat there was a time when i could have done it without a tremor but that time wasn't now i would have given any reasonable sum to have been on the shore just at that moment i think i was about ready to drop dead when i heard a step on the pilot house stair then the door opened and the pilot came in quietly picking his teeth and took the wheel and i crawled weakly back to the seat he said you thought you were playing a nice joke on me didn't you you thought i didn't know who you were why i recognized that drawl of yours as soon as you opened your mouth i said who the hell are you i don't remember you well he said perhaps you don't but i was a cub pilot on the river before the war when you were a licensed pilot and i couldn't get a license when i was qualified for one because the pilots association was so strong at that time that they could keep new pilots out if they wanted to and the law was that i had to be examined by two licensed pilots and for a good while i could not get anyone to make that examination but one day you and another pilot offered to do it and you put me through a good healthy examination and endorsed my application for a license i had never seen you before and i have never seen you since until now but i recognized you all right i said but if i had gone half a mile farther with that steamboat we might have all been at the bottom of the river we got to be good friends of course and i spent most of my time up there with him 
when we got down below Cairo, and there was a big full river, for it was high water season, and there was no danger of the boat hitting anything so long as she kept in the river. I had her most of the time on his watch. He would lie down and sleep, and leave me there to dream that the years had not slipped away, that there had been no war, no mining days, no literary adventures, that I was still a pilot, happy and carefree as I had been twenty years before. From the book we gather that he could not keep out of the pilot house. He was likely to get up at any hour of the night to stand his watch, and truly enough the years had slipped away. He was the young fellow in his twenties again, speculating on the problems of existence and reading his fortune in the stars. To heighten the illusion, he had himself called regularly with the four o'clock watch in order not to miss the mornings. It will repay the reader to turn to chapter thirty of Life on the Mississippi and consider Mark Twain's word picture of the river sunrise. The majesty and solitude of the river impressed him more than ever before, especially its solitude. It had been so full of life in his time, now it had returned once more to its primal loneliness, the loneliness of God. At one place two steamboats were in sight at once, an unusual spectacle. Once in the mouth of a river he noticed a small boat which he made out to be the Mark Twain. There had been varied changes in twenty-one years. Only the old fascination of piloting remained unchanged. To Bixby afterward he wrote, I'd rather be a pilot than anything else I've ever done in my life. How do you run Plum Point? He met Bixby at New Orleans. Bixby was captain now on a splendid new anchor line steamboat, the city of Baton Rouge. The anchor line steamers were the acme of Mississippi River steamboat building, and they were about the end of it. They were imposingly magnificent, but they were only as gorgeous clouds that marked the sunset of Mississippi steamboat travel. Mark Twain made his trip down the river just in time. In New Orleans he met George W. Cable and Joel Chandler Harris, and they had a fraternizing good time together, mousing about the old French quarter or mingling with the social life of the modern city. He made a trip with Bixby in a tug to the Warmouth Plantation, and they reviewed old days together as friends parted for twenty-one years' will. Altogether the New Orleans sojourn was a pleasant one, saddened only by a newspaper notice of the death in Edinburgh of the kindly and gentle and beloved Dr. Brown. Clemens arranged to make the trip up the river on the Baton Rouge. Bixby had one pretty inefficient pilot, and stood most of the watches himself, so that, with Sam Clemens in the pilot house with him, it was wonderfully like those old first days of learning the river back in the fifties. Sam was ever making notes in his memorable book, just as he always did, said Bixby to the writer, recalling the time. I was sorry I had to stay at the wheel so much. I wanted to have some more time with Sam, without thinking of the river at all. Sam was sorry, too, from what he wrote after he got home." Bixby produced a letter in the familiar handwriting. It was a tender, heart-spoken letter. I didn't see half enough of you. It was a sore disappointment. Osgood could have told you, if he would, discreet old dog. I expected to have you with me all the time. Altogether, the most pleasant part of my visit with you was after we arrived in St. Louis, and you were your old natural self again. Twenty years have not added a month to your age or taken a fraction from your loveliness," said Bixby. When we arrived in St. Louis we came to the Planters Hotel, to this very table where you and I are sitting now and we had a couple of hot scotches between us, just as we have now, and we had a good last talk over old times and old acquaintances. After he returned to New York he sent for my picture. He wanted to use it in his book. 
At St. Louis the travelers changed boats and proceeded up the Mississippi toward St. Paul. Clemens laid off three days at Hannibal. Delightful days, he wrote home, loitering around all day long, examining the old localities and talking with the gray heads who were boys and girls with me thirty or forty years ago. I spent my nights with John and Helen Garth, three miles from town, in their spacious and beautiful house. They were children with me, and afterward schoolmates. That world which I knew in its blooming youth is old and bowed and melancholy now. Its soft cheeks are leathery and withered. The fire has gone out of its eyes, the spring from its step. It will be dust and ashes when I come again. He had never seen the far upper river, and he found it very satisfying. His notebook says, The bluffs all along up above St. Paul are exquisitely beautiful, where the rough and broken turreted rocks stand up against the sky above the steep verdant slopes. They are inexpressibly rich and mellow in color, soft dark browns mingled with dull greens, the very tints to make an artist worship. In a final entry he wrote, The romance of boating is gone now. In Hannibal the steamboat man is no longer the god. End of chapter 140 Down the River Read by John Greenman This is section 37 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 141, Literature and Philosophy. Clemens took a further step toward becoming a publisher on his own account. Not only did he contract to supply funds for the Mississippi book, but as Keola type, the chalk engraving process, which had been lingeringly and expensively dying, was now become merely something to swear at, he had his niece's husband, Webster, installed as Osgood's New York subscription manager, with charge of the general agencies. There was no delay in this move. Webster must get well familiarized with the work before the Mississippi book's publication. He had expected to have the manuscript finished pretty promptly, but the fact that he had promised it for a certain time paralyzed his effort. Even at the farm he worked without making much headway. At the end of October he wrote Howells, the weather turned cold, and we had to rush home while I still lacked thirty thousand words. I had been sick and got delayed, and I am going to write all day and two-thirds of the night until the thing is done or break down at it. The spur and burden of the contract are intolerable to me. I can endure the irritation of it no longer. I went to work at nine o'clock yesterday morning and went to bed an hour after midnight. Result of the day, mainly stolen from books through credit given, 9,500 words, so I reduced my burden by one-third in one day. It was five days' work in one. I have nothing more to borrow or steal. The rest must all be written. It is ten days' work, and unless something breaks it will be finished in five. He had sworn once, when he had finally finished A Tramp Abroad, that he would never limit himself as to time again, but he had forgotten that vow and was suffering accordingly. Howells wrote from London, urging him to drop everything and come over to Europe for refreshment. We have seen lots of nice people, and have been most pleasantly made of, but I would rather have you smoke in my face and talk for half a day, just for pleasure, than to go to the best house or club in London. Clemens answered, Yes, 
it would be more profitable to me to do that because with your society to help me i should swiftly finish this now apparently interminable book but i cannot come because i am not boss here and nothing but dynamite can move mrs clemens away from home in the winter season this was in november and he had broken all restrictions as to time he declared that he had never had such a fight over any book before and that he had told osgood and everybody concerned that they must wait i have said with sufficient positiveness that i will finish the book at no particular date that i will not hurry it that i will not hurry myself that i will take things easy and comfortably write when i choose to write leave it alone when i do so prefer i have got everything at a dead standstill and that is where it ought to be and that is where it must remain to follow any other policy would be to make the book worse than it already is i ought to have finished it before showing it to anybody and then sent it across the ocean to you to be edited as usual for you seem to be a great many shades happier than you deserve to be and if i had thought of this thing earlier i would have acted upon it and taken the tuck somewhat out of your joyousness it was a long heartfelt letter near the end of it he said cable has been here creating worshippers on all hands he is a marvelous talker on a deep subject i do not see how even spencer could unwind a thought more smoothly or orderly and do it in cleaner clearer crisper english he astounded twichell with his faculty you know that when it comes down to moral honesty limpid innocence and utterly blemishless piety the apostles were mere policemen to cable so with this in mind you must imagine him at a midnight dinner in boston the other night where we gathered around the board of the somerset club osgood full boyle o'reilly full fairchild responsively loaded and aldridge and myself possessing the floor and properly fortified cable told mrs clemens when he returned here that he seemed to have been entertaining himself with horses and had a dreamy idea that he must have gone to boston in a cattle car it was a very large time he called it an orgy and no doubt it was viewed from his standpoint osgood wanted mark twain to lecture that fall as preliminary advertising for the book with life on the mississippi as his subject osgood was careful to make this proposition by mail and probably it was just as well for if there was any single straw that could have broken the back of clemens endurance and made him violent at this particular time it was a proposition to go back on the platform his answer to osgood has not been preserved clemens spoke little that winter in february he addressed the monday evening club on what is happiness presenting a theory which in later years he developed as a part of his gospel and promulgated in a privately printed volume what is man it is the postulate already mentioned in connection with his reading of lecky that every human action bad or good is the result of a selfish impulse that is to say the result of a desire for the greater content of spirit it is not a new idea philosophers in all ages have considered it and accepted or rejected it according to their temperament and teachings 
but it was startling and apparently new to the monday evening club they scoffed and jeered at it denounced it as a manifest falsity they did not quite see then that there may be two sorts of selfishness brutal and divine that he who sacrifices others to himself exemplifies the first whereas he who sacrifices himself for others personifies the second the divine contenting of his soul by serving the happiness of his fellow-men mark twain left this admonition in furtherance of that better sort diligently train your ideals upward and still upward toward a summit where you will find your chiefest pleasure in conduct which while contenting you will be sure to confer benefits upon your neighbor and the community it is a divine admonition even if in its suggested moral freedom it does seem to conflict with that other theory the inevitable sequence of cause and effect descending from the primal atom there is seeming irrelevance in introducing this matter here but it has a chronological relation and it presents a mental aspect of the time clemens was forty-eight and becoming more and more the philosopher also in logic at least a good deal of a pessimist he made a birthday aphorism on the subject the man who is a pessimist before he is forty-eight knows too much the man who is an optimist after he is forty-eight knows too little he was never more than a pessimist in theory at any time in practice he would be a visionary a builder of dreams and fortunes a veritable colonel sellers to the end of his days end of chapter one hundred and forty one literature and philosophy read by john greenman